explorer who has been to space and the summit of Mount Everest. In 2020, she set out to become the first woman to reach both the highest point on Earth and the deepest part of the ocean. I was going to the most extreme environment on the planet in the useful submersible. The longer we're down, the more likely things go wrong. What motivates me personally to be part of something bigger than myself, to contribute to wider knowledge or inspire even one person. After four hours, Vanessa successfully reached the very bottom of the Pacific Ocean, an area called the Challenger Deep, nearly 11,000 meters below the surface. Part of her mission was to collect samples to allow scientists to do further research into a problem many people had never heard of, but which Vanessa had read about, ocean acidification. I chose to give my water samples to the Natural History Museum because it was their article on ocean acidification that inspired me. In 2020, scientists at London's Natural History Museum published a paper on the rising acidification of the ocean since the Industrial Revolution and the impact of this on marine life. They studied shelled creatures collected from the Pacific Ocean in 1875 by a ship named HMS Challenger. Then, the scientists compared these historical samples to modern versions of the same organisms collected nearly 150 years later in the same area. What we've seen is that some of these organisms, their shells have been up to 76% thinner in the modern day than they were at the time of the Challenger. So our conclusion was that the thinning of these shells over 150 years was an example of one of the seriously losing huge amounts of stock in their hatcheries. Over three quarters of our oyster larvae died. So it's a big, big impact for us. And the impact is being felt by the local economy that depends on their business. This high rate of mortality at first was a mystery. Could it be pollution? Could it be climate change? Then scientists discovered the cause. The changing chemistry of the ocean was preventing baby oysters from making shells. It was the first time ocean acidification was identified as a threat to marine life. Washington State, where I live, has the dubious distinction of being ground zero for ocean acidification. Ocean acidification has literally changed the chemistry of our oceans. What's happening now is at a scale and at a speed which is just unprecedented. And it means that we're living in the first ocean acidification experiment at this speed which is truly terrifying. Ocean acidification is alarming, but it's not exactly what it sounds like. Acidity is measured by the pH scale. In the middle is nutrient, seven. Anything lower is acidic. Anything higher is the opposite, alkaline. The ocean's pH level is around eight, meaning it's actually alkaline, not acidic. Since the Industrial Revolution, the ocean's pH level has decreased. And by the end of this century, the ocean is predicted to be 150% more acidic. Small wonder scientists are concerned. I have two children. I would love for them to know about the oceans in their science and geography lessons. But if we keep on going the way we're going with oceanification, climate change, then my fear is that they will end up having to learn about these things in history lessons. So what's driving this? There's a familiar culprit, the carbon dioxide created by burning fossil fuels. As the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere increases, the ocean's pH level decreases. This chemical change in the ocean makes life much harder for many marine animals. Carbon dioxide is such an important player in many of the key processes 
that just a small change in ocean chemistry can have huge implications for the health of individual organisms and for whole ecosystems. Dr. Sebastian Henniger is a leading global expert on ocean acidification and studies its impact on coral across the world. His research suggests ocean acidification is the prime suspect in the destruction of deep, cold water coral, which is essential to the marine ecosystem. One of the main reasons they're important is that they support just a huge amount of biodiversity. And without those, there just would be less life in those areas and less life which then feeds up into the different food chains as well. If the coral collapses, homes for other animals are lost and ecosystems threatened. You can really see how complex the framework is here. His forensic investigations suggest ocean acidification is the cause of a threatening condition called coral porosis. Osteoporosis in humans is when we start getting more holes in our bones. We call this coral porosis because this is porosis or dis dissolution of the coral itself. In California, coral porosis has caused these corals to collapse and crumble. The disease first attacks the dead coral skeletons on which the living coral is anchored. These reefs are built of mostly dead coral skeleton with the live coral continuously growing upwards. They tower up to tens of meters high. So these deep sea coral ecosystems are really cities of the deep. They're supporting all sorts of other life. If that dead part starts to dissolve, then that whole ecosystem starts to collapse. Sebastian says studying California's collapsed reefs could give clues about the fate of deep sea coral in other parts of the ocean. We're very interested in looking at the Californian coral systems because it is a window into our future. Another challenge for scientists is understanding how the threat of ocean acidification is combining with climate change. So if we can check the pH from these samples today. So now at his lab in Scotland, Sebastian is exposing deep sea coral to more acidified, warmer waters and decreased oxygen, with results expected in autumn 2023. We can put these corals in these tanks and simulate future ocean conditions. And by doing that, we can see the timescales that we'll see for collapses of ecosystems as a whole. With marine ecosystems, they're going to become hotter, they're going to become more sour as we increase the CO2, and they're going to become breathless as we decrease the oxygen which is available to marine life. This threat to marine ecosystems also poses a threat to human livelihoods across the world. From scallop fishermen in Peru to the indigenous people of Alaska who rely on salmon. I've always been taught that when the tide is out, the table is set. Raven Cunningham is a sixth generation commercial fisherman who has noticed a worrying change. We would go out and harvest shellfish. We would be able to go get a conspicuous but increasingly serious threat to Raven and her community. My community is very dependent on the ocean, not only for economic benefits, but for subsistence. Everybody in our community subsists in one way or another. The EAC depend on salmon especially. Much like the rest of Alaska, Good morning, all of you. Yep, we are uh, about to start the function. Uh, actually, we are 10 minutes late. We plan to start by 9 o'clock.
and with around 40% of the global population relying on seafood as a significant source of protein, there are concerns about the impact on the world's food supply chain. You can see all around the edges here, there's um, cracking and a great big hole here. Pteropods are now being found around the oceans, around different locations around the world, in different states of this sort of dissolution. And these are indicators that oceanification is happening out there in the real world. So what can be done to tackle ocean acidification? Well, the most effective answer is one you've probably heard many times before. Reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. Reduce. 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 We need to stop putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Reducing fossil fuel consumption remains the single most important measure. But there are other things which can help deal with the carbon dissolved in the ocean. Growing plants like seagrass or kelp under the water is one. They are very effective at absorbing carbon. Seagrass captures carbon 35 times faster than tropical rainforests. But there are clear limitations. To really mitigate today's carbon dioxide emissions, you'd have to carpet a fair portion of the world's oceans with seaweed farms. Others, such as this company in West London, are putting their faith in technology. We just came back from Hawaii where we've built the world's first ocean-assisted direct air carbon capture plant. That's capturing around 37 tons of CO2 per year at a levelized cost of $475 per ton. Capturing carbon dioxide from the air is a well-established idea, but Heimdall's technology is novel, capturing it from the sea. The company is targeting the ocean because it contains more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We use the ocean as our intermediary in order to capture CO2 because the ocean has 150 times more CO2 in it by volume than the atmosphere does. Heimdall has some fairly lofty ambitions. Remember the ocean's pH levels from the 1870s when the ship HMS Challenger collected samples? Heimdall is hoping to bring those levels back. We are restoring the pH back to the level that it was pre-industrial revolution. We are going to restore life back to our oceans. And the company says its system, designed to sit inside a standard container, is scalable. It will need to be. Even once these containers are finalised, to capture just one year's worth of global CO2 emissions at current rates would take around 36 million units. From new technology to growing plants underwater, these proposed measures to tackle ocean acidification are hampered by an inconvenient truth. Reducing the volume of carbon in the ocean will have limited impact without reducing the volume in the atmosphere. You can't get away from the fact that, like climate change, ocean acidification is the result of carbon emissions. And it's just one more reason to tackle what many regard as the world's most pressing problem. The point at which we could have avoided the worst of this car crash, I'm afraid, is over. We need to actually start applying the brakes. The big question is, how do we make this crash survivable? One that we can walk away from. Earth's oceans are huge heat stores. They have soaked up 93% of the excess heat from human activity over the past 70 years. Ocean currents redistribute heat around the planet, from the equator to the poles. At the surface, they are driven mainly by winds. At depth, they are caused by differences in water density due to temperature and salinity. Where this ocean heat goes influences weather patterns and regional climate. Europe's mild climate is due to the warm Gulf Stream and North Atlantic Current. Ocean heat waves can lead to coral bleaching and habitat loss. As well as absorbing heat, oceans are a natural carbon sink. They absorb about a quarter of the carbon dioxide emissions from human activity. This has led to the acidification of ocean water, threatening marine life. The amount of heat and carbon dioxide absorbed depends on a number of ocean variables, phytoplankton, temperature, waves, salinity, and ice cover. 
all of which can be measured from space. Satellites can measure sea level and slope, from which surface currents can be derived. Maps of ocean salinity show regions of evaporation, precipitation, and river inflow. High evaporation in the enclosed basin of the Mediterranean Sea raises its salinity. Elsewhere, rainfall and upwelling lower salinity. Ocean salinity rises in areas where sea ice forms because salt is left behind when the water freezes. This cold, salty, dense water sinks into the ocean's depths on a centuries-long journey known as the thermohaline circulation. This vertical overturning of the ocean is crucial for regulating global climate and helps drive surface currents like the Gulf Stream. As the climate warms, there are some signs that the overturning in the North Atlantic is weakening, which could lead to cooler air over Europe and more winter storms. The Atlantic coast of North America could see higher sea levels, warmer waters, and more powerful hurricanes. ESA's Climate Change Initiative is producing long-term datasets that help us understand how oceans influence climate and how the changing climate is affecting our oceans. Coastal zones are the crucible of climate change. Increased ocean temperatures, rising sea levels, and amplified tidal surges all converge to present serious challenges to our traditional relationship with this crucial ecosystem. The coastal zones of the Pacific are among the most vulnerable in the world. With most people living in these low elevation areas where land meets ocean. The Pacific is also a region of high dependence on coastal zones for shipping and transport and subsistence. And Good morning, all of you. I request all of you to occupy the seat so that we can start the function officially. Before starting the function, uh, thank you very much for joining uh, as on this on day workshop, myself Anas Abdulaziz, Principal Scientist at CSAR National Institute of Oceanography, Regional Center Coaching. So before starting the uh, function officially, I have some announcements for you. Uh, we have two different uh, uh, venues for the workshop uh, and felicitation function. The scientific deliberations will start in a few minutes and will end up around uh, uh, 4, 4 p.m. That is our plan. And uh, after that, the next function, that is a felicitation to our ongoing scientist in charge, uh, outgoing scientist in charge, Dr. Dinesh Kumar, uh, will be held at our, uh, our office at Regional Center Cochin at uh, 6 p.m. onwards. So the evening will be brightened by cultural programs also. The second program will start at 6 p.m. Uh, we know that we have arranged vehicle for transporting you all from here to where you are staying and you may need some time to fresh up before the felicitation program. Uh, so we will, we will get some time and we will, will, will come to pick you. We will send vehicles to pick you from where you are staying uh, to, uh, at around 5.45 p.m. So we can start the second function at uh, RC Cochin at 6, 6 p.m. itself. So uh, coming back to the scientific workshop here, today we have 12 speakers in the scientific deliberations. Uh, two are joining online. Uh, unfortunately, we two of our speakers, Dr. Grinson and Idris, could not make it possible to attend the meeting due to the health issues. So uh, we pray for their speedy recovery. Uh, to start with the program officially, I invite our scientists in charge, Dr. P.K. Dinesh Kumar, to, for, uh, for the welcome address, sir, please. Namaskaram. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. 
I am so happy to see you all. Faces of old times and new faces. It's really an, an honor to have this opportunity to stand before you and to welcome one and all. In this hall, and a huge lot of youngsters and researchers joining us online through the live web streaming platform of this workshop. In fact, this is the ground reality now. Even in today's paper, this Ari company is the hero or villain, I don't know. But this is the ground reality. This Tusker named Ari company is causing havoc in the residential zones of our high ranges. Today also he is in the front page. And he raided about 30 ration shops and destroyed about 200 buildings in and around and injured at least about 30 people. The Kerala High Court appointed an expert committee to decide the fate of this rice-eating tusker. Thus, the man and fate or the conflict of man-animal conflict is increasing worldwide and the problem is universal. Climate change, fuel, the increase in human wildlife conflict by straining ecosystems and altering systems, seasons. And in the last three months, 22 casualties happened only in Kerala. And the same goes with the fishery sector and it poses the greatest moral challenge of our time. And fishermen also complained about the decreasing depleting fishery resources and increased flooding of coast zones. And as you may know, our emission, India emits only a small percentage of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases, but the threat and the issues posed by in the economy is very marginal. And even this year, we are going to face a sudden fall in sugarcane production. So these, all these uh, things will be discussed in the workshop with a thrust to the coastal zones. And as I said, told, it pose, climate change poses the greatest moral challenge of our time. It is about the survival of people, cities, and nation. Never in the history of human being has the health of our ocean been so challenged. The cost of doing nothing is becoming even greater. It's a priority we can't afford to wait. In the broad background of making the sustainable development goals a reality, this workshop aims to identify the gaps in the understanding of the linkages between climate change and coastal ecosystem changes. Examine the discuss and discuss tools to improve our understanding, to integrate adaptation and mitigation strategies and policies into national sustainable development plans. Thus, this workshop is right on spot in the choice of its topic. We have a very high level of researchers and I am sure that it will be interesting and successful. And we are really lucky to have such an extraordinary personality as the chief guest of this workshop, that is Patmasri Ali Manikfan, who has advocated relentlessly the connection between a healthy ocean and a peaceful life for every single person of this nation. On behalf of the participants and on my own behalf, I welcome you, sir, to this workshop. It's my great pleasure to welcome the inspiration of this workshop. This is bloomed today in this shape in a very short while under the eminent leadership of our director, Professor Sunil Kumar Singh. So with great pleasure, I welcome you to this workshop. Dr. S.W. Nakki Sab, 
our former director and presently the national chair of department of science science and technology new delhi has been a passionate advocate for ocean conservation he has integrated ocean science and cutting edge environmental issues as mainstream topics even to the layman sir i welcome you wholeheartedly to this workshop and it is now my pleasure to welcome dr shubha satyendranath and that takes a trip down memory lane because when i joined in nao in 86 as a research fellow since then i knew her and we, she was interacting with rc in a big way in pogo training and dr trevor also was one among us and madam on behalf of everyone assembled i welcome you to this workshop and to me at least 1986 wasn't that long ago and i really always think it is nice to look back and remember where i started to inspire us to go future for in the future i first went into the sea with him and we have also co-authored a few publications on climate change and that also resulted our better understanding of the challenges facing by the ocean and it is none other than dr prasanna kumar and i welcome prasanna to this workshop and we have other speakers and uh, dr vvs sharma the present scientist in charge of rc visakhapatnam uh, so i welcome dr vvs to this workshop and dr aninda majumdar he readily agreed to make a presentation and he is uh, one of our colleagues in headquarters and he is working on methane and i welcome dr aninda to this workshop and my younger colleague dr jairam we co-authored papers and he also gave me a lot of insights about the changing ecosystems of upwelling and climate change and when i called him he readily agreed and he is here and i welcome dr jairam to this workshop and i as dr anas told dr murali tumari gudi who is my close friend and roxy they will be joining us online and uh, on behalf of everyone and for green sun and uh, 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 who else be anas eh? idris they also couldn't come and uh, i welcome them also to the workshop girish is the girish dr girish gobinath kufos he will be joining us soon and uh, i welcome him also and i also welcome the personnel from media print and all the participants once again to this uh, uh, and all the all the online participants who are using the web streaming platform and hope the workshop will have its own impact in the future research and uh, at least we'll come up with a good international scientific proposal thank you so much thank you thank you Thank you, Dr. Dinesh Kumar, for offering a warm welcome to all the participants, speakers, and uh, online participants. Uh, now, with pleasure, I am inviting our director, CSR National Institute of Oceanography, Professor Sunil Kumar Singh, for the presidential address.
गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबडी रेस्पेक्टेड पद्मश्री अली मानिक फंजी ए ग्रेट एकोलॉजिस्ट शिप बिल्डर साइंटिस्ट सो मेनी डिस्टिंग्विश अलंकारम इज देयर विथ यू डॉक्टर शुभा सत्येंद्र नाथ जी प्लीमत साइंस लेबोरेटरी यूनाइटेड किंगडम डॉक्टर एस डब्ल्यू ए नकवी जी नेशनल साइंस चेयर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी न्यू दिल्ली एंड फॉर्मर डायरेक्टर ऑफ सी एस आर एन आई यू डॉक्टर प्रसन्न कुमार जी डायरेक्टर फॉर्मर डायरेक्टर ऑफ सी एस आर एन आई यू डॉक्टर बी के बंसल जी डॉक्टर जी पी एस मूर्ति जी दिलीप कुमार जी पंक जैक्सन जी दिनेश कुमार जी ऑल द डिस्टिंग डेलीगेट्स स्पीकरस स्टूडेंट्स पार्टिसिपेंट्स लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन इट गिव्स मी इमेंस प्लेजर टू वेलकम यू ऑल इन दिस वन डे साइंस कॉन्क्लेव इन टाइटल राइजिंग इम्पैक्ट ऑफ क्लाइमेट चेंज एंड कोस्टल इको सिस्टम रिस्पॉन्स एट कोचिन इनफैक्ट दिनेश कुमार जी वॉज नॉट और वेरी मच रिलेक्टेंट टू होल्ड दिस मीटिंग बट आई रिक्वेस्टेड हिम टू हैव दिस एट दिस ब्यूटिफुल लोकेशन एट कोचिन बिकॉज सिंस आई थिंक कोविड टाइम इट वॉज वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू मीट इच अदर एंड ग्रीट इच अदर आर नो ऑल्सो अबाउट द साइंस विच इज हैपनिंग we have almost lost two more than two and a half years or three years in this regard and you know this this topic is very timely because i think everybody will agree that uh, climate change not is not a myth now it is re in real sense it is happening the temperature is rising co2 is increasing and they have their own impact on our ocean our ecosystem everything if you see the sea surface temperature is increasing continuously almost last 4 5 decades we have records and now it is showing that it is has increased almost per decade significantly almost about 0.1 degree per decade or something like that for the tropical indian uh, tropical global ocean but indian ocean in particular is warming rapidly and the rate is almost 0.1415 different values are there but there is no doubt at least the change in the or increase in the temperature is significantly higher compared to the global value or other uh, tropical ocean as you see this has its own impact if you see the global warming is happening in sea surface temperature increasing ocean heat content is increasing you know it's its impact on the climate its impact on the ecosystem i think everywhere it is creating havoc you see the uh, just now dinesh kumar ji was showing the flooding and all everybody remembers the flooding which happened i think this this type of extreme climate is increasing also because of the heat ocean heat content increase you know the cyclone intensity is increasing and that is again creating huge impact similarly the Uh, rainy days are sinking but the rainfall is increasing or or it is remaining the same but so it is creating huge rainfall in a sp short spell of time and that is flooding the cities and all and again creating lot of problem for the human being and mankind when it but in addition to that if you see the ho whole uh, ecosystem or productivity cycle in the ocean because of the temperature increase and uh, stratification which is getting developed all over the productivity has been i think inferred or uh, people have shown that productivity the ocean is decreasing almost by 25% or 35% it has decreased since last i think 3 uh, or 4 5 decades so this is alarming situation you know when productivity is going down you know it will have direct impact on the fisheries so they are also i think we have to look into just now again dilip kumar uh, dinesh kumar ji was showing that fishery is going down again the the economy the which is depending or our the uh, human being or population coastal population which is depending on the fishery i think 
you can imagine what will happen because otherwise also if you see the fishery marine fishery productivity if you see the total catch i think it is our landing is not increasing maybe it is decreasing since last several years so it has almost got stuck at 3.54 uh, billion year per ton per per year it is uh, you see it is showing the declining trend and above that if it is a global this type of temperature increase and productivity is going down i think this will have further impact on the fishery and economy and when you are talking about the blue economy and five trillion economy of the country i think this will impact very heavily on our uh, dream of having this uh, or booming the uh, blue economy at least making the blue economy component in our our econo total economy may be 10 percent or more than that it will become very very difficult in this scenario similarly when you are talking about this uh, temperature increase scenario uh, the ecosystem dynamics ecosystem composition also is changing rapidly so again you have we must have seen in our indian ocean itself if you see the the productivity or the ecosystem uh, composition is changing from say diatom type of productivity or or uh, this uh, phytoplankton type of productivity is going towards the bacteria and cyanobacteria population is increasing because of you know food is decreasing because of stratification and all again when you are talking about this change in the ecosystem composition it will change the chemistry of the ocean also because the uptake ratio of those uh, those uh, ecosystem which is growing in the sea will heavily depend on the, the what type of ecosystem is there and that will further impact our chemistry because earlier we are thinking that chemistry is changing the uh, climate now it is climate is changing the chemistry so and once chemistry is changing everything we have to further look into in great detail similarly <coughs> when you are talking about uh, this climate change means or it, uh, stratification it is not the only thing because when we are talking about uh, temperature increase and all we have to also see our interaction with the nearby oceans so if you see the more and more uh, uh, indonesian through flow water coming into the uh, indian ocean and again we are deepening the thermocline and upwelling is decreasing nutrient is coming less so again the, it will impact the fishery and you have seen that uh, kerala coast all sardines uh, our fishery is going very, very less or becoming less uh, uh, in this area. So this is again a uh, serious concern. Uh, if you further see into other aspect of that, your sea level will increase, coastal event, uh, this uh, event, event uh, means uh, it will be flooding in the coastal area will be there, low-lying area like Bangladesh and our coastal ocean, again it will be having very high impact on that. When you are uh, again uh, increase in temperature, the, it will impact the coastal erosion. And again, if you see this, this lab is also studying huge amount of uh, our work it has been done on the coral. And this because of temperature increase and all the coral uh, bleaching is happening, coral is dying and again whole ecosystem is threatened and because of that fishery will be impacted. So this type of so many uh, impact we, or it is bad impact it is bringing on the ocean. And moreover, actually, as you, everybody will agree, this, uh, this, all these studies are, I think, uh, means not sufficient to say many things about what is happening. What we know a little bit about that, actually, uh, otherwise also, you know, the, it is always has been told that Indian Ocean is least studied because, you know, uh, the people who are studying Indian Ocean, the number is less and uh, all the resources are less. So um, even after uh, so many years of uh, ocean study, uh, our Indian Ocean is always marked as least study and we are not able to come out of that. And above that means even background level study was not there, information about the background ocean was not there. Now above that, this because of climate change, everything is changing. So I think we have to put a lot of resources, a lot of human being, manpower to have more and more study, more bigger uh, program to study the Indian Ocean, uh, uh, particularly to understand every aspect of uh, ocean. And particularly when you are talking about that uh, decade, means ocean decade, uh, which is marked from 21 to 30, and also the uh, SGD 14, which talks about the uh, sustainable uh, use of the ocean and use our scientific knowledge, how to uh, maintain the su our sustenance of this ocean, I think it's very much required. This type of conference or this type of awareness is very much required. 
that more and more people should be involved in this step of study and uh, i think uh, it is our uh, duty means uh, the duty of our, all the scientists which who, who are do, uh, dealing with the ocean sciences to study more and more ocean science and to understand the system so that i think we should be better prepared for the future not only for the calamities but also for the resource point of view because i think government has big plan for the ocean uh, uh, under the uh, deep ocean mission and also about the blue economy so unless we understand the system well because uh, for, when you are talking about blue economy and exploitation of the ocean i think we have to talk about the sustainable exploitation we have to talk, think about our future prospect or future generation so that things should be at least stable for long time so that our future uh, uh, generation also should depend on that and everywhere i think we have to use our scientific knowledge scientific perspective or for that purpose i think huge amount of investment huge amount of uh, resource is required and i think there i think this type of conferences are very much required so i wish that this conference um, today at least because we have galaxy of people who are really really at the helm of the affair who are dealing with this uh, ocean science so we in this meeting through all the discussion we will be able to come out with some sort of understanding where we can put more and more focus and we can impress upon the our uh, policy makers that i think this is uh, this thing cannot be ignored along and more and more people have to work in this so i think this uh, uh, this one day conference at least a little bit uh, stir will do and as some some uh, means uh, vibration will create in this regard so i wish a very uh, um, uh, great success for this meeting thank you all and once again i welcome you in this meeting thank you very much thank you sir thank you for the excellent overview on impact of climate change as you rightly pointed out science become more enjoyable when we uh, discuss in person i move to the next uh, there are some people there are some people who do not need an introduction we have patmasri Ali Manik Fanser with us today. He has spent most of his life for gaining new knowledge and uh, contribution to science. So let us watch uh, a video that introduces uh, him better than my words.
ഞാൻ ചെറുപ്പത്തിൽ എനിക്ക് അറിയണം എന്നുള്ള ആഗ്രഹം എപ്പോഴും പഠിക്കണം അറിയണം മനസ്സിലാക്കണം എന്നുള്ള ഇതാണ് ഞാൻ എൻ്റെ ജീവിതത്തിൽ സമ്പാദിക്കാനായിട്ട് ഞാൻ ഒന്നും ചെയ്തിട്ടില്ല അറിയാൻ വേണ്ടിയുള്ള ശ്രമങ്ങൾ മാത്രമല്ല മുഴുവൻ നടത്തിയിരുന്നു ഇപ്പോഴും അത് തന്നെയാണ് ചെയ്യുന്നത് I welcome the chief guest of our function Padmasri Ali Mani fan sir to the dais for the opening address of this version My dear friends I am very happy to be with you all this morning. It's a very pleasant occasion for me to meet you all. We, the human beings, are responsible for all these climatic change and all other things. We are only going against the nature no other creature is a burden for this earth it is only the human being which is creating the havoc in our earth our home so we have to be very careful in our life once i was thinking that why people are living like this crowded in bombay calcutta and all these places there if you go to get into a train you need do anything you just stand there they will push you in this is the condition so such life we are leading and i thought why don't we try the any other type of life where we can live calmly so i purchased the land about 10 acres in the valleyur where there was no population about a kilometer around so i and my family we built a small hut there and started living there calm and quiet very peaceful very nice and we could see the sky in those days i used to take readings of the stars for my study but today when we go out and see we cannot see the stars so all because of the pollution the smoke and other things and light and created all havoc we can't see the star now if you want to see stars we can see in our room in our mobile not in the sky this is the situation in my boyhood we could we could see the pole star very clearly but now it is not seen because of this pollution why all these things have happened in quran it is said zahar al fasad fi al barri wal bahri bima kasabat aydin nas li yuzikahum ba'd alladhi amilu la'allahum yarji corruption has appeared in earth land and sea because of the hands of what the hands of the man has wrought that is so that he may turn back after knowing what all these things is why all these things are happening so we must think it is uh, the only human being who, which is creating all this havoc in our planet no other creature is doing any harm to this earth we can see there are crows there are so many animal the crow it is uh, building its uh, house just as it was building in olden days but what about us i was born and brought up in minikoy an island which is aloof not connected with uh, any other island maldives are there lakadiv is there minikoy is just away from all this island and we were all living there very calmly we had no police no need of police now everyone has to have one police behind one police ahead and right one police and left another police this is the situation 
not. That is why with all this is happening. We are not having a proper system of education. Education can change man, but we are only going to the literacy. We are not teaching them manners. We are not teaching them how to live. All these things are not done. He grows up to 25 years, and after that, he doesn't know how to live. This is what is happening. You may remember, in, even in parliament, people get violent. They start throwing chairs, mics, and all these things. Is this a good condition? We should think all these things, and we should try to behave properly in this world without disturbing other creatures. We must realize that human beings are also a link in the biological chain. If you think about the cycle chain, if one link has got some defect, it cannot work. This is what happens. We are forgetting that we are a link in the biological chain and we are behaving mis, uh, improperly and we, our misbehavior causes all this climatic change. In my days, you see, in, that is about, I was born on 1938 and when I was about 10 years, 12 years, we could see the stars very clearly. And I used to take the readings of the stars, but today we cannot do it because it is not seen in the cities. Even in the places like jungles, there also the sky is not as clear as it was in those days. When we see the sky, we will be wondering how beautiful it is. But today, the boys who are growing up, they see the sky, they don't see any stars. This is the condition. So we must realize that we human beings are responsible for all these uh, climatical changes and other changes which are connected to that. And so we should behave in our life properly. This is my advice to all the people. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. The statement you made is thought-provoking. No other organisms except man is a burden to nature. Let us all take this lesson back home as the first step in our fight against climate change. As a token of our respect and gratitude, we invite Dr. Professor Sunil Kumar Singh to present a memento to uh, Patma Sri Manifat. Thank you, sir. So we are on time. Uh, we are ready for a tea break now. Before going for a tea break, uh, I invite all of you for a group photo uh, of this workshop, so which uh, we take from here. After the group photo, we will have the tea break. And uh, we reassemble after the tea is arranged right backside. And uh, we reassemble for the workshop in uh, 30 minutes time. I request all to come forward for the group photo.
Please come forward, please. Please come forward.
I request all participants to come forward for the uh, for continuing the session. We will start the um, deliberations, scientific talks now. I request, I won't say and request all participants to occupy the seats. Shanti Suru Bhatnagar Award for Earth, uh, Planetary and Ocean Science in 2016. He received Ministry of Mines National Geoscience Award in Basic Geoscience in 2012, the Eminent Mass Spectrometry Award in 2014, and MOES National Award for Ocean Sciences in 2021. He has been honored with a Doctor of Engineering degree by the National Institute of Technology, Goa, in 2019 for his outstanding research contributions. He is the elected fellow of all the three major academic uh, academies in India. Very recently, he was recognized by the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, as among the 75 under 50 scientists shaping today's India. We are fortunate to have Professor Sunil Kumar Singh with us today, and we look forward to learn from his expertise and findings on the crucial topic of climate change. Without uh, further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Sunil Kumar Singh to the stage. Sir, please. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So I'm going to talk about modern and paleo circulation in Indian Ocean. So first part will be dealing with the different water masses uh, which is there in the Indian Ocean, how it is uh, placed, how it is moving, how from where it is coming, where it is going. And the second part will be seeing what has happened in the past, how it has changed in the past because of different climatic and tectonic activity on clear time scale and even longer uh, 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 tectonic time scale or many linear time scale because these are the time scale which are very much important 
for uh, the different purpose and when we are talking about the uh, climatic impact i think these are very much important to understand the different water masses how it is moving and what it, they are doing so here you can see the ocean circulation is very much important because if you see the uh, our earth uh, the it is not getting the heat uniformly on the equator it is getting more heat on the polar region we are getting less heat so the ocean currents the deep ocean, uh, thermohaline circulation is redistributing the heat from it is taking the heat from equatorial region and uh, bringing it to the po uh, polar region and vice versa not not only that it is also redistributing the <coughs> nutrients and oxygen uh, and also it is redistributing the carbon dioxide you actually you know that deep water is one of the uh, very big reservoir of carbon dioxide where uh, the co2 can be stayed for more than the thousand year and hence it is making a life little bit uh, simpler for us so e as you are you will see here the deep water is forming in the uh, polar region both uh, uh, the north pole and south southern pole and there it is deep uh, north atlantic deep water is forming acha here in the uh, you cannot see so deep water is forming north atlantic deep water is forming in the uh, the the north pole and here in the antarctic water uh, bottom water is forming and when they, they are going sinking down and coming part of that is coming to the indian ocean and other part is going to the uh, pacific and they are getting uh, so, or they are getting uh, so, sold there or they are appealing in those region coming by the surface current and here part of that pacific water is coming and you know indonesian through flow in this region and coming to the indian and here the, the water which is swelling they are coming together and they they are as a surface current they are going going back to the Atl uh, north atlantic and whole this whole uh, circulation uh, cycle is getting completed and it takes about 1000 a uh, year uh, so it is very much important to study how it is uh, the water mass is moving how they are coming to the indian ocean how how it is getting impacted so this this whole ocean circulation is resulted because of the sea surface temperature and the density so wherever the temperature is low you can see in the polar region Uh, and and the density which is higher so because of that the water the water is sinking in those areas and forming the deep water and the whole circulation is taking place so this is the whole circulation you can see the deep water this antarctic bottom water north antarctic deep water is forming and they are coming to the south becoming part of this uh, circumpolar deep water and part of that is going to the indian ocean then pacific ocean and as i told you the whole cycle is getting completed and if you see in terms of indian ocean water masses actually from the south we are getting sub antarctic mod water antarctic intermediate water circumpolar deep water which is having two component one is uh, north atlantic uh, uh, deep water and other is antarctic bottom water and the from south actually or the from the uh, indian ocean side we are getting red sea water uh, the and the persian gulf water indonesian through flow uh, these are the dif uh, different water masses which are present in those areas so if you see how the deep water is coming to the indian ocean actually lot of debate is there and now here people you know lot of people like dilip kumar and all they have worked significantly on that and you, you can see the when the the circumpolar current is there in the around the antarctica part of the deep water is coming through this madagascar basin and somali basin and coming to the arabian sea other part is coming from this uh, Uh, antarctica australia basin it is coming in two way one is coming to central indian ocean basin and then another is coming to eastern part and then in coming in this area but you know this is a uh, uh, ocean which is very different compared to the Ant atlantic and pacific because he, it is not pole to pole it is also uh, called uh, cool the sack so means this is dead end because it is, the water is not able to go further Uh, north so it is up, uh, swelling in this area and it is coming to the surface so the whole story you know be, uh, is getting changed and this is the one of the reason for getting ox uh, low oxygen which uh, our professor nak will be talking in this area northern indian ocean so with time actually if you see this circulation which you are talking about the deep uh, this thermohaline circulation it has changed in past uh, because of the our uh, configuration of indian plate because of tectonic activity or uh, the uh, plate motion you know Uh, earlier in this part you can see where you, right now himalaya is there tethian sea used to be there and because of this northward movement 
the Stethian Sea is closed. And when Stethian Sea was there, the Atlantic was directly connected to the Indian Ocean and to the Pacific, so the water circulation was very different. And because of the closure of the Stethian Sea, actually now it is the connectivity between the uh, Atlantic to the Indian and to the Pacific has been stopped and because of that heat transfer has get, uh, got restricted and because of that people think that the, uh, the Antarctic ice sheet which grows because of this region and the, the global cooling which has taken place since last uh, 40 million years because of this so, uh, last global last eight, 40 million year global temperature has gone down by about 8 degrees centigrade and people think that partly it is responsible because of this this closure of Tethian Sea. So it is very much important to study how, how this ocean current has changed with time. So what we are going to use uh, is a nudimium isotopic composition. People have used many uh, tracers like salinity, uh, uh, temperature, Pre, uh, density, all those things can be utilized for the different identification of different water masses. People have used chemistry like cadmium by calcium and other isotopic like uh, even carbon oxygen isotope, but they are not very much conservative. Some of them are participating in the biology and some of the tracer like uh, when we are talking about salinity and all, it cannot be utilized or extended to the past. So we were looking for one uh, uh, tracer which is abiotic, which can be utilized uh, for today and even in the past. So, neodymium is coming to be very close to that because its resistance time is about 500, 700 year, which is much less than the uh, global mixing time that is uh, 1000 years. So, it, you can see the, it, uh, the ocean water in different section is very different and that is uh, taking the neodymium isotopic composition from the local uh, uh, continent. So, if you can see the, the distribution of the rock on the continent, the, if you see the Greenland area, it is about minus 14 and minus 13. So the water which is coming in this area, they're having this type of isotopic combustion, minus 14 and minus 13. Whereas if you see in the Pacific, uh, it is surrounded by the, uh, the all the volcanic rock and they are having very, very different negative, this uh, neodymium isotopic combustion, which is minus 6 to minus 1 or 0. So the, the, they are, whatever neodymium is coming to the ocean, their isotopic combustion is quite different. And because of that, the water masses are very, uh, having very different kind of isotopic composition uh, and they are quite significantly different. And neodymium is one element which is not participating in the biology. So this is very much conservative. And once this neodymium is coming to the water, it is it will be taken up by the up by this uh, forums which is getting uh, formed uh, uh, in the water masses and they will sink to the sediment and they will be a very perfect uh, archive to study the past ocean circulation past water masses so because of that we have used neodymium isotopic composition and if you see this the same uh, ocean circulation in terms of neodymium isotopic composition. So when the North Atlantic deep water is forming, particularly in this area, so you can see the water masses which is forming here, it is about minus 14 and minus 10. And the other water mass, which is deep water mass forming is in the uh, Antarctica, the Antarctic bottom water, which is having very characteristic, characteristic neodymium isotopic composition about minus eight. So, and if you see here in the Pacific, the isotopic composition is very different. They are quite radiogenic, so we have minus five, minus four. So these two water masses are very distinct. And in the beginning, very less a study was there in the Indian Ocean, and people believe that the Atlantic water is going to the Pacific through the Indian Ocean. So the Indian Ocean is the mixture of these two. So the, it is about minus nine or something like that. Very few study was there before this study was conducted. So we did now a lot of work. And as I told you, this is a abiogenic bi proxy, can continuously record the water mass, and it is independent of this uh, 13C and cadmium and calcium. Only thing is, measurement of this uh, isotopic composition is a little bit different, difficult because it, you require almost 20 to 30 liter of water to measure the neodymium because concentration is significantly low. So measurement is a little bit uh, tough. So, here you can see Indian Ocean, uh, I think I, I need not say much because the deep water is coming and the surface water is coming from Indian Ocean through flow. So they have very different isotopic composition. Uh, so we try to study uh, 
and before our study you can see very few study was there which is talking about the deep water you can see a lot of a study has been taken globally but the indian ocean uh, you can see very few only these four uh, sections four uh, water profile was there and the entire indian ocean was very very less so it was not a very easy to understand the different water masses through uh, this nudium isotopic composition so these are the some of the distribution of the isotopic composition and you can see the yellow color is uh, from the indian ocean so there are very few data from the indian ocean so we uh, i started doing some work in this direction so we can with the ministry help of ministry of earth science we acquired the clean sampling system to sample uh, 20 liter of water from each station at the different depth so for that actually clean sampling system was required and that is made of this cable is made of kevlar oil uh, kevlar cable because uh, uh, metal cannot be utilized and this all are uh, coated with the uh, non metallic stuffs to avoid any metal composition and uh, this 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 rosette is also made of non metallic material means coated with the non metal material and also the bottles are coated with teflon to avoid any metal contamination so these were all established and when we are collecting the samples we are bringing back to this this type of clean container where uh, inside about 10000 class laboratory is there uh, and where all the sample uh, these samples are getting filtered to avoid any or initial processing by being done in this uh, clean van on the ship itself to avoid any contamination because the concentration is pico molar level so these all is, things are happening on the cruise to avoid contamination so till now actually a lot of sampling has been done you can see this under this geo program we have sampled up to 30 degrees south and significant amount of sampling of the indian ocean has been taken place not only the northern indian ocean means the bay of bengal arabian sea equatorial indian ocean even southern sector of the indian ocean has been sampled significantly and we are working in this direction <laughs> Uh, in addition to that, actually one cruise we took uh, with the help of uh, uh, Dr. Anil Kumar from the uh, NCPR, we have taken a huge long cruise to study again a new DMM isotopic commission all along the, uh, the surface of the uh, Indian Ocean. So we wanted to study completely how the new DMM isotopic composition looking and how the different water vases are behaving. So if you see, uh, talk about the new DMM, actually most of the new DMM is coming from river and uh, the dust and the, of course uh, preformed neodymium will be there a little bit you know means uh, a lot of chemistry is involved to do the neodymium because you have to take 20 liter of water extract through iron precipitation purify the neodymium through the column chemistry and do the mass spectrometry so all this thing has been done and actually we participated in the global uh, a measurement to see that our measurement is working all right because if you have to compare globally you have to compare your data with the global value so one station was fixed in the Atlantic the bat station this sample was uh, uh, given to everybody and we participated in that and you can see the our value is very much falling in the line so this is the value which we have done actually for the new demium this and this for the two sample and it's perfectly uh, coming uh, close to the accepted value so you saw that our measurements sampling everything is working all right so with this we started the sampling and you can see here all the station we have taken and we can see the concentration and neodymium particularly in the bay of bengal the concentration is varying from almost 20 nano uh, picomolar to 50 picomolar the one of the highest concentration of neodymium the global ocean we are getting in the particularly in the northern indian ocean because earlier people are thinking that indian ocean is the mixture of pacific and atlantic it is not true actually it has its own different uh, characteristic signature with very high concentration never ever i think people have observed this type of high concentration in the other uh, basin so here concentration is very very high and if you see isotopic combustion again earlier to this study people are thinking that it is just a mixture of pacific and atlantic and value was about minus nine but you can see here value is going as less radiogenic as minus 16 or minus 15 or something like that this is again one of the lowest value which is people are have reported in the ocean so here you can see that it is not it is just a mixture a significant source of neodymium is there in this part i'll be talking about that a little later if you see the bay of bengal entire section now again you can see the surface concentration here very very in the, the, this is the mouth of the ganga brahmaputra where you are getting in this side so the concentration is going up to 45 or 50 and other places it, if you go further south 
uh, it is going down at 20 picomolar and you can see the deeper it is increasing this is the characteristic signature of the neodymium the surface will be low and as we are going down it will be uh, high because of various region i will talk and then neodymium again in the near the ganga brahmaputra mouth you can see the very non radiogenic value minus 15 minus 16 and as we are moving actually value are minus 13 minus 14 and deeper water minus 10 and something like that again very different compared to the different uh, different basins and you can see as we are moving within the Bay of Bengal from north to south, the concentration is decreasing. So there's significantly it is showing there is source something in the north. <coughs> and isotopic combustion also, if you go to the north, it is less radiogenic. And as you are moving toward the east, it is more, more radiogenic. Uh, so it shows that neodymium, as I told you, concentration, neodymium concentration in Bay of Bengal is very higher compared to the various water masses present. So till now we are having understanding that water masses which we have is North Atlantic deep water uh, and the Antarctic bottom water or uh, Red Sea water and all those things, these water masses are there. But the concept, their reported concentration is much less than what we are measuring so, uh, in the Bay, Bay of Bengal. And, and many of the samples in the Bay of Bengal is less radiogenic compared to the different water masses. So, to balance this, we need a huge amount of extra neodymium to balance these uh, observation. So from there, the, where they are coming for that, actually we did some inverse model calculation, taking all the different water masses, and from uh, we are assuming that uh, some excess excess neodymium is having with excess isotopic composition. And we have taken all the different water masses like Bay of Bengal, low salinity water, Bay of Bengal uh, subsurface water, Indonesian water, Arabian Sea water, and North Atlantic intermediate, North Indian in intermediate water, uh, inter uh, Indonesian intermediate water, and North Atlantic deep water, and similarly the Antarctic bottom water. So all the uh, end member has been taken. And if you see uh, the fraction which we cal calculated in the Bay of Bengal, you can see the uh, Bay of Bengal uh, means uh, low salinity water, which is coming from the Ganga Brahmaputra. You can see near the mouth, it is almost 70, 80 percent. It means it is obvious that Ganga Brahmaputra is supplying a huge amount of water. And it is going almost up to 8 degree north. Impact of Ganga Brahmaputra is seen up to 8 degree north. In between, you can see a little bit uh, value is going down. That is because of uh, Zaire, which is uh, pushing the water, the deep water in the top. So because of that, it has gone down. And then, it's very interesting, you can see the Indonesian water. Indonesian water component in the Bay of Bengal, you can see the south, it is very high. It is almost 80 to 90 percent. And its impact is seen up almost up to 16, 70 degrees centigrade north. So Indonesian through flow, which is coming from Pacific, it is almost going to the Bay of Bengal up to 18 degrees, 17 degrees north. It is penetrating to that level, the Pacific water. Arabian Sea high salinity water, uh, it is <laughs> entering to the Bay of Bengal, and you can see uh, uh, almost about 60-70 uh, meter. It is going inside the Arab, uh, Bay of Bengal, and again going up to 40 degree north. So, Bay of uh, Arabian Sea water is almost <laughs> impinging into the Bay of Bengal uh, quite significantly. And you can see the very interesting, this modified North Atlantic deep water. Its, no, its component is quite not much, but between 1,000 and 2,000 meter, Indonesian through uh, this is modified. North Atlantic deep water is all 20 to 30 percent, and North Indian deep water is going up to 40 percent. But you see the bottom water. The bottom water actually full up, is it completely filled with the Antarctic bottom water. So Antarctic bottom water is almost, see south it is 90 percent, but you can, you can see north up to 60 and all the, the 60 percent it is there. Now, if you see, as I told you in the beginning, the concentration is very high, so we need some extra neodymium. And extra neodymium, you can see in the whole Bay of Bengal, it's significantly high. So almost 50 50 percent of the neodymium, this is the constant amount of neodymium, 10 picomolar, is excess neodymium, which is not able to explain by the different water masses. So here it is coming. Uh, uh, almost 50 percent of the war neodymium is getting supplied through uh, additional source which is having an isotopic composition of about minus 16 and 17. So this type of neodymium can come only from the sediment. Means we, we cannot dis discuss here too much but I am telling you this excess neodymium which is getting supplied can come from only from the uh, sediment supplied with the Ganga Brahmaputra. So it is showing that huge amount of neodymium is getting supplied to the uh, water column 
from the sediment which is coming from Ganga Brahmaputra and it is not only in the north or uh, limited to the self or to the uh, bottom sediment, it is all over, I think you can, you have seen that. You can see that almost everywhere, huge amount of extra nudimium. So this is getting supplied through the sediment of the Ganga Brahmaputra. So directly, whatever you see the nudimium isotopic composition, the water mass, we cannot use as a water mass tracer. You have to take care for the supply of the continental sources in many of the places and later on actually a lot of a study has been taken globally and people have reported that yes this type of uh, activity is happening in many of the region where you have huge amount of sediments so where the boundary exchange is taking place and neodymium signature can be altered through the local supply so every time you cannot use neodymium as a water mass signature you have to take care of these boundary exchange processes now you can see in the what is happening in the Arabian Sea. So Arabian Sea have taken three three stations very close to the coast, and also we have taken another uh, section like this. And there you can see uh, different water masses based on temperature and salinity. And Antarctic bottom water, North Atlantic deep water, Red Sea water, and Persian Gulf water, and Bay of Bengal water is also entering. And here you can see that it is much different compared to the Bay of Bengal. Here concentration is uh, almost going up to 25 in the deeper and surface is almost 20. So it is not going as high as 45 or something like that. Arabian Sea is significantly different because you know the sediment supply is not as much as in the uh, Bay of Bengal. And isotopic composition also it is not like uh, Ganga Pramput means uh, Bay of Bengal. Here you can see the surface is quite radiogenic, minus eight, minus seven, we are getting value we are getting, and deeper water minus nine, something like which is uh, defined by that uh, Antarctic bottom water. And here, uh, this section is very interesting, you can see. So this is, this sec from here to here it is plotted, and you can see the, uh, uh, this is the isotopic composition, uh, so you can see, clearly see the surface non-radiogenic value, and what is happening, the when water is coming from this, you can see the, uh, the contours are becoming vertical, so I think this is the impact of uh, soling which is happening. So when water is, uh, Arabian Sea water is coming, uh, deep water is coming, it is get, because uh, it is not able to move further, so it is becoming, uh, a part of that is coming to the surface and that is the, uh, getting reflected here. Uh, and <coughs> this is the section which is taken from this, this area, this part to this part, so similar thing is happening. And here if you see, uh, 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 partitioning uh, actually. So here you can see uh, mostly the Bay of Bengal water uh, in the part of that it is in this area it is Bay of Bengal water is entering the Arabian Sea so that you can see in the southern Bay of Bengal and then uh, you can see modified North Atlantic deep water. So this patch is there which is coming between 1000 to 2000 meter in this area. A little bit you can see as it is coming to the coastal area it is uh, getting uh, sold in this area so the height is uh, the depth is decreasing in the coastal area and again the bottom water is filled with antarctic bottom water as usual uh, whatever we have seen the bay of bengal and uh, so here also a little bit new excess nudimium is there but only limited to the southern part where we have bay of bengal water so bay of bengal water wherever it is there we have the excess nudimium other part excess nudimium is not much so it, here it is very safe to use uh, epsilon neodymium without any correction. They, uh, they reflect the water mass signature. And the, this profile we have plotted here. So you can see here, this is, this is the portion for the modified North Atlantic deep water. And this is Antarctic bottom water. Here it is Red Sea water which is coming in this portion. Uh, very much uh, 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 characterized by the neodymium isotopic composition and Arabian Sea high salinity water in the surface. River is very, very small. River part is not significant. So as here also you can see, as we are going towards the coast, it is having tendency of soling. Uh, so excess, again, is not very significant in the Arabian Sea, any part. But if you see the next neodymium work which we have carried out in the Eastern Indian Ocean, it is very interesting here. You can see because you are getting a lot of Indonesian through flow from uh, uh, Pacific and this is controlling the monsoon and all, it is very much important. And about 10 sort of uh, water is coming from that. So how it is getting distributed, for that actually we have measured neodymium isotopic composition. So concentration is again, it's not like Bay of Bengal, very uh, moderate concentration is there, 
But isotopic composition, if you see, here you can see this portion, this, this, this area, in the, this part you can see, which is impacted by the Indonesian through flow. The Indonesian through flow signature is there. Isotopic composition is minus 5, minus 4, minus 3. So it is very much uh, showing that huge amount of uh, Indonesian through flow is coming to the uh, Central Indian Ocean, which is almost going to this part, uh, Western Indian Ocean. And uh, this, this Indonesian through flow, which has very little bit time, we can, we can uh, uh, see uh, in the past. And very, very interesting here, you can see uh, the, in this area, modified North Atlantic deep water. So you can see in the south, uh, the depth is 3,000 to 2,000, which is becoming almost th up to coming up to 500 meter, this modified North Atlantic deep water in this section. So the swelling is very significantly happening in this area. And this is filled with, again, North Atlantic deep water. So if you, uh, so this, this can be utilized to study the fast uh, ocean circulation because this neodymium is getting trapped into this uh, uh, iron uh, magnet crust as well as in the foraminifera. So if we want to study the same thing, how the water masses have changed in the past, actually we can utilize this signature. And we have done some of the study. Actually, some earlier study was existing in this area, one or two places. So one study, they have measured this neodymium isotopic composition up to 0.8 million year. And the significant variation has been seen and they have interpreted it as a change in uh, riverine supply with time because river uh, glacial time it is less and uh, non interglacial time water is mo uh, more supply is there so because of that neodymium isotopic composition is changing but the same signature uh, which other people have studied and they have interpreted in terms of uh, the strength of north atlantic deep water and antarctic wa bottom water how it has changed with the glacial interglacial time scale so to resolve that Actually, we have done some work. Actually, we have taken many courses like DSDP 237, 731, IODP 633 to characterize how the change in the uh, Indonesian through flow has taken place. And, and then another IODP got 353 you have seen in this area. And in addition to that, so these are talking about the longer time scale up to 30 million year. year. And here we have done some, some of the study in the kilo year time scale which we are going up to 50 kilo year so i will just show one or two results because i know time is not there yeah just i will conclude so he this is one of the result i think uh, will, uh, this one result which is gc 10 which we have collected uh, almost on the lakati bridge uh, um, in front of the uh, goa area so that that location we have collected and you can see this variation of a neodymium isotopic gums and with time up to 40 kilo year, it is varying significantly between minus 11 to minus uh, 7 or 6.5. And if you plot along with the known climatic events, you can see this, the whenever cooling event is there, whenever cooling event is there, isotopic composition is more radiogenic. And whenever, whenever interglacial or cooling is not there, isotopic composition, what we are observing is a little bit radiogenic. So what is happening? What we are interpreting in the here is that it is just reflection of variation of North Atlantic deep water and Antarctic bottom water. North Atlantic deep water isotopic emission is less radiogenic, minus 10, minus 11, what is, what is coming to the Indian Ocean. And Antarctic bottom water is about minus 6, minus 7. So whenever uh, cooling, uh, I, glow, uh, cooling period is there, who means uh, 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 glacial period is there, or Henrik event when temperature is low, North Atlantic deep water, which is coming there, they're becoming slow. Because of that, less what North Atlantic deep water is coming in the Indian Ocean. And when they are uh, interglacial period, uh, uh, North Atlantic deep water is coming more. So because of that, it is becoming more uh, less radiogenic. So this is the just uh, how the North Atlantic deep water and Antarctic, Antarctic bottom water is behaving with during glacial interglacial time period. And it is beautifully reflected. All the this event, if you can see, whether it is Henrik event 1, 2, 3, 4, LGM, and younger dryas, or the different climatic uh, event, which has been given at 4.2, 2.8, 1 point. Cooling event, all the cooling event, uh, this North Atlantic deep water is low, so isotopic composition is tracking that. So very beautifully it is tracking here. So this is one study, a similar study we have done uh, another core and it is again showing actually some places, particularly the uh, the places where in the uh, uh, 
uh, east of uh, Lakshadweep Ridge, uh, means where you have a basin, there actually all the signature is getting altered because a lot of sediment is coming, and that is the uh, neodymium signature is, cannot be utilized. Uh, for isotopic combustion to track the water masses. And this is the longer time scale you can see. Isotopic combustion is changing. And this is happening because, uh, uh, because of uh, re reorientation of oceanic plates. So when 30 million years, uh, the water was able to go from Indian Ocean to the Pacific. And then 14 million, ocean, ocean got re reorganized. Actually, Tethian Sea completely closed. So uh, North Atlantic deep water now is able to come. And then 3.5 million closure of Tethian Sea, so Indonesian gateway. And that has reflected in this uh, plot very nicely. You can see uh, because of uh, less radiogenic value and higher radiogenic value. So because of that third time, I'll uh, stop it here. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, an excellent discussion presentation on the complexities of circulation of water masses in the Indian Ocean using neodymium as a marker. So now we can accommodate a couple of questions uh, as part of the discussion. Oh, one second, sir. I will give you that. Pardon, sir? The title part will be there, but orthogenic neodymium, which is there, it, is, it will be there in the uh, forums and also iron manganese hydroxide, which is getting coated. So, there it will be there with iron manganese hydroxide. So, pardon? That is the water column you are been taking. So, source of is coming from sediment, yes. Sediment, yes. So how is the concentration there in the sediments of Bay of Bengal? So sediment concentration is uh, in neodymium is 20 ppm, 30 ppm, something like that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. And Dr. Singh, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, very good presentation. Uh, one doubt I had in your um, opening remarks, you said uh, uh, the tropical Indian Ocean is warming much, almost double than what other tropical oceans are 1.4 degree or something like that, you said. Uh, is it uh, due, due to some slowing down of thermohaline circulation so that that northward extension of the Antarctic bottom water is not reaching northward? Have uh, you any? Actually, there are multiple regions. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, know, the, you were talking about referring to that morning which I have discussed. Yeah. Morning and afternoon. Uh, yeah, yeah, campaign. yeah. So actually, what is happening, you know, the again, which we were discussing about North Atlantic deep, oh, sorry, the Indian Ocean is uh, not pole to pole. So you have a stackle there. Yeah, yeah. So partly when we are heat, hitting the material, heat is contained in this area. Heat is not able to dissipate compared to the other portion. So heating is much more here. In addition to that, uh, because of Larina El Nino effect, the Indonesian through flow is coming more. So that is also adding to that. And that is the one region you see the, the area which was hitting means uh, earlier the temperature in the mini warm pool, a uh, warm pool which was there in the uh, Bay of Bengal. Now it is shifted uh, almost to the uh, Western Arabian Sea. So this is also contributing to that. Mm. So these are some of the factors which are uh, controlling this uh, increase. Means uh, the global value is 0.1 here, whereas uh, one four, uh, Indian Ocean value is 0.1 or something like that uh, for uh, per, per decade. Yeah. So something like that is because of the configuration, which of the heat retention, which of the, the water inflow, all these things are contributing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, first question I will have. Thank you, Sunilji. Uh, you said that actually the source of the neodymium is mainly through the sediments of the Ganges Brahmaputra and the concentration it is shown as high near the mouth. Now why, my question is, when the, the, the sequence of neodymium is increasing towards south, what no. is the status of neodymium in the Ganges Brahmaputra river itself? When the source itself is that particular river is contributing this much, so what are the concentrations in the river itself? So concentration, actually, uh, river concentration, if you see, uh, dissolve phase, or sediment you are talking about. Because sediment, right now, Bay of Bengal, it is mostly sediment driven. So north sediment is supplying more, south you are going, it is less. But if you see in the river, the concentration is almost 40, 50, like what we have seen. 
So actually, till now, there is no report for the Ganga Brahmaputra. Uh, it has not been done, but we have uh, some unpublished data which we have done in that area. So it is uh, very similar to what we have seen in that part. But uh, um, if you see the geochemistry of neodymium, most of the new rare earth, any rare earth which is coming from the river, it is getting sequestered in the uh, sediment in the estuary itself. So dissolved portion is only 20, 30 percent is coming to the, uh, uh, this area in the open ocean. So only sediment which is coming, it is getting released uh, in the uh, coastal area, any, wherever the sediment, um, immature sediments are there, there it is contributing. So uh, dissolved phase is getting mostly trapped in the estuary. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can accommodate one more short question. After that, further questions, I think we can discuss uh, during one-to-one -one discussion during the lunch break. Thank you so much, Professor Singh, for your uh, nice presentation. Actually, we are also working on the Antarctic bottom water formation and all. And we know that uh, mainly the circumpolar deep water is the main contribution uh, given by the, for the formation of Antarctic bottom water. So your uh, studies also is telling that uh, the Antarctic bottom water and uh, North Atlantic deep water, that is mainly converting to circumpolar deep water. That uh, signatures you are getting. But other two water masses formation is uh, the subantarctic mode water and the Antarctic intermediate water. Whether you are getting that signature also, in the uh, northern so mode water is not we are not good but uh, uh, intermediate water we are getting the signature so as you are going a little bit southern arabian sea and all there we are getting and uh, in the co in the glacial period actually uh, i have not seen we have the data it has further gone uh, into the Arab arabian sea and we are getting signature of uh, uh, antarctic intermediate water in that area so during uh, this uh, cold period it is getting enhanced Thank you, sir. Uh, as we are running short of time, uh, additional questions uh, may be during the discussion time. So as a token of appreciation, we present a memento to Professor Dr. Singh. I invite Dr. Shubha Satyendranath to present the memento to Professor Singh. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again for the excellent presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Shubhas Satyendranath. Uh, Dr. Shubhas Satyendranath is a well-renowned expert on ocean color remote sensing and marine optics. Educated in India and France, Dr. Satyendranath started her career as a scientist at CSIRNAO. She has over 40 years of experience wherein her research has focused on understanding the interaction of light with the ocean biota and the consequence for marine ecology, biogeochemistry, climate, and health. Her work with the Partnership for Observation of the Global Ocean and other international initiatives, such as the International Ocean Color Coordinating Group, has advanced international collaborations in remote sensing. Her Many scientific contributions have been recognized by the award of the Grand Dame Medaille Albert Premier Monaco in 2022. She was awarded the 2021 A.G. Huntsman Medal in recognition of her outstanding research achievements in the development of, uh, of the use of optics and satellites in marine science as well as her dedication to developing international cooperation and capacity building in oceanography and ocean color remote sensing. She has devoted considerable effort to capacity building in developing countries for which she has received the IOC UNESCO NK Paniker Medal. She is currently based at Plymouth Marine Laboratory and is the science lead for the ocean color component of the Climate Change Initiative of the European Space Agency. It is my pleasure to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Shubha Satyendranath. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Anas. Uh, th and thank you for this opportunity to talk to all of you. It's, uh, as Anas mentioned, a, an opportunity to come back home for me. As Anas mentioned, I started my scientific career at the NIO in Goa. So, um, the work I'm going to present here builds on that of a large number of my colleagues and I would like to begin by acknowledging them all, but in particular, 
the contributions from Trevor Platt. So, uh huh. Hmm. I need to go backwards. Okay. So, the main focus of my talk here is ocean color. So, it's a matter of everyday observation. If you look at the water, it is likely to have different colors depending on where you are and when you are. So the question here is what causes these changes? Can we quantify the responsible agents? And can we learn anything about the aquatic ecosystems from these changes? So the focus of the talk is our planet the planet Earth. But to put it in context, let me take a slight detour to our neighbor, the planet Mars. Now, if you look at a planetary image of Mars, it looks very different from ours. So, um, let me carry on, I'm sure it'll come back. Um, and since perhaps the 1960s, SPAGE's agencies have been exploring Mars. Actually, it is a longer time scale than some of the Earth observation missions. And the, one of the primary objectives of missions to planet Mars has been to explore the potential life on the planet. So James Lovelock, whom at least some of you should know as the mastermind behind the Gaia hypothesis, suggested that we just need to look at the atmosphere of Mars to decide if there is life on Mars. The argument goes that any life forms for their survival will consume resources and they will um, throw out waste. And this will change their environment. And in an environment such as Mars, which doesn't have an ocean, the chances are that the impact will be seen in the atmosphere. So he said, look for the, uh, any evidence that the Mars atmosphere is not in thermodynamic equilibrium. In fact, it's a difficult thing to prove, but we have not seen any evidence that it is not in thermodynamic equilibrium, but that hasn't stopped us from exploring for life on Mars, and to date, we haven't found any life on Mars. So how does that compare with our atmosphere here on the Earth? It's quite different. If you look at uh, the atmosphere of Mars, it's mostly carbon dioxide and oxygen is, in, is a trace gas. On the other hand, if you look at the Earth, we have about 30%, sorry, 20% plus oxygen and carbon dioxide is a trace gas. But this was not always the case. Uh, about two or three billion years ago, Earth did look very much like Mars in this respect. Our oxygen levels were nil and carbon dioxide was high. But it all began to change about, can I do this? Perhaps not, sorry. I won't try to point. So it all began to change about 3.2 billion years ago and it started changing with the appearance of oxygenic photosynthesis. And this process is solely responsible for the oxygen that we find in our atmosphere and which permits life on this earth as we know it. So photosynthesis then requires, uh -huh, now to go back, a, a single molecule above anything else, and that is chlorophyll. This molecule absorbs light in the blue part of the spectrum and also in the red part of the spectrum, leaving plants 
the color of the, the green color, gives them the green color. And this absorbed energy is used in photosynthesis in the presence of sunlight to break down water and carbon dioxide and convert this into organic material and release oxygen. So if you now look at the, our planet, there on the right top side, you see that on land, rich ecosystems such as the Amazon rainforest are green in color and they represent high productive water uh, ecosystems. We know that we need the rainforests of this world. But if you look at the oceans, they look predominantly blue. So does it mean that the oceans are barren? In fact, the oceans are not always blue. They do change color depending on what's in it. And artists have appreciated the beauty of the changing color of the oceans for a long time. But if we want to do a scientific research on this property, then we need to quantify the effect of color in relation to the concentration of the various constituents in the water. In fact, we can show theoretically using absorption and scattering properties of material present in water that the color does change in it. If you have just pure seawater, the high backscattering by water in the blue part of the spectrum combined with very low absorption gives seawater or any water, if, as long as it is clear and barren, a very deep blue color. If you add phytoplankton in it. Now, these are microscopic organisms that contain chlorophyll. The color shifts to green. Addition of non-algal or detrital particles could render the water brown. And if you have a lot of dissolved organic matter, you could have a sort of reddish color to the water. And so you can think of uh, the color of the water as being a three-part system in which the color is determined by a system made up of chlorophyll-containing phytoplankton, suspended sediments, and dissolved organic matter. And in fact, these changes in color can be detected from space now using satellites, ocean color satellites. And these give you dramatic pictures of the dynamics of coastal waters. But again, if you think about the open ocean, our impression is that of blue color. And if we are talking about forests of the ocean, then we know that kelp forests and things, related things in the coastal waters may be green. But again, we are perplexed by the blue of the open ocean. Why is this? This is because the forests of the ocean, they're microscopic and they are free floating and they are present typically in low concentrations. But they are a family of highly diverse community of organisms that all photosynthesize and they are present everywhere. But the, the, their small size in fact, if you compare them with terrestrial ecosystems, the size of the smallest and or the largest phytoplankton cells compared to the plants and trees on land is about a 100 million times. So it's difficult for us to see them with the naked eye. But their collective impact is high. And if you pull back from the surface of the ocean to space, and you look at what's happening in the ocean, these satellites are able to pick up very small changes in the color of the ocean and pick up blooms of phytoplankton. Now, um, should wait till it shows you a certain bloom. There you go. There you can see a phytoplankton bloom appearing. So once these images are processed, you can generate these beautiful images that show 
the swirls and um, dynamics of phytoplankton in the different parts of the world. So they are microscopic, but their collective is huge, so much so that you can see them from space. So why should we care if we can plot chlorophyll concentration from space? I return to my earlier argument that chlorophyll A is the molecule that we need to act as a transducer that collects, that connects the energy for our ecosystems, which is the sun, to the life forms in our planet, which are our ecosystems. And that happens through chlorophyll. No chlorophyll, no life, at least not as we know. It's not the aerobic uh, life that uh, we need to survive on our planet. So any uh, map of chlorophyll concentration is showing you the strength of this coupling between the sun and our ecosystem. The higher the chlorophyll concentration, stronger is the coupling. So with satellites then, you can produce maps of chlorophyll at the global scale or at smaller scales. I will show some of that as we go along. Um, at uh, different times and over, very, uh, over multiple years. So bear in mind that these maps are possible because phytoplankton absorb blue color. So these are based on absorption of light by phytoplankton. But what happens to the absorbed light? One pathway for the absorbed light is photosynthesis, which we talked about earlier. So if you have chlorophyll images, and if you couple it with a primary production model, primary production being the term for, the ecological term for photosynthesis, you can take the surface biomass from satellites, couple with the amount of light reaching the sea surface, which is also available these days from satellites, combine it with the light transmission model and compute primary production at any depth and at any uh, time, at any location, wherever satellite data are available. So that now lets you to compute primary production at the global scale. And if you do this repeatedly for many years, you can now begin to look at trends in primary production. So. Here, is some, here are some of our results that shows that we have areas where primary production is increasing and some other areas where it is decreasing. And the increase is mostly confined to the high latitudes and probably related to the melting ice in the polar regions. But this kind of information is now permitting us to ask What's happening to phytoplankton? What's happening to primary production? Is it uh, fragile? And are we in the, at the risk of losing this very valuable resource? And so on. But for that, you need to combine satellite information with theoretical models. But there is yet another role for phytoplankton. And that is related, again, to the fact that they absorb light. The energy used and stored as primary production is only a very small fraction of the total light that's absorbed by phytoplankton. The rest is dissipated as heat and contributes to the heating of the sunlit layers of the ocean. So the implication is that if you have a lot of phytoplankton, absorption by phytoplankton confines the heating closer to the surface, whereas if you had a barren blue ocean, then the light would penetrate deeper into the ocean. So using uh, circulation models coupled with light penetration models, you can show that on times of uh, high concentrations of phytoplankton, the surface waters of the ocean would be warmer than they would be otherwise, whereas the deeper waters would be cooler 
than they would be otherwise. But there is uh, one other detail, well, it's not exactly a detail, an important fact to add, and that is that phytoplankton are not just chlorophyll containing pigments, as I mentioned, uh, containing cells. As I mentioned earlier, we have a variety of phytoplankton types, species in the water, different taxa, and they contain different pigments, and they have different roles in ocean biogeochemistry. Again, we can exploit these changes in their optical properties to look not just at phytoplankton, but also at the main types of phytoplankton present in the water. Let's say that, well, at least in partial recognition of the important role of phytoplankton in our planetary system, ocean color and phytoplankton are now recognized as essential climate variables. The ESA's Climate Change Initiative has an ocean color component, and as part of this initiative, we produce chlorophyll concentrations at daily, we weekly, monthly, and annual timescales. And because these products are meant for climate applications, they come with per pixel uncertainty characterizations. And climate um, studies also require that we minimize gaps. So these are produced after merging multiple satellites to enable us to generate a long time series, overcoming the limitations of the finite lifetimes of individual sensors. The time scale now is over 24 years long. So I mentioned the fundamental importance of chlorophyll as a sustainer of all ecosystems as we know it, the pelagic ecosystem for the oceans. But one of the things that we can also s investigate is the impact on the higher trophic levels. Professor Singh in his introductory remarks mentioned the threat to fisheries. So there have been uh, work, for example, from Trevor Platt and colleagues where they looked at the match and mismatch between phytoplankton blooms and those of fish larvae and they demonstrated that the survival of the fish larvae will depend on the extent to which there is synchronization between the spawning of the larvae and the blooming of phytoplankton. In fact, one of the things we can do using uh, ocean color data of the type that I mentioned uh, through the Ocean Color Climate Change Initiative is to look at what happens at a much smaller scale. Let's bear in mind that climate change is a global phenomenon, but the impact that matters for us is local in scale. So if you take this chlorophyll map at the global scale, but then zoom in on the southwest coast of India, um, we see that we are finding there is a general decreasing trend in chlorophyll in these waters. I was intrigued, therefore, to see the other day from a presentation by Shinoj from CMFRI that the sardine fishery is also on the decline in recent years. So it's worth asking whether there is a relationship between what's happening to the sardine fisheries and to the changes in the phytoplankton distributions. Of course, there are a lot of evidence from around the world that shows that at least at very large scales, there are strong relationships between fisheries and the primary productivity in that region. But as I mentioned earlier, there is also the suggestion and increasing evidence that not just the amount of phytoplankton and primary production matter for fisheries, but also the timing of the event. I note in particular the paper by Nandini Menon and colleagues about the uh, fluctuations in uh, sardine fisheries of Kerala. So 
I mentioned in my promised, at least in my title, that I will mention the relevance of all this for cholera. In the last few minutes, let me cover that part. So there is a darker side to ecosystems, and that is related to waterborne and vector-borne diseases. Uh, Cholera-causing bacteria, Vibrio cholerae, requires water for their survival. There are many uh, vector bone diseases that are spread by mosquitoes, and mosquitoes need water for survival in their larval stages. Then there are also uh, issues related to invasive species. It has been um, known for quite some time, mainly based on the work of uh, Professor Rita Colwell and colleagues, that the there is a strong environmental link to outbreaks of cholera in various parts around the world. Particularly, they have worked a lot in Bangladesh and sometimes also in, in Calcutta, which is the example I have shown here. So they were able to show that the outbreaks of cholera cases in the region of the data from, in the data from Calcutta could be modeled with a one-month uh, lead time by using chlorophyll concentration, sea surface temperature, and rainfall data. So that's just an example. And we have more recently looked at the problem in our backwaters in Vembenad Lake. And this is what we found. In certain parts of the lake, chlorophyll concentration appears to be positively related to environmental vibrio presence or absence information in the lake, but in certain other parts, the opposite is the true, is true. So this is an ongoing investigation, but Anas's paper in 2021 showed that plankton and uh, well, let me, the in the data for the Wembenad Lake, the strongest links are between Vibrio and plankton, both zooplankton and phytoplankton, but phytoplankton is stronger than zooplankton. And in that work, um, Abdulaziz and colleagues suggested that these interactions may be related to laminarinase and chitinase activities. Uh, so there is a lot more to be learned here about how phytoplankton may be supporting or inhibiting the growth of uh, pathogenic bacteria such as Vibrio. So if you look at the overall role of the environment in, uh, say, outbreaks of diseases or of infection from waterborne diseases, we see that the picture is quite complex. In fact, it goes even beyond the water, and we need to know what's happening in the surrounding land area, sanitation conditions, eating habits, and uh, related things matter. In addition to the whole suite of what happens in the water itself, how what are the conditions favorable for growth and decay of the pathogens, what happens to the circulation, the residence time, flushing rate, and so on. So it is a, it's a big problem that nevertheless needs to be tackled. And the only way we can do it is through integration of multiple disciplines. So I would like to conclude at this stage and um, summarize that phytoplankton are intimately related to life as we know it on this planet. And chlorophyll is the magic molecule that dictates the coupling between our primary energy source and our marine ecosystems. Phytoplankton are, the, are those who host the chlorophyll molecules and together they hold our entire pelagic ecosystem together. They are surprisingly important players in the Earth's climate, 
and they also have a profound influence on human health and our sense of well-being. As ocean scientists, or more broadly as aquatic scientists, we have an imperative to monitor and safeguard water quality. I started with Lovelock. Let me go back to him to conclude. He pointed out when he was talking about climate studies that the field required expertise from multiple fields. But he bemoaned the fact that if these experts don't talk to each other, when they do talk to each other, they don't listen to each other. And if they do listen to each other, they can't understand each other because they have different languages. So these are barriers that we need to break down if we are going to address the pressing questions of the day. And that means different disciplines working together, different institutes working together. And I close on that note with, and this is my small tribute to Trevor. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the enlightening talk on the application of satellite remote sensing of ocean color to study not only the ocean's production, but also the waterborne diseases like cholera. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, let us open the lecture for discussion. We can accommodate a few questions. How do you define a pure seawater? Um, optically, it means you, there is no absorption or scattering by anything other than water molecules. So it's very, very difficult to find pure seawater. But you can get something close to it, say, in the center of the southern uh, Pacific gyre. Uh, but very often in the very uh, deep ocean gyres, you can get purer seawater that we can readily produce in the lab. Thank you, madam. It was uh, fantastic slides and uh, this stuff was excellent. I just uh, wanted to, I mean, uh, there was an NS paper, it was like the plankton acting as a horse for Vibrio. That was the point which I wanted to, you know, like it is a pathogen affecting human or warm-blooded and uh, it is as a result of sanitation conditions or whatever reaching. And maybe the chlorophyll or high productivity areas or those eutrophi eutrophication, I mean those places which is eutrophied, probably providing a protection or the exudates from the algae or from the plankton may be supporting the life of the Vibrio, mm -hmm. and also what we have seen when we look at the survival kinetics of pathogens in the system, we find sunlight as a major, uh, you know, eliminator of these organisms which are coming with the sewage flux or whatever. So probably this uh, thick vegetation or the algal mat or whatever, protecting them from the light and maybe extending their survival. So I feel that uh, maybe, you know, I really don't know whether they're acting as a host is, uh, I mean, I have concern about that. But it's definitely the other things will support their extended survival and getting back into the food chain through several routes. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, Hatha, the one point to remember is that bacteria such as Vibrio are, after all, a natural component of ecosystems. So we are not talking about being able to eliminate these types of bacteria completely from the environment. But what can be done, perhaps with some effort, is to uh, decrease or eliminate completely the contributions to this population from uh, poor sanitation issues. The, a related issue is that I, you know this better than me. They, there are over 100 serotypes of Vibrio cholerae bacteria. Only two of them are responsible for pandemics. And those generally come through the human pathway. 
So we should try to avoid those appearing in our natural water bodies. And in the same way, I think uh, Anas can speak better than me about this, but a lot of the samples from our areas show very high antimicrobial resistance. That's another thing that we have to be seriously worried about. Now, we could debate whether I use the right term when they said they serve as hosts. Perhaps that is uh, not as uh, suitable a term as some, uh, something else that we could use. But the point is that they are found in association. Please. Remote sensing, and you, we are also discussing about uh, ecosystem composition is changing. So, like uh, cyanobacteria and all. Mm -hmm. So, is it possible to remotely sense those uh, changes? Like uh, cyanobacteria, can we see whether it is really changing uh, with time? Uh, it's a very good question, processing, and I think the answer for our the Indian Ocean waters is that especially through remote sensing, there is increasing evidence that some unusual blooms are increasing in their frequency, extent, and concentration. The Noctiluca blooms are a case in point. I was hoping, I'd wanted to get an image from the latest INSAT uh, OCM3 data to show these huge blooms of Noctiluca in the Northern Arabian Sea. I don't remember seeing anything like that before. So there are models that tell you that with all the climate change uh, uh, aspects that uh, are related to changing stratification in the ocean, phytoplankton should decrease with time. But the 24 year time series that I showed is not showing very clear evidence for that. So what's happening? Are the satellite data wrong, or are the models that need to be revisited? But something is very clear. None of these models have Noctiluca in them. So if the plankton are adapting by changing their composition and changing their function, the problem is a lot more complex than we re ever realized. Um, and th so the harmful algal blooms are appearing very close to our waters. Um, I don't know, when was it Nandini? We walked around the waters here. You pick up a sample, you look in it, and you can see Noctiluca. I don't remember seeing that ever before in that uh, manner. So there's a lot of changes that are happening that we still don't know very much about. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Madam, uh, this question is regarding sardine fishery. Actually, the single most important compound uh, that determines the recruitment of sardine uh, is the polyunsaturated fatty acids. So uh, whenever the sardines get a poly a sufficient amount of PIFA from their food, re the recruitment and fishery will be very high and fishery will be successful. So the composition of the phytoplankton is also important Definitely, in determining yeah, yeah. the recruitment of sardine fishery and success. Yeah. So uh, can we uh, get some picture uh, regarding the composition of the phytoplankton from ocean color data? Yes. Um, the ans brief answer is yes. Long answer will take me a long okay. time, so okay. I won't go there. But the sh short answer is yes. So many of these beneficial fatty acids are uh, produced at high concentrations by diatoms. Okay. And I think there is evidence that uh, sardines like diatoms. In other words, that association is there. When diatoms are high, sardines tend to be high. And if we want to make the link between the bottom of the trophic level phytoplankton and fisheries, we have better luck when we are looking at the small pelagics. So I think sardines and mackerels and those fish, are, they're a good place to start. But definitely, the, there are methods to map diatoms from space. But not all species can be identified from space. Okay, thank you. Okay, ma'am, thank you thank once you again. Much. As a token of our gratitude, we request Dr. Shubha to accept a memento from Dr. Nakwi. Dr. Nakwi, could you please hand over the memento to Dr. Shubha?
thank you thank you so much now let us delve deeper into the pressing issue of climate change with our distinguished speaker who is a scientist with a wealth of experience in the field of oceanography he started his career with csir nau and spent most of his life with this and retired as a director of csir nau in 2016 he has always also been associated with international organizations lament doherty earth observatory of columbia university Nagoya University, Max Planck Institute, Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and Council of Scientific and Industrial Research New Delhi. He was a distinguished visiting professor at Indian Institute of Technology Kanpur for 2 years. He has now been selected as a National Science Chair by the Science and Engineering Research Board. to work in the national botanical research institute like now for 3 years specializing in biochemistry of oxygen depleted aquatic systems nakwi has co-authored over 200 publications including four books or monographs dr nakwi has received numerous awards including csir young scientist award shandeshwaru batnagar prize national awards for ocean science and technology He is a geochemistry fellow and a fellow of all science academies in India and the Academy of Sciences for Developing World. Dr. Nakwi served as a member of several national and international committees. Today, Dr. Nakwi will share his perspectives on the topic of discussion climate change. Dr. Nakwi's talk is sure to trigger a thought-provoking discussion on the topic deoxygenation in the northern Indian Ocean. Let us welcome Dr. Nakwi to share his views. Welcome, sir. Thank you much. Can you hear me? Okay. Let me start by saying that it was my pleasure to give that moment, memento to Shubha. Shubha, Loka, and I actually started our career in NIU way back in the 19, late 1974, early 1975. uh as uh, has been mentioned i mostly work at the national institute of oceanography i have been in csir uh, i have served csir longer than anybody else actually i am getting back to csir after 45 years of service again uh, it's my pleasure to be here to acknowledge the contribution of my colleagues in nio very many of them i can't name them uh so this mostly the work that i carried out in nio uh over the years uh, from 1974 to 2016 so it's just a coincidence that i am also the atmosphere with the composition of our planetary neighbors venus and mars but there is one thing that i must point out that the the density of these atmospheres is very different you know venus has a much thicker atmosphere about 100 times as much as our our planet uh and while mars has a much thinner atmosphere so the atmospheric pressure uh, at the surface of the planet is very different nonetheless you will notice that uh, carbon dioxide is the major constituent of the atmospheres of both these planets 96% in the case of venus and 95% in the case of mars and as shubha pointed out there is very little carbon dioxide in our uh, atmosphere is uh, now 0.041 percent uh, for 421 uh, ppm uh, but it has risen from you know 280 to 421 and we are very concerned about it rightly so but uh, and and this is largely because of the presence of water on our planet uh, as i shall point out uh, but what i want to point out is uh, that there is uh, uh, the, the the atmosphere of the uh, of our planet consists mostly of nitrogen in fact all the nitrogen that we have on our planet is in our atmosphere uh, very little in the in the crust uh, in the solid phase uh, it's not the case for oxygen we have about 21% the uh, the atmosphere has 21% oxygen but uh, th- that's a very small uh, fraction of the total amount of oxygen that we have on our planet most of it is actually bound with rocks silicates but we also have uh, you know 
uh, oxygen bound in carbonate and other minerals as well. Uh, and this is free oxygen, which is rarely found on our planet. By the way, you will notice that Mars also contains little bit of oxygen, but because its atmosphere is very thin in absolute terms, there's not a great deal of atmosphere of oxygen in Mars's atmosphere. Uh, so this is uh, because uh, this difference is largely because of the, primarily because of the fact that why it's not working. Uh, is, is because of the fact that uh, the uh, planet, our planet contains water. Now, uh, Mars also contained water at some point in the past actually, but that water has been blown up, blown away because uh, the atmosphere also has been blown away, the water has been, the oceans have been blown away because Mars is much smaller in size, so it cooled down very rapidly. It doesn't have a magnetic field unlike uh, uh, Earth. Earth has a strong magnetic field because of the, the fluid that we have in our uh, outer core. Uh, so the, the composition is important, but what's most important is the, is the right distance from the sun, from our planet. So that regulates that the temperature is something called the habitation zone. Uh, so the Earth happens to be located right in the middle, or very close to the middle of the habitation zone of, uh, of the sun. And it's of the right size, right chemical composition, uh, and right distance from the, uh, from the uh, sun. Therefore, we have large quantities of uh, water on our planet in the form of the oceans. Most of the water is in the ocean, the salty water, 97%. Uh, and that's largely because, because, of, because uh, of these, you know, combination, rare combination of these uh, these uh, uh, phenomena. Um, how do we go back? Okay, uh, where is the? Where does that oxygen come from? Twenty-one percent. That free oxygen. It says, Shua pointed out, it comes from the from the uh, uh, splitting of water by the uh, phytoplankton uh, in the ocean and other plants on our uh, uh, on on land. Uh, so the chlorophyll is the source. Of so solar energy is utilized. Uh, it's uh, absorbed by the by the plants. Uh, the chlorophyll uh, allows them to do that, and that water is then uh, then split into. Uh, uh, and, and gives oxygen. So oxygen is the is the byproduct of photosynthesis, as she pointed out. And here is a history of uh, oxygen changes uh, in our atmosphere over the past 3.8 billion years. Very similar to the figure that she presented. And you will notice that uh, there was not much oxygen in our planet before about uh, 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 you know about 2.7. 2.6, uh, 2.7 billion years, 2.4 billion years ago. There wasn't much of oxygen on our planet. The planet, as she pointed out, was uh, as anoxic as uh, uh, the planet on the, the atmosphere of, uh, of uh, Mars. Uh, it was uh, somewhere here that the cyanobacteria first evolved 3.4 billion years ago. But they were anoxygenic, which means that they were utilizing uh, hydrogen from uh, compounds such as hydrogen sulfide to form organic compounds and there was no oxygen being produced at that time. So that is why that, uh, uh, that photosynthesis is called an oxygenic photosynthesis. The oxygenic uh, cyanobacteria evolved about 2.7 billion years ago, somewhere here, that uh, blue arrow. Uh, but the oxygen concentration in the atmosphere did not rise. By the way, these are two uh, estimates, the range of estimates uh, are given by these two uh, curves. Uh, so the oxygen only began to accumulate in the atmosphere sometime here at this point, okay? Uh, and uh, there was a very slow increase. In fact, it remained constant for a very long time. Uh, and people are perplexed why it happened, why it take, took so long for oxygen to accumulate in the atmosphere uh, when there were organisms uh, already, that had already evolved in the ocean that were producing oxygen. Uh, and the simple answer is that uh, that oxygen which was being produced 
by mostly by phytoplankton was being consumed for oxidizing the reduced ox reduced chemical compounds uh, such as iron for example so there was this great oxidation event that is started sometimes here uh, led to massive precipitation of uh, iron uh, banded iron formation uh, that ha happened at about this time the great oxidation event that uh, start that occurred uh, at about 2.5 billion years ago uh, and uh, until all those reduced uh, compounds were oxidized the oxygen concentration in the atmosphere did not rise and that happened at about 0.85 billion years ago uh, that uh, the oxygen concentration in the atmosphere started to rise very rapidly and it was sometimes around 541 billion, uh, million years ago that there was a major change in the composition in the ecology of the uh, in the biodiversity, there was a, uh, you know, a, an explosion of, uh, of organisms, multicellular organisms that occurred about 541 uh, million years ago. So the, uh, the oxygen concentration has been changing, uh, in the uh, oxygen con content of the atmosphere has been changing, uh, determined by, largely by the, uh, the production by photosynthetic, uh, photosynthetic organisms and its consum consumption for respiration and also for oxidizing the chemical oxidation of the reduced species. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were fluctuations, there were times about 300 million years ago when the oxygen concentrations in the atmosphere could have risen as much as uh, to as much as uh, 35 percent. So, uh, uh, okay, our uh, genus, the Homo, homo uh, uh, em emerged only about uh, less than 3.3 million years ago. It's a very short time, okay? So this burden that we have on this planet uh, is very recent. It's in the, only in the last uh, 3 million years ago that we emerged, we came on this scene. But we have created enough disturbance in just uh, in the last, uh, especially in the last 150 years, uh, the CO2 concentrations have been rising, the temperature has been rising, as various people have said uh, this morning. Okay, so what happens, uh, uh, how is it related to oxygen distribution in the ocean? Now, as I said, the oxygen co is produced in the ocean by photosynthetic organisms, and in the ocean only the top layer is uh, illuminated, the euphotic zone. So, which means that the oxygen production can only occur in the oceanic surface, okay? Deeper down, below the euphotic zone, there is net consumption of oxygen. There is no, no production, in fact. And that organic matter which is supplied from the surface undergoes degradation, utilizing oxygen. So, the deep water should become anoxic at some point, okay? And should remain anoxic. And uh, believe me, about 150 uh, years ago, when we, when the Challenger expedition was launched, people didn't have any idea of the oxygen distribution in the ocean. The first measurement of oxygen uh, in the deep ocean were made, deep sea water were made only in 1860, it, uh, 1869, I think it was. Uh, and they were very surprised to find oxygen in the deep ocean. Uh, and at that time, they didn't have much idea, but of course we know now as Professor Singh described in detail, the oceanic circulation is the one that ventilates the, the formation of waters at high latitude is what ventilates the deep ocean, also supplying the oxygen from the surface layer to the deeper part of the ocean, such that we have high concentrations at the surface, high oxygen concentrations at the surface, we have high concentrations at the, in the deep, deep waters, uh, but at intermediate depths, we get relatively lower concentrations, and these and this layer is called the oxygen minimum. Uh, the oxygen concentrations within this minimum vary from place to place, uh, and uh, but uh, they are the lowest in areas such as the northern uh, Indian Ocean uh, and in the eastern Pacific, also to some extent in the eastern uh, Atlantic Ocean, and these are areas where the oxygen oxygen demand. Uh, exceeds the supply or the, the balance is in the favor of uh, consumption and therefore we get almost complete depletion of oxygen. Uh, here is the oxygen map. 
the, the map showing oxygen distribution at 300 meters, which is very close to the oxygen minimum. And you can see the highest concentrations occurring at, uh, at the poles and the lowest concentrations, which are shown in magenta color. By the way, this is the color code here. Uh, they occur in, along the eastern boundaries of the ocean normally, uh, both in the Pacific and also to some extent in the Atlantic Ocean. But in the Indian Ocean, we get the lowest concentrations up in the north for reasons that were mentioned by Professor Singh this morning. Uh, so why are these uh, zones important? They're important both for, for the ecological as well as uh, biogeochemical bio points of view. I'm mostly interested in biogeochemistry because what happens when, when you have such low oxygen concentrations, when the system is uh, completely anoxic, then the bacteria switch over to other forms of uh, other compounds, or other uh, chemical species uh, which are oxidized, such as nitrate, um, iron, manganese in the oxidized form, uh, sulfate, that sulfate molecules contain oxygen. Uh, so therefore, they switch over to uh, those uh, chemical species for the degradation of organic matter. Uh, and in those systems, nitrogen cycling becomes very important for reasons that I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Uh, producing, reducing nitrate to, uh, to ni molecular nitrogen and nitrous oxide uh, uh, in these systems. And therefore, they... Uh, the, in these, these regions are important for the maintenance of global nitrogen budget. Uh, and nitrogen, of course, is one of the most important, uh, uh, important uh, micronutrient. micronutrient. Uh, now what's happening is that the oceans, these, these are, uh, this is the natural oxygen consumption. But what's happening, natural oxygen consumption determined by the, the the uh, balance between the supply and uh, demand. Uh, but what's happening now is that the oxygen concentrations in the oceans are falling almost everywhere. A process called ocean deoxygenation, which is anthropogenic. So we have both the, uh, the natural component of deoxygenation as well as the anthropogenic component. And it's the anthropogenic component that I'm going to talk about in the rest of my talk. Um, what happens is that uh, the uh, the, uh, what happens in, in open ocean is different from what happens in coastal areas. In the open ocean, the oxygenation that occurs in the open ocean, including the oxygen minimum zones, is largely caused by, the, by global warming. And as has been mentioned previously, the surface temperature in the ocean is rising. Uh, the oceanic surface layer is getting warmer, as Professor Singh pointed out, is largely because because of uh, the uh, fact that about 93% of the extra heat which is retained by our planet due to global warming is going into the ocean. 93% is going into the ocean. It's only 7% that is actually accumulating in the atmosphere, uh, causing this increase in the, in the surface, in the uh, atmospheric temperature, which have risen by, by about one degree Celsius uh, in the last few decades. Uh, uh, and so we have the largest, uh, the, the ocean is the largest sink of that extra uh, heat. Uh, and had it not been for the ocean, if the oceans were not to absorb this heat, uh, water, by the way, has a very high specific heat, the atmospheric temperature have, would have risen by about 38 degrees Celsius. Uh, so this is important. Uh, so what's happening is that the surface layer is becoming warmer, uh, as Professor Singh pointed out. Uh, and this has important implications for the oxygen uh, distribution in the ocean because, first of all, uh, warmer water would retain lesser oxygen. So the oxygen solubility is dependent on temperature. As the temperature increases, uh, the water becomes, uh, the, the solubility of, the, of uh, oxygen decreases. Uh, there's also a slowdown of thermal line circulation, which has been pointed out earlier. Uh, and also a stronger vertical stratification, which reduces the exchange, uh, the, the diffusive exchange between the oceanic surface uh, and the deeper waters. And uh, it appears that this, this process is largely responsible for the... Yeah. 
is largely responsible for the deoxygenation that occurs in the in the open ocean. The warming is the most important thing. And it's estimated, it's actually coming from a model that an increase in, in, in uh, surface temperature by about one degree Celsius in, would lead to uh, a 10% increase in the volume of the hypoxic waters, uh, whereas the volume of uh, waters which are, uh, uh, which are anoxic or less than uh, uh, five, uh, less than five uh, uh, micromolar will increase by a factor of three. So it's, uh, it's a very important contributor to the anthropogenic uh, uh, deoxygenation. Uh, okay, so where is the evidence that it's actually happening? The oceans have been losing oxygen, There's, there are time series records uh, from this paper by Stroma et al. and has been followed up by, by many other papers, which show not only an, a decrease in you know, overall oxygen inventory of the ocean by as much as 2% or more, uh, but these oxygen minimum zones are also expanding and in getting intensified. So here is an example from the Eastern Tropical Pacific where the, this is the oxygen minimum zone shown in blue. Uh, it's becoming thicker as well as uh, more intense. Uh, there are also models that show the same effect. And here are different models uh, from this paper by Bob. Uh, and uh, they show a decrease in oxygen concentration between 200 and 600 meters by as much as four millimole per uh, meter cube. Okay, the actual, you have uh, value which is even higher. But most of the models converge on this. About, about uh, by, by the end of uh, this century, the oxygen concentration within that depth range would decrease by an average of about four, four micromolar. Uh, whereas the volume of water with oxygen concentration of less than five micromoles per liter will increase by a, may increase by a factor of about uh, by about thirty percent by a, about. Uh, uh, by the end of this century. So these are actually very important uh, 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 important uh, uh, results uh, that show that uh, the uh, warming is, has, is having a strong impact on oxygen distribution in the ocean. Uh, now what happens in the coastal areas is different. In areas like if you're working in, I'm sorry, If you're working in a region like the, the uh, Cochin backwaters, uh, you get seasonal anoxia, in, uh, hypoxia or anoxia in this region, and that's for a different reason. It's because of the eutrophication, because of the amount of nutrients which are coming from the anthropogenic sources, which lead to an increase in the productivity. So what happens in coastal waters is, the, is different in terms of the causative mechanism from what happens in the open ocean, in that the, in the coastal waters, eutrophication or nutrient or enrichment is the main factor for the oxygen decrease because once those bloom, blooms die off, they consume oxygen. Uh, and there are many areas in the world where it, this is happening. Uh, this, is, this is the record of the number of uh, uh, hypoxic sites being, uh, being reported, and this is a very old paper reporting up to 2006. Uh, the number has actually gone up uh, today. Uh, there are hundreds of sites, including Cochin backwaters, where you get seasonal anoxia. Uh, and that is related to this uh, eutrophication or uh, nutrient or enrichment. So the uh, processes that result in uh, deoxygenation, coastal waters are different, uh, generally different from what we have uh, in the open ocean. Uh, now, what are the effects of uh, oxygen deficiency? They are both biological effects, as I said, as well as biogeochemical effects. I'm, good, I'm going to go through them very quickly. Uh, the uh, biological effects are both lethal and sublethal. The sublethal effects include these, loss of habitat, changes in food web, reduced growth and respiration, physiological stress, migration. Uh, they become more vulnerable to predation, uh, disruption of life cycles. Uh, and when the conditions become more uh, 
uh, intense, uh, you can get uh, uh, an anoxia, complete anoxia, and then um, Okay, so, uh, and uh, they, it causes lethality. I mean, it causes uh, mortality of uh, organisms. Uh, there are many examples from various parts of the world. This is from Oregon, of uh, the northwest coast of uh, 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 America, and this happened in 2001. And this is from Karanjalam Beach, uh, and this was provided by, uh, this picture was provided to me by uh, Damodar Shinai. This happened in August of 2021, mass mortality of fish in Karanjalam Beach. And that is all related to, to anoxia the anoxic waters coming uh, shore, you know, the filling and uh, driving this mortality. Now, different organisms have different uh, tolerance for uh, anoxia, and that is shown in this figure. There are different groups of organi organisms, crustaceans, fishes, bivalves, and gastropods. They have different uh, tolerance, but within the same group, the tol by the way, the crustaceans are most tolerant uh, uh, to hypoxia. This red line actually indicates to oxygen concentration of about two milligram per per, uh, uh, per per liter, which is widely used as hypoxic threshold. Uh, but you will see that uh, the crustaceans are more tolerant. The uh, the gastropods are least tolerant. But within the same group, you get a lot of variability. So that tolerance varies from. Uh, one group to another. Uh, uh, but in fact, there are certain organisms which actually like low oxygen waters, and they, these organisms range in size. There are many organisms uh, which are micro microscopic microbes, uh, which actually prefer uh, anoxic uh, waters, but I'm not going to go into them. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a copepod. Uh, this is the one which lives in the Indian Ocean. This dives right into the core of the oxygen minimum zone in the Arabian Sea. Then we have this myctophid, uh, myctophid, the lantern fish, which many of, his, uh, many of uh, you know, actually uh, prefers low oxygen waters. It actually uh, comes up during the day, goes down. So it has a diurnal migration into the heart of the oxygen minimum layer. Uh, it has a, there's a very large biomass of myctophids in the Arabian Sea. About uh, as much as 100 million tons of myctophids uh, live in the Arabian Sea alone, uh, and they spend most of their time within the oxygen minimum zone. Uh, as you can see from this uh, ADCB plot, uh, it's a diurnal cycle. They go down uh, during the uh, at, uh, in the morning, come up at night, uh, and these are for two different months. It's uh, the U.S. Jacobs data. Uh, so there are these organisms. Uh, the myctophytes, which like low oxygen waters, and then finally we have this uh, uh, the Humboldt uh, squid, Dosidicus, uh, Dosidicus, uh, and uh, this actually prefers it's a huge organism, but prefers low oxygen waters. Uh, the habitat is uh, habitat is expanding. It's expanding because the oxygen concentrations in the ocean are decreasing and therefore, uh, it, because it prefers low oxygen waters, uh, its habitat uh, has increased considerably in size from 1984 to 2001. So there are certain organisms that actually prefer low oxygen water. These are not necessarily anaerobic organisms. They don't have anaerobic metabolism, uh, but it's just that they, they prefer this habitat. I'll briefly talk about the, the uh, biogeochemical implications of uh, or consequences of hypoxia. Uh, and as I said, there are a number of uh, species that can be utilized by the, by the, organ by the heterotrophs to decompose organic matter. Uh, the most common one is oxygen. This is also the species that yields the maximum energy. This is the energy yield uh, in units of kilo kilojoule per molecule of glucose, so which means that if you were to use one mole uh, glico glucose and oxidize it uh, with oxygen, you'd get this much of energy in kil kilojoule per uh, mole, okay? So uh, that is with the, with the oxygen. When you have nitrogen oxides like nitrate or nitrite, you get like uh, 3130, 3005, and this you will notice is not very different 
from the energy uh, from uh, oxy oxic decay. So these are very close to each other, and yet they do not occur together. I mean, that's a very surprising thing. When you use uh, Fe3, uh, the organism get only 1410, uh, 1410. Uh, when they use sulfate, they get only a 380 kilojoule uh, per mole of glucose. So which means that the anoxic respiration using sulfate is energetically much less uh, f favored or uh, uh, efficient than the one using oxygen. Okay, so these, uh, it's just not the energy which is important, it's also the concentration and here's the rel relative abundance of these species in water. Uh, uh, of course, oxygen, if uh, normalized to oxygen, so if you get uh, oxygen concentration is one unit, uh, uh, sulfate will be uh, more, more than 250, uh, oxygen is, uh, uh, sorry, nitrate is about 0.2, uh, and iron and manganese are much less abundant. All the other uh, oxidants are, uh, or electron acceptors are not very abundant. So which means that uh, when oxygen is all gone, is basically bet between uh, sulfate and nitrate. Uh, uh, and uh, sulfate, even though sulfate is present in very high quantities, uh, in very high concentrations, because it doesn't, that respiration doesn't deal a lot of energy, this is the preferred pathway. And what happens in the ocean is that nitrate is seldom completely removed. So therefore, very, uh, we, do not really see very uh, often a situation where sulfate becomes the dominant uh, electron acceptor in, uh, in uh, respiration. Uh, it's very often denitrification in all those systems that I spoke about, the Eastern Pacific, the, the Arabian Sea, uh, denitrification is more important. So the oxygen minimum zones, so-called oxygen minimum zones, or anoxic oxygen minimum zones, are uh, dominated by this process where the organic matter undergoes decay using nitrate, producing uh, nit uh, uh, molecular nitrogen, also to some extent nitrous oxide, and this is called denitrification. It's a very important process that uh, regulates the, the nitrogen content of the atmosphere. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to t tell you uh, with whether, now this is the Arabian Sea. Most people think that the entire Arabian Sea is, uh, is uh, denitrifying. It's actually not the case. It's only a certain region of the, well-defined region of the Arabian Sea, which is uh, characterized by the accumulation of nitrite, which is uh, shown here. This is the zone of denitrification, where denitrification takes place, and this is the zone where the oxygen concentrations fall back to actually zero level. So this is the zone of denitrification. And I have reason to believe that this zone has not changed much in the last few decades. Okay, but so I'm going to talk about changes in, in the oxygen concentration or deoxygenation in the Indian Ocean due to anthropogenic uh, uh, causes over the last few decades. And I'm going to present three sets of data in the case of the Arabian Sea. The first one is from this paper. Uh, which compares the, is from the Western Arabian Sea. This region, which is outside the denitrification zone where the oxygen profiles on decadal scale are, average profiles are compared. Uh, and you will see that the, the, the concentrations today are much lower than those were, than the concentrations in the, uh, in the uh, 1960s. Okay, so the con these concentrations have decreased by as much as about uh, two milliliter per liter, or about uh, 90 micromoles. So th this, the strongest evidence that we have of uh, deoxygenation in the in northern Indian Ocean actually comes from this data set, which was published in this study here. Uh, we also have uh, another set of data coming from the Gulf of Oman, and that is uh, shown here. Uh, in this uh, in this uh, panel, uh, here we have data, the recent data which was collected using the uh, using the modern uh, you know um, techniques using um, gliders, uh, and these are the the historical data in the 1960s, uh, pre pre 1990, and you will see that the the concentrations today. By the way, the scale is not linear. Uh, 
so the concentrations today are slightly lower, lower significantly, but not by not much than during the uh, 1960s, you know, pre-1990 or so. Uh, so here is uh, the, second data, the second set of data, and the third set of data are our own data that comes from, uh, from, uh, from the periphery of the oxygen minimum zone, uh, or the, the denitrification zone this side. Uh, because the oxygen concentrations are already very low here, we haven't used the oxygen concentrations. Uh, we have a time series here of, uh, of uh, salinity and, and uh, nitrite, because nitrite is a proxy of uh, the intensity of the oxygen minimum zone. Uh, and this is from one fixed site from 1977 to 1994, I think. Uh, when was it? Uh, it's uh, it's 2000. Uh, okay, uh, 2002, uh, 2000, we do not see, we, we see a lot of uh, seasonal variability, we see a lot of interval variability, but we do not see a, lo a consistent decreasing trend in, uh, in uh, nitrite at the periphery of this oxygen minimum zone. We also have data from the core of the oxygen minimum zone, which I'm not going to talk about. I am not left with my time, so therefore I'll be only briefly talking about what the data that we have from the Bay of Bengal. Uh, we have a station here from which I have used the data uh, from the 1960s, compared them with what was uh, with the data set that came from 19, 2007, I think. Uh, and 2007 data are shown in red. The older data, IIU data are shown in black. Uh, and there seems to be a decrease, slight decrease, slight significant decrease in oxygen concentration in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, but the oxygen concentrations in the Bay of Bengal are already very low. Uh, so we believe that uh, the oxygen concentra concentrations in the Bay of Bengal have decreased slightly, uh, significantly, but by not much, not the kind of uh, change that we see in the Eastern Pacific Ocean, for example. Uh, we also oh, have data from, uh, okay, from these marginal seas, uh, and the the Indian Ocean has two marginal seas, the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea, as Professor Singh pointed out, and these are connected to the Indian Ocean through silts. The Red Sea is connected to the Indian Ocean through this sill at the Babel Mandeb. Uh, there is no sill at the Hormuz Strait, uh, but that is a much shallower uh, marginal sea than the Red Sea. Red Sea is pretty deep. It develops, it has its own dynamics, it has its own oxygen minimum. Uh, and uh, here are the data uh, uh, from a cruise in 1983 that shows the oxygen distribution here in the, in the uh, Red Sea. If you compare that data with the modern data, and that these were taken from, from uh, Argo floats, uh, by geochemical Argo floats, you will see that the the, these modern data are significantly and uh, generally lower than the data in the 1983. So I believe that uh, the, there is deoxygenation going on in the Red Sea. Uh, and uh, the other region, the other marginal sea is the, is the Persian Gulf. It's not a silt basin. Uh, this is what used to be the oxygen distribution in the basin. Uh, in the, in the, this used to be the oxygen distribution in the basin uh, in the 1977 uh, when a cruise was conducted by Peter Brewer uh, uh, in that region. Uh, now the oxygen concentrations have declined uh, significantly and these are data from a uh, paper by Saleh uh, that came out only a couple of years ago. Uh, and that shows uh, much lower oxygen concentrations in the, in the deeper part of the Persian Gulf. So the Persian Gulf is becoming hypoxic, and this is a zone of hypoxia where the oxygen concentration is less than 50 micromolar. And this uh, occupies an area of about 50,000 uh, square kilometers. Okay, so uh, to summarize uh, what we have, what we know about this region, is that except for uh, the Western Arabian Sea, uh, the ongoing deoxygenation trends in the Northern Indian Ocean are relatively weak compared to what we see in the Pacific Ocean, for example. 
the rate of oxygen decline is not as much. Uh, the Arabian Sea is, oxygen minimum zone is uniquely ventilated by regionally formed waters uh, that uh, Professor Singh was speaking about, the Persian Gulf water and the Red Sea water. This is the only oxygen minimum zone which is advected by waters uh, formed in the marginal seas. Uh, so that uh, human activities are altering characteristics of these waters within these marginal seas. The temperature is rising. Uh, they have the, because of the ocean warming, the salinity is increasing, the density is decreasing, probably decreasing, the nutrient loading is increasing, total organic carbon uh, content is increasing, uh, and the oxygen concentration is decreasing. Uh, the increases in salinity in these marginal seas uh, would make these outflows denser. Uh, the increase in salinity would make them denser, but uh, the temperature is going to overwhelm that effect of increase in salinity because, of, because uh, the warmer temperature will may, would make them uh, less dense and therefore th as they come out, they would reach shallower depths the, and therefore the oxygen minimum is going to intensify. Uh, the anthropogenic nutrient loading are making the Gulf and probably also the Red Sea from which we do not have a lot of data more productive causing an increase in the total organic carbon content. A respiration of additional organic matter is resulting in expanding hypoxia in the Gulf. And for this, we have very clear evidence. Uh, we still do not know what's happening in the Red Sea, but the preliminary data that I presented here indicates that the Red Sea is also getting deoxygenated. Uh, what I'm pr pretty certain about, and this is shown by models, uh, is that lower density of the Gulf outflow and the decrease in this preformed oxygen and TOC concentration, increase in preformed, pre decrease in preformed oxygen and increase in TOC concentration. There should be increase in TOC concentration are most likely to result in expansion and intensification of the Arabian Sea oxygen minimum zone. So that is what is going to happen. Uh, I'm sure if it's not happening today, it has not already happened today and we do not know. I mean, we do, we do not have, unfortunately, uh, a lot of data uh, from recent years, uh, at least published, it's not published. Uh, and therefore, I would just stress very, he very heavily, uh, strongly, that we must continue with the time series uh, observations in this region, uh, which will be very precious in, in determining the fate of, uh, you know, uh, these the ecosystems in this region because uh, this is these these regions are already very close to being anoxic if they are not anoxic and what is going to happen in an area like the Bay of Bengal is going to determine the uh, the biogeochemical uh, balance of you know elements like nitrogen on our planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The facts that you presented about the um, the expansion and uh, intensification of oxygen deficient zones are really indeed scary. Uh, we need to be more vigilant in controlling the, uh, you know, the human activities that causes deoxygenation with this. So I think we can accommodate uh, one of two short questions. Yeah. In what form in, it is stored? In oxidation of organic matter. So there's so more oxygen matter, more organic matter. See, it's the balance between the supply, oxygen supply, and oxygen consumption. So if uh, you, you could reduce the advective term, for example, or diffusive term, the supply term, uh, and uh, keep the, the uh, you know, consumption at the same, you will have the same effect as keeping the, the uh, supply constant and increasing the uh, so bo both probably both are happening so there is slowdown of uh, oceanic circulation so supplies is getting less uh, and also because of the increase in productivity uh, in particular at least in areas like the uh, the the Bay of Bengal you would see an increase in the oxygen consumption rate. The oxygen supply you mean is from the atmosphere to the ocean? Or uh, by the deep circulation and through vertical mixing, diffusion. Okay, but it is from the atmosphere uh, to the water? 
Uh, basically, basically, it comes that oxygen comes from the atmosphere, but half of the oxygen in the atmosphere is actually produced in the ocean, That's in the oceanic That's surface. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the the oh, the fifty percent of what what we are inhaling today is actually uh, produced by the phytoplankton. It's coming from the sea. What we are inhaling today, fifty percent, half of it. So. So what comes to the atmosphere is actually basically from the ocean. Oceanic surface layer is what we are talking about. Thank you, sir. I think Thank this discussion should be continued. I'll go to the next question. Uh, Vajji, thanks. Uh, it's a good presentation. Uh, you said that the um, uh, deoxygenation in parts is driven by the uh, reduced uh, reach of the outflows from the marginal seas, which actually will oxygenate otherwise. So warming will may, uh, restrict the penetration of that, that's one part. It's the density, I said. Density, yeah. So because if you, because, you yeah. have two contradictory effects. Yeah. One is the increase in salinity. At least, you know, the, in the, it's happening in the Gulf. The yeah. Gulf is becoming more saline. saline yeah. So that would made the, make the, the, the Persian Gulf water lighter. Yeah. Uh, sorry, heavier, heavier. But that effect what? is more than compensated by an increase in, in the temperature. Yeah. So Gulf is also warming, warming uh, faster than the rest of the Indian Ocean. Uh, so th that water which comes out will, will then, uh, uh, on balance, have a lower density and it will come uh, closer to the, to the core of the oxygen minimum layer. Yeah. So it's formed at 300, let's say, two, between 250 and 350 meters. It will, come, it will come at shallower depths at 200 meters and that is is uh, shown to or uh, projected to uh, to intensify the the oxygen minimum zone, yeah. but there are other complicating yeah. things. My, my question was, uh, was Vaji, So this is one aspect, and also the when you have a global warming, the uh, dissolution of uh, gas into the water itself will change, uh, reduce. So what is the relative uh, importance of these two? Is, is there, do we oh, have any okay. idea if about you that? Are to, that's a global thing. What is happening in, uh, in a decrease in oxygen concentration? I showed you that if there's a 1% one, 1 decrease in oxygen solubility, uh, it would result in 10% increase in hypoxic volume of the hypoxic water, whereas the water, anoxic water would triple in volume. Okay, so that is happening on the global scale and most of the oxygen loss that we have and we have lost as much as more than 2% of the oxygen inventory already is because of that physical effect, because of the warming effect. Okay, uh, so in an area like the Arabian Sea, both will be important, but this density change, in my opinion, is going to be more important than, there's a person by name Lashkar, he does a lot of research, he is based in Abu Dhabi, and he is doing a lot of work doing, coming up with models that predict the fate of the Arabian Sea oxygen minimum zone. So that is what his model says that, you know. But there they are also complicating factors that I don't want to go into. Thank you, sir. We can have two Just questions. one question. Naki sahab, here, no. here, here, here. <laughs> so uh, e this uh, loss of oxygen we are talking about, uh, just now we discuss about uh, because of warming. When you are warming, you are stratifying. So productivity, is we, are, we are going down. So can it be compensated with that uh, low productivity? Yeah, it, it can be compensated, but uh, so you are reducing both the supply as well as the oxygen demand. Uh, it can be so, but stratification will also reduce the diffusive oxygen supply. It's just not the circulation. So they are both advective and diffusive terms. Okay, so uh, diffusion, if uh, the water column gets uh, strongly stratified because of warming, uh, that would reduce the oxygen, diffusive oxygen supply, but as you said, it could also lead to a decrease in, uh, in uh, oxygen consumption rate. Uh, so, so you don't know, I mean, uh, honestly, I, uh, I cannot determine the relative importance of this, but it depends to what extent is the, is, is, are these two terms altered? And then just one question more. In the beginning, you were discussing about uh, uh, oxygen, oxygenation of ocean, means it started at 2.7, something like that, cyanobacteria photosynthesis. What would have happened? Why it suddenly ha happened at 2.7? What changed to make it reducing to, means oxic uh, photosynthesis? 
means anything chemistry change i think it was just uh, no i don't think there was any chemical changes uh, you know there is a lot of speculation in the literature when you go back to you know like 2.7 billion years or what happened between 3.4 billion years when the an oxygenic uh, cyanobacteria developed to 2.4 billion years 2.7 billion years when the uh, the oxygenic photosynthetic bacteria this was evolution it was evolution what drove it uh, i am not uh, knowledgeable enough to to comment on this but uh, as far as i think there was no chemical changes why did the uh, the an oxygenic photosynthesizers uh, develop in 3.4 3.4 billion years uh, bp itself is a question I mean, well, this was a, an evolution that occurred uh, i can only talk about the bo boring billion for example the time period over which there was not a much of increase and that was because of oxidation of uh, reduced chemical species by oxygen including the gases that were coming from the interior of the earth, from the earth's mantle hydrogen supply from the ocean so there are people who say that the that supply from the deep uh, mantle was Im important for regulating the atmospheric oxygen concentration so they were also uh, it it was probably also related to not the biological evolution but the chemical changes were probably also related to tectonics for example and what happened in the interior of the earth, how it how the that magma moved around and how that geochemistry changed on that time scale of billions of years i am not knowledgeable enough i am sorry okay thank you very much for a fascinating talk uh, as the uh, oxygen minimum zone expands in the vertical dimension is it possible that some of the remineralization might be pushed further down the water column uh, the remineralization, uh, you know, it all depends upon uh, how, how, oh, oh, it, you know, the, this is going to expand, right? Mm. Uh, so there will be intense, more intense mineralization both above and below. Okay, so the water column itself will, will probably have higher mineralization at all depths, okay? And that is resulting in the uh, expansion of the OMZ. Uh, so, but there is an overall decrease in oxygen concentration. It's just that the rate of mineralization in the deep ocean is low for uh, because the temperatures are low and because the uh, there is not of organic matter, not a lot of organic matter reaching the the very deep sea. So, over hundreds of or thousands of years of time scale, when the uh, over which these waters are renewed. Uh, the rate of consumption is, is very low. But if the rate of consumption or the oxygen supply increases, it's possible that, uh, that uh, the, there will be a higher, you know, respiration in deeper water as well. If that is what you are asking. Thank but you. But I see a, a, a large scale increase or, the, or, or throughout the water column. Could it potentially change the biological pump? Oh, the biological pump is, uh, you know, is uh, uh, in terms of the efficiency of the pump, yeah, it may. Because it depends upon the rate of oxic versus anoxic decay. Uh, and, uh, you know, there is a lot of discrepancy in the literature on whether or not anoxic degradation is, uh, is uh, slower than the oxic decay. Uh, in terms of uh, so we have evidence to show that at the boundaries of the oxic and anoxic zone, uh, the respiration rates are low. But within the uh, anoxic zone, they are not very low because you need to cross that threshold. Once you cross the threshold, the microorganisms are able to utilize the other uh, forms of, uh, of uh, uh, electron acceptors, other species. So it could change, it could change the, uh, the biological pump in that sense, not in terms of its uh, structure, but at least in terms of the fluxes, uh, it will definitely have an effect. Thank you, sir. I think the discussion will continue uh, later during the lunch or even uh, during the evening function. Uh, thank you, sir. As a token of our gratitude, we request Dr. Dinesh Kumar PK uh, to accept, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to give a memento to Dr.
Thank you, sir. Actually, we have two more presentations in the pre uh, before lunch session, but I think it may not be possible. So we will uh, push on presentation to the next. And now uh, we will come. We will continue with the presentation from next uh, speaker. And it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Prasanna Kumar. He is a highly accomplished scientist who has contributed significantly field to the field of uh, uh, oceanography during his exceptional career. Dr. Prasanna Kumar started his career as a trainee scientist in CSIRNAO in 1982 and completed his tenure at the institute in 2017 as acting scientist in charge. He also served as the CSIR emeritus scientist at CSIRNAO, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru chair professor at University of Hyderabad and adjunct professor at Mujibur Rahman Maritime University at Bangladesh. Uh, his research has been published through more than 83 research articles and several project reports in recognition of his outstanding contributions to the field of oceanography. Dr. Prasanna Kumar has, has uh, uh, received awards and honors including the prestigious National Geoscience Award from the Government of India. Dr. Prasanna Kumar's proficiency in oceanography and his views on the complex issues of climate change make him a, a valuable speaker to our workshops today. So let us warmly welcome Dr. Prasanna Kumar to the stage. Thank you, Anas, for a kind introduction. At the outset, uh, let me thank uh, Dr. Dinesh Kumar for uh, giving me this opportunity to come here and meet all of my seniors and colleagues and uh, also to make a presentation of my research. Uh, let me also tell that the, what I'm going to present today is uh, forms a part of several studies uh, which was conducted by many of my colleagues and uh, students. Uh, especially I would like to uh, indicate two of them, uh, Dr. Jayu Narvekar and uh, Rebecca, uh, who whose uh, results I'm going to largely uh, quote in this uh, presentation. Uh, basically, there are three papers that I heavily relied upon, uh, which I was a part of uh, the research. And then based from there, we build upon uh, adding new data, data sets to this to consolidate the information that has been shown through these papers. Right. Now, we had been hearing about global warming and climate change since morning, and the warming of the Arabian Sea uh, is at the center. And uh, when we talk about the, the climate change and how it's going to impact the coastal ecosystem, uh, it is important to understand that this coastal region of the Arabian Sea so this is the eastern boundary of the ocean. Now, eastern boundaries are very, very special uh, if you look at the global ocean. And uh, they are the sites of huge upwelling systems. Dr. Nakhvi talked about the OMZ, uh, which results out of a large organic carbon production. So this eastern, so the, the Eastern Arabian Sea is a eastern boundary uh, system, but this eastern boundary of the Arabian Sea has a very distinct characteristics which need to be underst understood before we try to uh, look at what are the changes that the climate change or the warming ocean can in in induce into this. Now, this picture here shows the how the basin average sea surface temperature uh, of the Arabian Sea is I mean, varying from 1960 right up to 210 uh, through this paper. And what you see here is the black line which shows the sea surface temperature average over the basin. And you have this blue line here which is the sunspot sunspot numbers and sunspot numbers are indirectly the indication or indicator of solar flux that is coming into the 
ocean at atmospheric system. And then you have a red line which indicates the atmospheric CO2 concentration. The broken line that you see here is the, of course, the trend line. I'll come to that in a minute. So what we understand from this diagram is that uh, you have the sea surface temperature which shows a kind of a decadal cycle which is uh, yeah, co-varying with sunspot numbers. Now solar flux is known to be having a decadal uh, cycle. So it appears that this solar flux is probably driving this decadal cycle that we see in the uh, sea surface temperature. Now, if you look at closely in this diagram, what we notice is that somewhere around the mid-1990s, mid that is 1995, uh, the decadal cycle that you have seen in the sea surface temperature, which was shown here, which of course did have a lag, but after mid-90s, though the solar cycle continued, but the sea surface temperature did not follow the same pattern of cyclicity. So it appears that after uh, mid-90s, it is not being driven by the solar flux, but something else must be modulating it. And one of the drivers that uh, could do that is the increased CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So this, through this paper, it has been shown that the Arabian Sea has undergone a kind of a shift or change in terms of its behavior in SST. So prior to mid-90s, the sea surface temperature could have a decadal cycle, but after that, somehow the decadal cycle was broken. Now that data set has been extended and uh, so this is right up to 2020. So the inference what we get it from here largely remains the same. So we have the natural decadal cycle up from 1960 to 1995. But beyond that, that natural decadal cycle has been broken. You could see that. And it appears that it is riding over a linear warming trend. So the linear warming trend, we could see that from 1960 onwards, but after 1995, the trend line shows that this is the trend line. So after 95, it appears that that rate of warming has accelerated. So we have an accelerated uh, warming in the Arabian Sea. Now, there are several, uh, there are several uh, associated I mean, facts that comes out. For first thing is that, Okay, what, I mean, what is the reason for the Arabian Sea to behave this way? So if you look at the, the ocean processes in the Arabian Sea, you would know that Arabian Sea has a cooling mechanism. So Arabian Sea can cool two times a year. One during the monsoon time, that is June to September, through upwelling process, which was been talked about largely in the morning. And then during the winter time, that is November till Feb, you have another mechanism which cools the Arabian Sea, that is through the winter convection. So it would seem that the efficiency of the cooling of the Arabian Sea was able to counteract the increase in the CO2 uh, until mid-90s, but after mid-1990s, somehow uh, that, that process was not enough to take the excess heat that has been put into the ocean uh, um, through the CO2 warming, probably. Now, this, so what is the impact that it could have? So, no doubt the Arabian Sea is getting warmed up much faster now. Now, what, would it, what will it lead to? The potential uh, reaction to this could be the increased stratification, we heard about that, several speakers talking about that. I will show that uh, with the data set in, uh, in more detail. Now, if there is an increased stratification, 
the one scenario is that you could reduce the I mean, I mean carbon production. So there are some data set through which I can show that, that as well. And uh, deoxygenation, uh, Dr. Nakui talked about that. So that is uh, another um, an impact of the warming. The other uh, alarming thing is that the Arabian Sea has been seeing a large number of cyclones of late. And in 2006, there was a paper in which we could, uh, say, we said that uh, this mid-90 no, mid is a turning point. So after mid-90, the number of cyclones were increasing. This was in 2006. But at that time, this hypothesis was, was put forward, but there was a lot of criticism saying that, okay, your data set is very small, so how could you, I mean, this has to be uh, tested over a longer period of time. So I will show you now a more, much more uh, robust data set or the lengthy data set from which we see that there is a definite uh, trend in the increase in the number of cyclones. So that increased number of cyclone then would mean that your biological production can be altered. Cyclones are known to increase the biological production very largely, though it is over a shorter period of time. So what we are going to then see is a positive and negative impact of the global warming. Uh, on one case, the increased stratification, which can reduce the biological production. And on, in another case, where the increased number of cyclones can actually I mean, lead to a large amount of biological production through the equipment pumping of nutrients. Then, of course, the another uh, aspect is the increased amount of CO2 outgassing during the cyclone period. Now, how this will impact the eastern boundary of the Arabian Sea? The eastern boundary of the Arabian Sea basically experiences two uh, different uh, set of oceanic processes. Here is a cartoon uh, from taken from this paper, which shows the oceanographic processes that operates in this region. So if you look at the southern part of the eastern boundary of the Bay of Bengal, sorry, uh, Arabian Sea, what you see is that these regions become biologically very productive because of the upwelling, and the northern part becomes, again, uh, productive uh, because of the winter convection. Now, so we have two different processes which is separated over the time leading to the increase in the biological production in the um, even eastern part of the Arabian Sea. Now this is also is a region where you have a coastal current which alters semi-annually during the summer time. You have the high saline waters transiting through this region into the Bay of Bengal, and then you have a low saline waters from the Bay of Bengal transiting into the Arabian Sea. This also do have the wave propagation, such as coastally trapped Kelvin wave, and then the uh, planetary wave, like the Rossby wave uh, propagation. So what I'm going to do next is that to see these, these two systems separately and see with time what has um, I mean, uh, what do the data tell us about the alteration in the process? Okay, so this is the uh, first uh, process that I'm going to look at that. The southern part of the uh, Eastern Arabian Sea is known for upwelling. Now, this upwelling occurs, there are a lot of, lot of studies done by various researchers, and we um, and now have a very good understanding about, about how this upwelling system is driven. Now, uh, initially, uh, our understanding was that this upwelling is driven, is a wind-driven upwelling system, a very classical example of uh, Ekman dynamics. But subsequent research has proved that it is not only the uh, alongshore wind, which is important, it is also the Ekman pumping, the curl of the wind, which can actually drive the upward uh, equipment pumping, which can uh, augment the upwelling. Apart from that, we also have this coastally trapped Kelvin wave, which propagates from south to north. And so the upwelling initiates in the southern side, and with time, the upwelling front moves 
northward along with the uh, Kelvin wave. So these are the kind of understanding that we have about this upwelling system. And if you look at the vertical uh, structure uh, or vertically into the water column, it's very interesting. Uh, characteristic can be very easily uh, deciphered. I'm using a data set from the paper. And this data is taken in August 2017 all along the uh, coastal region. And these are the boxes that uh, I'm going to show you the data here. So th this is from the north. So south to north, and top panel is the temperature. So you can see the upwelling signatures where the red portion shows the warmer waters, and you can see the thickness of the, uh, that red portion is very small as it comes to the south. So indicating that the southern part, the upwelling is very, very active. You can see the dashed line, and then there is a uh, showing of that uh, I mean, isotherm indicative of the upwelling process. Basically, what it says is that the upwelling is uh, limited to the you know, southern part of it. And if you look at the salinity structure, you also see a, a thin lens of low saline waters. Now, this probably has not caught much attention because people, there's not much focus on to that. Uh, along with the upwelling season, we have a lot of fresh water uh, into this, uh, coming into this uh, region uh, through the river runoff and also the oceanic precipitation. And that could lead to very low saline waters into this. Now, when you have a low saline waters, it has a contracting impact onto the upwelling. The Ekman transport would like to would, uh, move the waters away from the coast and then the subsurface waters need to come up. But if you have those fresh water sitting up there, your stratification is very, very large. So this upwelling process can be I mean, impacted. So the efficiency of the wind to move the water will be uh, I mean, reduced because of the fresh water that is sitting on the top as a thin lens. And that stratification is very clearly seen in this, uh, uh, in this, in this panel, which shows the static stability. That is not, uh, static stability is an indicator or a proxy of the stratification of the water column. So this panel shows that the upwelling process can have an impact if there are fresh water. So if there's a modulation in fresh water, if the amount of fresh water that is coming in into the coastal regions are going to change, that has a uh, potential of uh, modulating it. Now, oops. okay, so this shows the north south variation of that uh, static stability and also the Ekman pumping. Uh, so, and mass transport, then the D24, which was shown here as a white line, the broken line. So, that shows the, I mean, how, how much uh, shallow the colder waters can come up. So, this basically what it conveys is that the upwelling is confined to the southern part. In this case, it was about 12 degrees north, and beyond that, what you see is the uh, change in the parameters. For example, if you look at the static stability, the static stability was the highest here, and uh, as you go towards the north, the static stability decreases. And if you look at the uh, 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 vertical uh, velocity, or yes, uh, that is a D24, which is the depth of this 24 degree isotherm, you would see that that is the shallowest, and in the northern part, it is uh, becoming deeper. So this basically shows the, the latitudinal structure of the upwelling uh, uh, during that particular time. But th there are interannual variability, but usually the 
pattern would remain the same. The northern extent of the upwelling, of course, will depend upon the uh, for drivers such as the wind, uh, wind strength or the uh, amount of fresh water that is coming in, uh, uh, all of that. Now, again, there has been effort uh, to relate this uh, I mean, chlorophyll and uh, that, is, that is the biomass that is being produced in the upwelling system to the fishery there. So here is the plot of the oil sardine landing with that of the static stability. What it shows was that the static stability and the oil sardine landing is inversely related, which would mean that whenever the, stat uh, the uh, stratification is the highest, the I mean, oil sardine biomass was low. Now, this inverse relation can be mechanistically explained uh, th through, uh, through this diagram, but I will come to that a little later. There were also studies earlier shown th that the chlorophyll concentration, uh, th change in chlorophyll concentration with time from 1998 to 2014 uh, by Roxy et al. Uh, there he compared the chlorophyll uh, trend along with the static stability. Again, the chlorophyll and static stability was again the, um, inversely related. When the static stability is very high, the chlorophyll was low. So mechanistically, one could put that in a for diagrammatic form which is shown here. So here is the role of freshwater in impacting the uh, upwelling through stratification. So you have the increased river runoff or increased oceanic precipitation, both driven by the good monsoon or the excess monsoon, which can lead to the increased stratification. And if the stratification of the upper ocean is increased, then that will modulate the upwelling. What it would mean that the, if the fresh water on the top will not allow the upwell water to come up to the surface, or it can uh, impact that. So increase the stratification, modulating the uh, upwelling. Now, if you have the uh, increased stratification because of the river runoff, the river runoff can then bring the nutrients and thereby it can increase the chlorophyll concentration. Okay, so on the other hand, uh, if the upwelling is modulated by the stratification, then that can decrease the chlorophyll concentration. So you have a two competing mechanism, or or uh, yeah, two competing mechanism for the freshwater driven stratification. So when you have an increased freshwater, one scenario is that you can increase the chlorophyll through the addition of uh, nutrients from the land-driven nutrient derived from the land. But you can do, I mean, modulate the chlorophyll or reduce, reduce the chlorophyll because the upwelling is curtailed. So there is no vertical or not enough nutrient that comes up vertically because of which the biomass can be reduced. So this would actually would need the model studies to do some uh, experiment and then sensitivity studies to fix okay, I mean, what could be the, uh, or which one will be the overwhelming. So mechanistically, this is how it can happen. So the upwelling modification through stratification here can impact the f fish uh, biomass. Now, this stratification is not the, because of the warming. This stratification is the change in the precipitation pattern or the ra excess rainfall that can drive here. So this is the haline-driven uh, stratification. Now, this is the understanding that we have from the earlier studies. So what we thought was that, okay, we can probably extend the, uh, um, I mean, uh, and look at the, some of the processes. For example, we have taken two boxes. One is from the southern part of the 
uh, Eastern Arabian Sea and other one is from the northern part. In the southern part, we explored how the upwelling is changing or can we understand how the upwelling is changing over the time. So in the southern box, what we did was that first try, try to look at the SST as a driver or heating as a driver. So here again, the plot is the same. You have the sunspot number cycle and then the SST, which is uh, shown in blue. Uh, the inference is this, or, or the information is the same. So this is from the southern box. So southern box, we could see that there is a linear trend in the warming, but after the mid 90, the warming rate is much higher. So this is consistent with what the basin-wide warming uh, is, but look at the, the numbers. The numbers here is about uh, 0 0.098 uh, degrees per decade. Uh, we can compare that with the northern part when I come to the, that box. Now, we also examined the wind in the same box, and you could see that the wind speed is reducing with time. And uh, uh, so on one hand, you have the temperature of the southern box, which is increasing, and the wind on the uh, same box is decreasing. What does it mean? It would mean that the waters of the southern uh, southeastern Arabian Sea is becoming warmer, thereby you can increase the stratification. So thermally, it can be stratified by increasing the temperature, but at the same time, you see a reduction in the wind. If the wind is reduced, then wind is a ma major driver for the upwelling. In such case, you have a situation where the upwelling can reduce with time. So in that case, the fire, I mean, chlorophyll biomass also will reduce. Now, okay, so this is the SST. Now, and this is the stratification. So, this, uh, for the stratification, the data is from 1980 up to 2022. And what you could do is, this, uh, could see is that there's a large amount of fluctuation. But the trend line, if you see that, the trend shows that that is slightly decreasing. So, the, there is a the slight decrease into this, but that is significant. If you look at the p-value, that is significant. So we have a scenario where, on the one hand, the temperature, by, by temperature, it should uh, increase the stratification, but uh, somehow when you compute the water column stratification, that shows a decrease. It would mean that this problem has, is driven not by the SST alone, but probably by the fresh water. Because in my earlier uh, slides, I showed that the fresh water can alter the stratification. If you have a very heavy rainfall, then the um, um, runoff is very high, then waters can be stratified. On the contrary, if there's a um, in poor uh, monsoon, your rainfall could be less, the water column can be less stratified. So, so this, says that on the southern part of the Eastern Arabian Sea, the stratification control is uh, more complex. It is uh, driven by, of course, the SST warming, but also by the fresh water that will come into the system. So is it a thermal uh, stratification or a halogen stratification? Again, this needs to be fixed by conducting some numerical experiment uh, as a sensitivity, sensitivity studies to understand what could be the relative importance uh, or which will be the more important uh, than the other. The, so in the case of the upwelling, we saw that the stratification control could be controlled by the two mechanism. Now, what about the northern box? If you analyze the northern box, uh, this is the SST pattern in the northern box. It looks exactly similar to what we have seen in the southern box, but only thing is that the slopes are different. So here it is much more rapid than the southern box. So here it is about uh, yeah, 0.12 degree per decade, which is much higher than the southern part. And the wind remains the same. The wind speed 
shows a decline. So in the northern box, which is impacted or which is the site of the winter cooling and convection, we see a scenario where the, temp the water temperatures are rising and wind speeds are decreasing. What does it mean in terms of uh, winter convection? Winter convection is basically driven by the dry winds that is coming from the uh, I mean, uh, that is coming from the land basically by the northeasterly uh, wind system, and that dry northeasterly wind system, when it, when it comes over the ocean, uh, it can kickstart the evaporation. So thereby, the water will be cooled; it will be become denser, and that is the time that you produce the Arabian Sea high saline water mass. We have heard of people talking about the water masses uh, in the morning. So Arabian Sea saline water mass is being produced during that time by this. Now, so what does it mean uh, in terms of uh, winter convection water mass formation? Will the decreased wind impact this? Yes. If you have a wind, primarily the what the wind does is that wind, if it is dry, it will evaporate the water. Now, will the speed matter? Yes. If you have a high, higher I mean, wind with a higher speed, then the evaporation can, could be much faster. So we see a scenario where the reduced wind speed also going to impact the efficiency of the winter cooling by reducing the rate of evaporation. Here again, we probably have to look at some model studies to do the sensitivity analysis. Now, what about the stratification? So here is the SST for the northern box, and the stratification here is completely different. If you recall the stratification that I have shown uh, in the southern box, that was uh, having some kind of cyclicity, but there is a, uh, a weak, decreasing linear trend. But here it is very, very distinct. You could see that the linear trend is very strong and increasing. And so what does it mean? So static stability of the water column in the northern box, which is a site of winter cooling, is increasing. Now that is consistent with the increase of SST. So both has the same sense. So it would mean that here the static stability or the water column stability is controlled by thermal stratification than the halin stratification. All right? Now, oops. OK. Now, what about the oceanic heat content? So this, when we saw this, it has a very strong uh, I mean, static stability. Uh, it would mean that the temperature is a driver. It may be a good idea to understand what is happening into the top 300 meters of the water column. So we have computed the oceanic heat content. And for the same period, from 1960 to 2022, and what we see is that there is a very strong linear trend. So this is now in phase. You have the increased solar uh, radiation uh, or, or the increased uh, energy that is coming up into the water column, and that is reflected as SST increase, which has a linear trend. And that increase in SST leads to, uh, OK, so that energy is stored in the upper 300 meter of the water column, which shows an increase, which then leads to the static stability of the water column. So what does it mean? So you have an increased static stability. The winds are decreasing. What it would mean in terms of for the winter cooling? The efficiency of the Arabian Sea to cool during winter will reduce. So all right, so that's what the physical drivers are. So, the, so what, how will that impact the chlorophyll. Now, when it comes to chlorophyll, it is a little dicey because uh, the data set that we have is not long enough. But we do have a uh, good data set to, OK, um, yeah. So here is a plot of the, just to look at the, show you the seasonal uh, cycle, the chlorophyll in the southern box and the chlorophyll in the northern box. Now. From this, it up, yeah, you could see that the chlorophyll in the northern box is 
much, much higher than that in the south. And of course, the, not the variability also is the large. Why is not for working? Okay, yeah. All right. So here is the again the chlorophyll, uh, the linear, the trend of the chlorophyll, both in the northern and southern box. What you could see is that the southern box, the trend is uh, very weak, and uh, northern box, the trend is very clear. So in the northern box, the chlorophyll concentration shows a decreasing trend with time. And that is uh, the p-value is very uh, it is highly significant. Okay, but here the p-value is large, so th the weak trend probably is not very. We are not that. Uh, so, is it, does that make sense to us? Now, the chlorophyll in the northern box are controlled by the winter convection. And we have seen that the winter convection over the time could reduce because of the reduced wind speed and also the stratification. In such case, we will expect the chlorophyll to go down. Now, this is also consistent with the uh, uh, data analysis by the Roxy et al, who has used a, um, an in-situ data set as well as the model to show that the chlorophyll concentration is going down. But we are not having much uh, confidence on this um, and what is happening to the chlorophyll with time in the southern box. Probably some more analysis need to be done or more careful analysis. Now, this is the chlorophyll as a whole, but is it possible to find out uh, what kind of a, I mean, what this chlorophyll uh, consists of? Is it a, uh, I mean, uh, Size-wise, are they big phytoplankton, small phytoplankton, or medium phytoplankton? So there is a. Uh, it is possible to find that. Oops. Wow. Yeah. So it is possible to find that. So there is a method that is given by uh, Hirata et al. in 2011, and uh, so uh, we, if you. I mean, believe in this relationship and then use the data, I mean, available in situ data set to derive this constants, then we can find out the amount of uh, picoplankton, nanoplankton, and microplankton. This is one of my, uh, the co-authors have done that. We are just still analyzing the, this data set, but I would like to show you some first result from that. So this, so Rebecca has, uh, developed, I mean, applied this in a paper which she has uh, written up in 2020. And uh, the same thing we have applied uh, to the data set now to see what we learn out of that. So, so here are the data sets. So you have the northern box and southern box. Now, uh, what we see in the northern box which is distinctly different from the southern box is that uh, in terms of, this is the uh, chlorophyll uh, mean percentage, okay? Sorry, the size, uh, mean the different size fraction per percentage. So what we could see is that the micro, nano, and pico uh, in the northern region, if you look at that, the highest, uh, yeah, percentage-wise, the highest is the uh, micro, and then uh, the, probably the lowest is the nano. And compare that with the southern, southern box. So here again, they are I mean, widely varying. And we have not I mean, fully analyzed this uh, uh, I mean, data set and uh, synthesized. So I'm still, uh, will not be able to give you a definite uh, understanding from this. But what it shows is that uh, there are distinct differences between the north and south, and also the, there are trend, trend lines which shows there is a slight decline. The declining part is very clear in the northern uh, box, but not so in the southern part. 
Okay, so this is still ongoing. Uh, okay, I will leave, leave this uh, diagram. Now, the last part of my talk is uh, about the cyclone. I said that one of the uh, result that we have published in 2006 was the increased number of cyclone with time in the Arabian Sea, but at that time the data was less. Now, here we have extended this data set from 1960 to uh, 2022, and what we have done is that uh, this is, you can see this uh, magenta, so that is the uh, I mean sunspot number cycle or the solar flux, so that's a decadal scale. So we have plotted the number of cyclones uh, over the sunspot cycle just to see that on a decadal time scale if there is a change uh, or any pattern. Now the pattern is very clear here. What we see is that the total number of cyclonic system in the Arabian Sea is increasing definitely and you could see that as you come to the, towards the um, and post 95, the, the high intensity cyclones are more in number. So not only the number of cyclones in the Arabian Seas are increasing, but their incre uh, the intensity is increasing towards the uh, I mean post-1995. Now this is the uh, result is uh, under review. This is a paper we have, which we have submitted. It is under review. So uh, yeah, I would just conclude by saying that uh, Arabian Sea now is seeing many more cyclones than it was prior to 1995. Now, and we, to sum it up, I do not have a summary slide here. Okay, that's the data. I do not have a summary slide, but I would sum it up by saying that the northern box and southern box, which represents the winter convection and the upwelling, which, uh, both of which will cool the Arabian Sea, well, uh, the, they are spatially uh, separated and also temporarily separated. The, Northern box showed a very distinct trend in its response. It is warming up very clearly. The upper ocean heat content is increasing, and we also saw the increase in the stratification, they, uh, which says that it, it is thermally stratified, driven by the incoming uh, or the uh, solar flux. And uh, view the associated with that, the chlorophyll showed a declining trend, whereas when we come to the southern box, which is uh, uh, under the influence of uh, upwelling, we did not see uh, a clear trend in chlorophyll, but we did see a clear trend in the wind. Winds are decreasing. And then we also saw that the stratification is largely or um, seem to be largely controlled by the haline stratification than the thermal stratification, with the caveat that we would need model study to confirm those things. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for a very informative lecture. But due to time constraints, I can accommodate one question. Yeah. So, Prasanna, very nice presentation. When you're talking about upwelling along the west coast of India, it's very, it varies temporarily, yeah. uh, and especially as well. So, in the southern portion, it, the onset is earlier. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if you go off Mumbai, for example. It is, yeah, uh, it progresses from south. So is it fair to take data from one cruise and uh, then compare the, given that, uh, the, the, given these variations? Yeah, in fact, what you have done is the paper that you have cited, uh, uh, the entire data set has been given and it has been analyzed. So what we see is that, so I have shown you the north-south uh, latitudinal variation. So that showed the intensity of or the, uh, the extent of upwelling uh, during that particular year, but there is a large interannual variability. No, but the yeah. data are from one cruise, right? That is just from one cruise only to show that. Uh, so that is what yeah, I'm asking. Is yeah. it fair to, uh, to use the data from one no, cruise? No, we need to look at the, um, that's why the long term trend we have looked at that. Okay, now, uh, uh, if I may ask yeah. another question. When you're talking about the mismatch between the 11 year, uh, the solar cycle and you know, the SST trend, yeah. you attribute almost entirely to the, uh, the winter cooling, right? Uh, uh, no, okay, even if you haven't done that, most, the, uh, there's much 
much uh, more intense of feeling occurring along in, along the western boundary of the arabian sea yes yeah, right yeah, yeah. and that plays an important role in cooling of the arabian sea as a whole Absolutely. in summer right yeah, yeah. in fact so, that's what that is what has been written in the paper so when you, when it has looked at the three appalling systems so cooling of the arabian sea is largely driven by the somalia oman uh, appalling system as well as the southern part of the west coast of india and the winter cooling that happens not only along the west, eastern I mean, uh, eastern boundary the northern arabian sea so basin scale it is the upwelling and winter cooling on a larger scale so, that is so the, that. these yeah. two boxes that you took yeah. in the north and the south they are actually not that's, really that's just an indicator they are not really probably representing also so I just when you, in your very first slide where yeah. you showed this mismatch and the change after 1995 yeah that is for the basin entire average, basin, yeah. entire basin? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. so our inference basically come from the entire basin but i just for the the this um, presentation i just picked uh, two to see that what really is happening and can we use that probably that bob yeah taking that box the location of of the box probably is important how big box that is also could could be sensitive but the inference that comes out to is robust in the sense that the declining wind this we have seen it over the basin scale as well there's a decline in the wind speed so that is robust yeah thank you sir so uh, when you were seeing this stratification increasing and uh, productivity somewhere going down somewhere increasing and then uh, a relative proportion of uh, micro eco and nano is increasing decreasing hmm. So, how robust this means when this nano pico internal uh, apportionment is changing, what is happening to the total carbon content? The chlorophyll biomass, for example, the northern box, if you look at that, uh, the, that is showing a declining. So, you may have a different uh, uh, mean percentages of pico and nano, but the chlorophyll as a biomass shows a decline. But that uh, is uh, uh, but that is consistent with the other model studies and also the in-situ studies as well. But yeah. some of the in-situ measurement where they are uh, think, talking about the change in the ecosystem when this productivity, total carbon content is remaining same. So how, how we can... In-situ in studies probably we do not have that much some, of data Some set. of whatever yeah. is there. Yeah. Uh, they but they see... The Okay, okay. I, I would be skeptical about that because in-situ studies you have, but to take out a long-term trend from that is difficult because the inter-annual and the seasonal variabilities are very large. So if I have some four uh, data sets of the four different years, it will be extremely uh, uphill task for me to derive what is the long-term trend into this. That's where the problem is. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, sir. The discussion should be continued later. So, thank you very much. As a token of our gratitude, we request uh, uh, President Omar sir to accept a memento from uh, Dr. V. N. Sanjeevan, uh, former director of CMLR. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So we break for the lunch now and we may reassemble at uh, 2 o'clock. So we have six more presentations. So please, uh, please come back at 2 o'clock.
listing of all speakers I did due to time constraints and the requirements. So I first invite uh, Dr. Girish Gobinath uh, for the talk. Uh, uh, Dr. Girish is an esteemed faculty member and head of the Department of Remote Sensing and GIS at Kerala University of Fisheries and Ocean Studies. With his vast knowledge and experience in oceanography and geospatial technology, Dr. Gopinath has made significant contributions to the field. He has also authored numerous research papers and publications providing valuable insight. We are, we are all thrilled to have him here today to speak on the topic of geospatial technology for coastal ecosystems. Welcome, Dr. So good afternoon. Uh, so my talk will be divided into two parts. Uh, one is the introduction to geospatial technology, then followed by how to apply in coastal ecosystem. So before starting uh, my talk, uh, you may be heard about uh, different terminology like geotagging, geofencing, geomatics, geoinformatics like that. I will not go to details all the things. And geospatial technology is an umbrella under which there is a lot of technology is coming up. Nowadays, there is a new technology called LIDAR and also followed with the radar. After that, when you go, there is a lot of satellites are in the orbit in different altitude, maybe in the low orbit, medium or high orbit, followed by our GPS system. Now we having a NAVIC, it is not at operational. So a lot of GNS data is also available. So the data is nowadays very important for any type of analysis, whether it is an ocean or land, we are using um, the data for a different type of application. So there is a new branch of uh, geo A is coming up because this artificial intelligence is a one of the technique you can use both in the coastal as well as in the ter uh, terrain like that. So you having a lot of operational satellites, even though when you start with the geos, meteostat, inside like that, other than we having a lot of polar orbiting satellites. So we are very much interested in polar orbiting when you talk about the coastal ecosystem. It start with the Landsat, Oceansat, uh, then uh, Sentinel, then Allos, Pulsar like that. So most of the data you can download free of cost because you, you will get a beautiful Sentinel pictures having a resolution of 15 meters. Then you have a Landsat data of OLA, Operational Land Imager. It is a 30 meter resolution. That is also free of cost. Then Japanese satellite is there, ALOS is there. Then European satellite Sentinel is there. There's a lot of spectrum is there when you talk about the remote sensing. So when you talk about uh, basically on ocean or coastal ecosystem, we having a resource at, then we having an ocean sat. This data is recently uh, launched by ISRO that we are calling EOS. It is having an, a sensor called uh, OZM. There's an ocean color monitor. This is a first image captured by our EO6 data. Once we launch Cartostat 2, our dimension is changed. Actually, we are getting a data on X and Y axis. Now you are getting the height information also. That, that is why the Cartostat playing a vital role for any type of hydrological or of modeling analysis like that. Then we having a satellite in microwave part of the spectrum like Resat 1, 2, like that. And also India is going to launch, in a, it's a dual frequency in NASA satellite on January 2024. So you can study a lot of, inform, you will get an extra lot of information, especially in coastal, for subsidence of cost, all the information like that. And again, we having a lot of satellite in hyperspectral. India having a Chandrayaan mission, then we having an HISAIS mission. A lot of things we having a, a missions. This mission will give a lot of information, especially in the coastal areas, as well as in your terrain, like that. When you talk about basically in remote sensing, it is operating with a panchromatic multispectral, and also you are getting a continuous data in hyperspectral. In their band, you are getting information of the terrain, then microwave part of the spectrum also. So as far as wavelength, you are getting a lot of information, both spectrally, spatially, temporally, and radiometrically, like that. So the LIDAR is a one of the technology 
we are currently using for a NASA project uh, that you can use the shallow bathymetric survey as well as your terrain survey like that. Shallow means it will go up to 40 to 50 meters like that. So this is a, one of the instruments we are using uh, for our project called NASR. It is a NASA ISR project. It is a joint venture of SAC and Kerala University of Fisheries and Ocean Science. It is actually for a mapping of biomass. So, but actually we are using for the coastal area also. You will get a lot of information about biomass also. This is a first dual frequency satellite of Indian, uh, NASA and ISRO. This data is usually we are used for the calibration of your uh, ongoing project. It will be launched in January 2024, like that. So nowadays we are depending upon other part of spectrum also, UAVs and drones. So these are the one of the picture in the Northern Kerala. This is a center for water resource. The backside you can see in the Institute of Management, Calicut. So UAV will give you both X dimension, Y and Z. You will get an X, you are, you are getting a very beautiful picture. It is a geo reference data like that. And also we having a lot of satellite in orbit. More than 1044 working satellite are there. Out of 36 belongs to India. These are some US satellite called QuickBed 1, 2, and Worldview 1, 2, 3, 4, like that. So nowadays the satellite can be used for tracking of your cargo. That, that is why our technology is very advanced. So you can monitor your cargo from your office. No need of going anywhere like that. So when you, are, when you see this one, As far as an Indian Earth observation is concerned, now we are getting a submeter accuracy. We are starting with a one kilometer spatial resolution. Now we are getting a submeter accurate data like that. So these are the different satellite sensors with a resolution like that. So nowadays we, we are very much worried about data. We having a lot of data in the cloud form, maybe in different satellites are there and different uh, data are available for uh, any type of modeling. And based on your purpose, you can select whatever, whether you are interested in climate. There is a lot of satellite in Calypso, uh, like that. So you can do a lot of analysis like that. So the next one is uh, regarding how this technology can be applied. So how this, uh, because you are getting a temporal data. Suppose if you want to study anything temporally and spatially, you need a data. This is a, one of the information from Vishakapatanam. You can see how the cost is temporally changing. And this is a, one of the study we conducted some 20 years back. Uh, the, it is a, one of the island called Sagar Island. It is in the Sundarbans. It is a, one of the biggest delta. It is having a above six meters above MSL. We carried out a lot of investigation on this uh, island. And also when you see the sea level rise, because uh, you are talking about uh, climate and sea level, you can also get a data from a PSM muscle. We have done uh, all the analysis in Sundarbans, we can see there's a lot of, of uh, changes, both anthropogenic as well as uh, sea level changes. And also we studied how the islands are evolving. That also you can study from satellite data. So what I had shown from 1881, it is a conventional data we collected from CWPRS, that's a Pune. Then all some, uh, after that from an 8, 96, 98, these are from satellite data. You can see what are the changes for the land ecosystem for the Sundar, uh, this is a, uh, Sagar Island. And, and these are the study we conducted for entire Kerala coast. Actually, when you are talking from north to south, there are some costs which are very stable, some are eroding costs, some there is an uh, accretion of sediments. So when you see the table format of next one, you can see the erosion of, when you take a total cost line is 571 or 572, 327 cost is the erosion and 172 uh, length is accretion and 91 kilometer is a stable cost as far as Kerala is concerned. When you talk about area, we lost a 23 square kilometer by erosion and there's a deposition of 10 meter. So net loss of Kerala is a 10 square kilometer as far as the erosion is concerned. Like that, all the data you will get from the public portal, whether you will get it from ResearchGate or a Google Scholar or LC like that. And also there's another study we had carried out northern part of segment called, there's a, there's a um, 
wetland called Kawai wetland. This wetland is characterized by a lot of islands, but these islands have a different shape. The shape will be changing in the seasonally and also uh, decadal changes also. So that also we studied from the temporal satellite data. What are the changes for which island? What is the reason for that? Like that, we had carried out. So again, when you're talking about north, when we come just down to Kauai, there is a, a Kohikot cost is there. We had done a vulnerability assessment. You can do two type of vulnerability assessment. One is a physical and one is a socioeconomic assessment for the cost. And this is a Ponani Harbor. It is actually structure-induced changes in your cost. When you talk about Ponani, when you see in 2004 and 2012 and 2022, you can see changes in the sediment pattern. When you see the harbor of Ponani like that, when you're coming down to Cochin, this is a part of the joint project with the NAO uh, that we study from a satellite temporal data. What are the changes for the uh, Cochin estuary? So we found there's a lot of anthropogenic, lot of encroachment like that. So it is shrinking like that. When you see this part of the Fort Cochin, you can see the Wipin was uh, in 1967, it is just like a finger like. When you see in 2004, there is a lot of addition of sediments in the Fort Cochin, that uh, Wipin area. So the Wipin is a growing island. So now there's a recent report by Kerala University of Fisheries and Ocean Science. It is showing that there's a 85 percentage of uh, reduction in the storage retention capacity of water. That's a recent report. It was released some two weeks before in Kumaragam, like that. So this also, a, there's a hot topic in Kerala for Chalanam. This is actually, this report is submitted to government of Kerala. Uh, about There's a lot of issues when you see Chalanam, next slide. You can see there's a lot of uh, interconnecting canals are there. When you see these two canals, this is a major junction, you can see. Uh, there's a lot of uh, urbanization or settlements you can see. When you see that this is a major Vijayan canal, you can see there is a lot of encroachment. That means there is a, there's a change in the hydrodynamic condition of coastal area like that. And these are the field condition. You can see this one. Wherever you are getting a seawall, the back side you are getting as a geotubes or a sand tubes like that. And also you can see the different type of settlements. It is already packed with the sediments and it is not uh, use, useful in Hamilton area. And this is a, again another condition. And now Chalanam is safe. Now government is putting a lot of tripods. If you go to the south part of Chalanam, uh, last time uh, there are no issue with the overtopping of water like that. These are the issues if you take Kerala like that. So I will not go to details of things. So re-establishment of canal for better hydrologic review and proper width and optimum depth. That is a very important for flushing of water. You need a optimum depth for this one. And if you take you again come to south, that is a Chartala. Again, you can see it is a structure induced erosion. When you see the Chartala in 2018, you can see beautiful beach. When you put 2011, you can see one side there's an erosion and another side there's an accretion like that. So, this process is continuing in the in different parts of Kerala like that. And this is a, one of the projects we are using. There's a machine learning to study the uh, vulnerability index. This is both include physically and also uh, socioeconomic condition like that. So we have selected three cities. One is a Calicut, uh, then Cochin and Trivandrum like that. So you can see this is a condition in southern part of Kerala in Trivandrum part. You can see in the last monsoon, it is looked like this. So this is not a final map. Uh, we do, uh, we had to do some more refreshment of this uh, refinement regarding the, uh, we are using a Bayesian uh, language for this one. So these are the Hyperion data. It is very useful for the any type of coastal uh, mapping. So these are the one of the project we are doing uh, for mangroves in the entire coastal area for mapping of mangroves to develop a spectral library. Actually, the, we having a lot of spec. If you go to USGS site, you get a lot of spectral library. But we have we have no spectral library for Indian mangroves. So 
when you talk about Kerala, we having an 80 species of uh, mangroves. So we are doing a lot of analysis and development of the spectral libraries. The, actually, this project is for PADI. So we are extended to for a, this different type of mangroves also to develop a spectral library. For these are the four libraries we generated to find out unknown species. Once you're having an unknown species, from a satellite data, you can de derive a species like that. And this is a, one of the projects we completed with the ISRO, that is the National Wetland Inventory for Kerala and Lakshadweep. Its objective is to, based on the Supreme Court verdict, you have to estimate for 10 years what are the changes for mangrove ecosystem in Kerala. It is already submitted to SAC. If you go to the portal of Vedas of SAC, you will get the information like that. And also, you have to prepare a latest GIS database for India, Kerala. That is, if you go to the website of SAC, you will get an all information. The wetlands of India is readily available. What are the changes for decadal changes like that? These are the some photographs, uh, whether in the Puduvai pin and also some areas. And also, we are also using a Google Earth engine. This is a, one of the beautiful technology you can to study any temporal changes, any coastal ecosystem you can do like that. And this is a, one of the report came in uh, newspapers regarding based on the, our project. What are the changes for Puduvai pin? There's a drastic changes, maybe 42 percentage of mangroves are declined in Puduvai pin area from a, when you take from 2002 to 2020, like that. And this is also, we are doing another project. We, uh, we are going to complete about mangrove community sonation, the biophysical. The thing you have to keep it in mind, those mangroves having a more than five hectares can be mapped from a remote sensing because it is a size based on the size of your pixel because we are getting a pixel value of 5.3 meter value. So base, there is some uh, thing you have to keep in mind before going for the mangrove mapping because the mangroves are very scattered like that. You need a, at least five meters to get a, this one. So these are the, some field observation. It is near to our campus. There's a lot of dumping waste. Maybe it is a chemical or something they are putting above the mangroves like that. So these are the recent paper we published on the how satellite can helpful for a water quality monitoring. It is one, one, one of the Ramsar site called a, uh, Ashtamadi. So before and COVID, what happened to the water, whether it is, it is based on a one index algorithm called SPM, that is a suspend particulate matter. But thing is that it should be below 120 milligram per liter. Then only that algorithm will work. So these are the uh, SPM values you can see, how you are before and COVID uh, about this uh, Ashtamadi uh, wetland system like that. So I will not go to that. This uh, may be the last slide. But when you discuss about some 10 or 20 slides, these are based on the pixel values, right? That is, you are classifying your data based on the pixel value, whether DN values. But when you are talking about the high resolution satellite or UAV base, it is a object oriented. You cannot classify based on pixel. You can classify the, uh, the image based on the segment like that. So that, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Girish, for, for the detailed description of uh, Geo geospatial techniques in studying the alterations in shoreline morphology in response to climate change. I think we can afford one or two questions. That's a spectral library. Yeah. It is actually, we, we, yes, sir. Yeah, I will explain you. Suppose you're having a satellite data. Suppose there's an unknown pixel is there, we already having a spectral library, we'll test with that library, where that particular, uh, if suppose you are talking about vegetation, that vegetation library is there, it will identify that particular vegetation. Suppose if you're having a rock is there, you're having a known values, the unknown value we can derive. Uh, we can derive that value. So if you go to USGS, they're having the spectral library for entire, uh, entire vegetation and also rock also. Thank you. So, as a token of our gratitude, we request Dr. Girish to accept a memento from Dr. Anintha Majunza. Dear all, I am 
I'm thrilled to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Roxy, uh, Matthew Cole. Dr. Roxy is a distinguished scientist at the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, Pune. Uh, Dr. Roxy has made breakthrough contributions on the observations and predictions of the Indo-Pacific climate facility, food, water, and economic security of the region. With over two decades of experience in climate research, Dr. Uh, Roxy has been actively working on understanding the uh, climate change and its impact on the monsoon, cyclones, heat waves, and marine ecosystem. He has published over 100 research uh, articles in leading uh, scientific journals and has received several awards and recognitions for his contribution to the field of the field. Dr. Uh, Roxy has uh, previously served as a lead author for uh, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climatic Change, Special Report on the Ocean and Cryosphere in Changing Climate. He has also held position at the Max Planck Institute of Meteorology in Germany and at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in the United States. Today, Dr. Roxy will be sharing his insights on the topic of compound floods and changing climate. Uh, so I welcome Dr. Roxy for the, well, this is an online presentation, so I'm, I'm sorry that we do not have option to ask questions directly. If any of you have uh, questions, please scribble it and pass it to me, so I can ask uh, Dr. Dinesh Kumar to ask us to Roxy and get it answered. Thank you. Hello. Roxy, you can start. Am I audible? I can't hear you. Okay. Happy to see this discussion on climate change impacts and coastal response. Sorry, there's there's a lot of echo and sound coming from there. Maybe you could mute your mic. Okay, perfect. So I hope you can hear me and see me. Happy to see all this discussion today, morning and afternoon after lunch. Uh, hope you had a good lunch. Uh, these discussions on climate change impacts on and coastal response. First of all, I thank my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Dinesh Kumar, who is uh, retiring this month for his contributions to interdisciplinary research on the Indian Ocean, and also for organizing an important workshop like this, along with Dr. Anas. Like many of you, I also started my scientific career at NIO more than two decades ago. It kick-started with a one-month cruise in the Arabian Sea on the research vessel Sagar Kanya, exploring the role of oceans on the monsoon. And I've been doing that job since then exploring the role of oceans in climate change on the monsoon and on people and ecosystem on land and coastal ecosystems as well. So let me take a second to share my presentation for today. Just a second. Right. I hope you can see my screen with the presentation because uh, I can't hear the audio from your side. So today I'll be talking about some less known aspects of climate change, particularly compound events, or when uh, it comes to the coast, compound coastal floods. The picture on the left is a photograph from when Cyclone Tote impacted the coast of Kerala. 
So I'm Roxy Matikol from the Center of Climate Change Research in Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, which is under the Ministry of Earth Sciences. So let's start with a quick look at climate change, because that's, that's quite important to see the status of climate, where we are, and also plan for the way forward. So my uh, intention today is not, not just throw, throw some signs uh, here and go, but also try to see if there are ways, ways forward as well. Now the picture on your left is the most recent synthesis report from the sixth assessment report from the interpanel, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. So what it says is that based on the current policies, uh, based on what are policies that national uh, different nations have or the nationally determined contributions that has been announced, we will most likely exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius between 2020 and 2040 and two degrees Celsius between 2040 and 2060. That's because these are the, uh, the policies that, that countries had planned. And if you want to reduce the temperatures or keep it flattened at 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius, we need a large cut on the greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. So these cuts have, have to happen between 2020 and 2030, which is not happening which means that greenhouse gas emissions will continue to increase further, pushing us to warming beyond two degrees Celsius. And all those changes that we are seeing, like Dr. Nakvi was talking, uh, Prasanna Kumar and others were also talking about changes in uh, the biological, uh, biogeochemistry in the Indian Ocean, is in response to that one degree Celsius that we have got impacted under recently. And bear in mind, there is no magic to remove all this carbon dioxide from, uh, from the Earth's atmosphere. Even that carbon, carbon removal technology that we are talking about is not a current climate solution. This is an article that appeared in Nature two days ago. You can go and read it. So we really need global nations to come together. But there is another point that I, I want to talk about other than mitigation of emissions. That is adaptation with respect to coastal ecosystems. And why is that? So if you look at the Indian Ocean region, this is the Indian Ocean region. You can see the map here. I'll put extreme weather events one by one. Monsoon floods and droughts across the Indian Ocean region in Africa, in South Asia, East Asia, Australia, we see happening again and again. Cyclones and storm surges, we already saw uh, increasing cyclones in the Arabian Sea from President Umar's talk. Heat waves, we are going through heat waves at the moment. We saw some, some of the heat waves in February. Now, uh, it's interesting that I am calling it terrestrial heat waves. Why? Because we have marine heat waves, heat waves in the ocean, which leads to coral bleaching and impacts the fisheries as well. We don't know much about it then comes impact on the marine phytoplankton productivity and biology, including the fisheries. And overarching changes are there, changes in sea level rise, which compounds all these impacts. Now, what will happen if some of these extreme weather events overlap each other? That is what we call compound extreme weather events. So these are two scenarios mostly hydrological scenarios. One on the top, you have a city along the coast impacted by compound floods. So here it's a scenario, typical scenario where sea level rise, storm surge, waves, heavy rainfall, and a flooded river. All of them overlap, result in prolonged large scale floods in a city. Yeah, so you see multiple extreme weather events are overlapping there. 
Similarly, in the bottom, you see a scenario of water scarcity due to a drought overlapping with uh, glaciers which are already melted. So there is less water coming downstream and there is a heat wave as well. So all these can affect the food, water and economic security, socioeconomic security of the region. One uh, particular example of uh, compound extreme is the heat wave during the last year. Uh, you could see that entire country or South Asia was impacted by this kind of heat waves with temperatures even going above 43 up to reaching up to 50 degrees Celsius in the Indo-Pakistan region. And this was compounded with wildfires because of dryness, because the rains were less during that period, which also resulted in more pollution over the entire Indo-Gangetic plain. So multiple factors overlapping with each other. We see these kind of combat events happening. Yeah. For West Coast of India, for regions like Kerala and all, it may be a compounding of increased heat and humidity. So that could be a different kind of compound event. Now let's come to Kerala, which is uh, something I want to focus a bit here. There are some changes uh, over Kerala. I have given the numbers as well. If you look at sea level rise, sea level rise is about three millimeter per year, but the future is, future change is about projected to be five millimeter per year. We'll see how fast that is. For in terms of cyclones, we see a 50% increase in the Arabian Sea cyclones and a 80% increase in the duration of these cyclones. Yeah. These, and all these factors, including the increased temperatures and all impact the fisheries the marine ecosystem. There are changes in extreme rains as well, which are projected to intensify further in the future. Already we see a decline in rainfall. So this decline in rainfall, so that is the decline in total rainfall while extreme rainfall events are increasing. So this means there are long dry periods intermittent with short term floods, which results in water scarcity, salinity intrusion and so on, along with that heat waves and all, yeah. So these are extreme weather events with respect to the particularly West Coast and Kerala. Now coming to some of these extreme weather events, I will pick some of these events because they are quite interesting and to see how they are overlapping. I will take the case of cyclones. So these are two back-to-back -back cyclones which we saw in 2021. One is Tokte cyclone with about 220 kilometer per hour speed and yes, cyclone on the east coast, 110 kilometer per hour speed. Yeah, two intense cyclones, but one on the east coast was less intense or half the intensity compared to the Tote cyclone on the west coast. These kind of cyclones are increasing already. President are told about increasing cyclones and all, so I'm not getting more into that. And why are they increasing? One particular reason is a lot of heat. Dr. Nakvi mentioned this, 93% of the heat from global warming goes into the oceans, yeah? So there is more heat, more moisture, supplying more energy for the cyclones to intensify and develop. So these are the numbers here for pre-monsoon uh, in red dots and post-monsoon in the previous two decades and the recent two decades, yeah? So Bay of Bengal, the numbers have remained almost same there is, in fact, a uh, small decline in the number of cyclones in Bay of Bengal due to um, uh, some reasons which I can explain later. Yeah. But even over the Arabian Sea, you can see the number has definitely increased. It's actually a 52% increase in the number of cyclones. And not only the number of cyclones, but also the duration. So cyclones are spending more time in the ocean, which means the impact is also increasing. Yeah, there are uh, cascading impacts also like fishermen get less time to go into the sea because anyway, they cannot go into the sea during the monsoon season. Now, this is where it gets interesting. These cyclones push a, push a lot of strong waves onto the coastal region. Yeah, so on the, on the top left, you can see the wave height is released by a cyclone. Yeah, we call these waves storm surges. These 
waves can be up to four to five meter high. So on the left, you have in centimeters going up to five, five meters. Yeah. This is with Cyclone Nisarga in 2020 on the West Coast and Cyclone Tote. You can see similar numbers, five, six. We have recorded up to 10 meters. That was in the Bay of Bengal. Yeah. So huge amount of water being pushed onto the land, releasing a lot of water. And mind you, this is all saline water. So we get a lot kind of coastal flooding with these cyclones. And it's not just water from the waves. These same cyclones are bringing in rains and they're bringing more rain than earlier because there is more moisture available. Cyclones are more intense in the recent period. These dots here, green, blue, and red, are dots indicating heavy, very heavy, extreme heavy rainfall during Cyclone Tote and during Cyclone Yash. Those back-to-back -back cyclones which I showed earlier. Now see, all of them have released heavy rainfall across India. That means they, they all can cause floods across that region. So along with, so remember these coasts are facing the same storm surges as well. So there is a storm surge water, and then there is rain water, yeah? So that's kind of double flooding along the coast. Now add to that sea level rise. This is a picture uh, which shows, uh, which is from Mumbai. You can definitely, uh, it's so visible that it's from Mumbai. People are living uh, bang on the coast and you can see the storm surge pushing the water in, into, in, inside their houses, right? And you can also see a disparity. You can see those high rise building in the far which are not affected by this. So basically, it is uh, the vulnerable uh, poor people that are more vulnerable to these kind of impacts. Yeah. So this is this kind of sea level rise happens year by year, decade by decade. So all the storm surge that we saw earlier plus the rainwater plus the sea level rise. Yeah. So this compounds to a major flood event. Uh, this is the, Mumbai has the longest record. We can see the sea level rise increasing. The earlier it was uh, up to about 0.7 to 1 millimeter per year, but now it is close to three, three millimeter. Kochi again, three millimeter. Bay Bengal, it's up to five millimeter, yeah. So if it is three millimeter per decade now, in the next decade, it is five, five millimeter. Uh, that's per decade, it's five centimeter. That means half a meter change in a century, which can be huge. Yeah. So when we talk about three centimeter or three millimeter, we might think three centimeter per decade is a small number, but the amount of water intrusion, inland intrusion, uh, that can happen along with it is actually huge. It's a basic trigonometry. So if it is three centimeter, we can calculate how much water might, uh, how much land gets intruded. Yeah, you can see the numbers here. I put the numbers. So basically with every decade, three centimeter per decade, three centimeter per decade change, 17 meters of land could be taken idly. So that's the impact of sea level rise. So when all this happens together, compound floods or compound coastal floods happen. So I have two very short videos. I'll quickly show. One is from <clears throat> Cyclone Tote on coastal. You can see the storm surge, huge waves. And the amount of water including. Now remember, Cyclone Tote, it was 220 km per hour speed. Cyclone Yash on the right, 110 km per hour intensity. So you might expect a lesser impact for Cyclone Yash. 
but that was not the case because of multiple factors overlap. <clears throat> you can see the in, inland intrusion of water is so much. It actually went to 10 to 60 kilometers inland. Again, I remind you, this is all salt water affecting the agriculture of the region. So storm surge plus rainwater, the rivers were already flooded, hill of rice and the natural even high tide all together resulted in this compound event. So many times we ask for visible impacts of sea level rise. Now this is the best example that I can show you. Aerial image of one of the islands within India's territory in Bengal. It's the one island. So this was the picture from a few decades back. This is a picture now. You can see the kind of varnishing because of sea level rise, erosion, and other climate change factors. Now, there are things that we can do in terms of uh, adaptation, multiple, multiple <coughs> ways forward. One, they have tried to do in, in such cases along the coastline or in terms of one island is to do seagrass restoration. So they, they planted a lot of seagrass and also coral restoration along, along the <clears throat> banks of the island. So they saw that they can restore part of the island. They also saw the biodiversity has increased over time. So earlier, the biodiversity had uh, kind of disappeared because the island was disappearing as well, but then it came back with the seagrass restoration. <coughs> now, there are multiple ways of adaptation for climate proofing our coastline. One is no response, which we see very often along our coastline. One is protection, but it can be maladaptation as well. You put some rocks along the coast, but there are other ways to protect our coastal areas and our residences as well. One is accommodation, elevated housing. Other is retreating, leave the coast to itself. And the best suggested is the ecosystem-based adaptation. Yeah, or maybe ecosystem, a lot of literature in, in that, but it may not work in all areas, particularly monsoon, where you have monsoon waves and all. So one is seagrass and mangrove-based, swamp-based, uh, coastal ecosystem adaptation. There are multiple ways in which we can do that. And what this document says is that the effect of the waves can be reduced up to 50% by having this kind of ecosystem-based adaptation. Yeah. And this is effective in terms of cyclones as well. Oh, another way, this is from Cotonado in Kerala, where sea level rise where, uh, is affecting the region very much. You can see elevated uh, housing here. This is one way to accommodate and adapt. Uh, elevated uh, and uh, accommodation also provides way for the water to flow. So water can flow. But in this kind of development activities, whether it is elevated roads or elevated buildings, it should be based on future projections. Yeah. So the baseline that you see here should be based on future projections. Oh, I'm almost into closing my talk. There are multiple factors. What happens with uh, climate change stories is that it becomes one-sided. Many times, a lot of direct human impacts affect coastal system as well. One example is land and river use changes. Now, this is a picture from Mumbai again. I am showing an example of how Mumbai has developed. You, you see the high-rise building and you see the blue colors. It looks pretty, but those are tarpaulin roofs. But when a cyclone hits or a flooding happens over that region along the coast, we don't know if it is those blue tarpaulin roofs that get uh, blown away at first or their grounds get uh, you know, flooded. You know, all these regions used to be mangroves and there used to be a river in the middle where I'm drawing, where I'm marking. 
this is supposed to be the Miti River. Now it is less than a, a small Nala. Yeah. So when heavy rains come or when uh, uh, sea level rise or storm surges happen, there is no place for the water to get absorbed. So it's not just climate change, but also direct human interventions, how we build our infrastructure along the coast, that is important along our rivers. This is an example uh, where you have uh, meandering rivers with floodplains. So the floodplains help the additional water to sink in and move. But when we try to manipulate it, when we try to straighten the river and take the flood plains and encroach it and have these houses, there is no place for that additional water to spread and sink in. So large scale flooding happens and we blame on climate change, but that's not the entire story. So that's it, that's mainly it. Uh, as a way forward, we need an integrated coastal zone management. We need research and assessment at a very local level, though climate change is global, the impacts and solutions are many times local, particularly adaptation level uh, uh, solutions. Yeah. And like I showed, compound events are to be considered and that requires interdepartmental collaboration and data sharing. This is something what Shubha also was mentioning. We need multiple or interdisciplinary collaboration, data sharing and so on. And we need to set up early warning systems and future projections based on that to protect our coastal system. And in terms of action, we need collective community-based action. That's quite important in this case. It's not just scientists, it's not just uh, government. We need community-based action and I have seen with my eyes that working in Kerala. Ecosystem-based adaptation is quite important. And on top of all that, this has to be led by, uh, you know, at least district level committees and we need effective fin financing as well. Thanks a lot. I enjoyed talking to you as well. I can take questions, but I, I'm not sure if I can hear you uh, if, if it is audible from your side. Thank you. Or you can type the questions. I can, I can see the chat. Hello, can you hear me? Roxy, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Roxy? Uh, I, I, I hope I can, you can hear me. So one of the questions is uh, the island which is disappearing in the Bay of Bengal, 
uh, is attributed to the sea level rise. What about the reduced sediment input uh, into the Bay of Bengal? Now, I do not know particularly about the sediment inputs uh, into the Bay of Bengal, how it is contributing, but there are multiple cases of islands disappearing in the Indo-Pacific Indo region. Uh, there are examples from other regions also. So it happens that it is not just sea level rise. Sea level rise is particularly larger on the West Pacific and the East Indian Ocean, including the Bay of Bengal region, where it is above five millimeter per year already. Along with that, there is strong erosion because of the strong storms. So these multiple factors might be enhancing uh, the disappearance of these island, island systems. I request I just in charge to express Thank our you. thanks to uh, Roxy. So we are expecting uh, Thank you, Roxy. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So we are also expecting Dr. Murali uh, Tumarugudi online for the talk, but there is some uh, problem in uh, connecting with him. So we will uh, we will uh, we will see the possibilities. So meantime, I I request our next speaker is Dr. VVS Sharma, scientist in charge of our Vishakhapatnam Center. Uh, Dr. Sharma is an expert in the field of ocean biogeochemistry and climate change, nutrient cycling, uh, chemical process at air-sea interface. He has more than 200 publications in the relevant area and has been honored as the visiting professor at UPMC France and Nagoya University, Japan. He is also the recipient of National Award on Excellence in Ocean Science and Technology, Ministry of Earth Science 2020. Fellow of Indian Academy of Science 2015, Hidaka Outstanding Publications Award in 2012, uh, ISCA Young Scientist Award by Indian Science Congress, and Start Young Scientist Award by American Geophysical Union 2000. He is a member of various national and international expert committees and editor of Environmental Science and Pollution Research. We are eager to learn from Dr. Sharma on ways to tackle the complex issues of climate change. We are honored to have uh, Dr. Sharma with us today. Please join me in welcoming his to, him to the stage. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Anas. And uh, I must also thank uh, Dr. Dinesh Kumar for uh, inviting me and uh, make me part of this workshop. This made me to meet uh, our old colleagues and my mentors also during this time. This is a, uh, kind of a rare opportunity. I would like to share uh, some uh, research, uh, recent uh, work which is uh, ongoing uh, from our side. It's not really published and uh, we can even discuss the kind of it's on the way of this work. Mainly to show that um, the uh, argonite saturation depth, which is the calcium carbonate secreting organisms actually depending on this depth, how it is changing due to the atmospheric pollution and the climate change. You know that uh, the, some of the organisms, they, they precipitate calcium carbonate in the form of argonite and in the form of the calcite, where the calcite form is um, much more sensitive for the change in the pH and also for the carbon dioxide levels in the water. So these forms actually by the several molluscas or the, the warm and cold core, uh, uh, the corals and also the teropods and the, some forums, all these actually they precipitate calcium carbonate in the form of uh, uh, aragonite. So these are the kind of a different forms in the Indian Ocean. And also the, the, this one, uh, I don't know which one is the form. Uh, okay, the corals where uh, we can see in the, in the Indian Ocean. And the pteropods and uh, all these actually are uh, secreting in the form of the aragonite and they are quite sensitive for the increase of the CO2 level in the, in the ocean. 
there are several experiments have been conducted uh, two decades ago by looking at um, how their calcification rates changes if we increase the, the CO2 levels. And they found that the calcification rates significantly decreases if we increase the, the CO2 levels or the decrease the pH. So this is experimentally found in the, in the laboratories to show that how sensitive they are for the increase of the CO2 levels. Based on the World Ocean Circulation experiments, so they collected a significant amount of the data in the Indian Ocean. They found that the aragonite saturation depth, which was decreasing from the, the south to the northern uh, Indian Ocean, and the, the shallowest aragonite saturation depth was found in the Bay of Bengal, which is uh, less than 400 meters in the early 1990s. The down one is the calisade saturation depth is much deeper, more than uh, 3,000 meters. Um, now this organoid saturation depth, how we will take it that we have a, the saturation, how much is the calcium, how much is the carbonate we should have in the water with reference to temperature salinity, how much of the concentration you have. When these two are equal, that we call it as a one, below that, the organoid uh, form of the calcium carbonate starts dissolving. So the depth here, what you are showing is the where you have the, the saturation is, uh, is equal to one. Now the anthropogenic CO2 is being increasing, either direct input or otherwise, the, even the decomposition of the organic matter that also releases the CO2. Even the oxygen minimum zones, which uh, Dr. Naki was telling in the morning, the expansion of the oxygen zones are intensifying that. That also accumulates the, where the CO2, where the pH decreases. All these actually influences the, the saturation depth. Okay, so this is the global way. How, what is the aragonate saturation depth uh, at, the, at the present? You see there on the top one where the purple color, where the shallowest aragonate saturation, which is the less than 500 meters. Mainly you will see in the equatorial Indian Ocean, subarctic North Pacific, and Bay of Bengal, the, the three regions we find the, the shallowest aragonate saturation depth. The mechanisms are different. Why they have the shallower there? Because they have the equatorial upwelling that brings the low pH waters to the, to the upper layer. And in the subarctic phosphate, we say where the thermohaline circulation, written thermohaline circulation, which is the older water mass, where the more organic matter decomposition leading to the lower pH. And also the fresh water that also allows to more to absorb the atmosphere CO2. Both actually contributes to the Argonite saturation depth to be the shallower in the subarctic North Pacific. When you're coming into the Bay of Bengal, the Bay of Bengal, you know that we have a lower salinity waters we have because of the river discharges, and the PCO2 levels are uh, lower than the atmosphere, which are acting as a kind of a sink for the atmospheric CO2. And uh, even there's the oxygen minimum zone in that. So all these are contributing to the shallowing of the Argonite saturation depth in the, in the Bay of Bengal. Most important thing we need to see is that the DAC to TA ratio, because when you have the more atmospheric CO2 input or the decomposition of the organic matter that releasing the CO2, that actually increases the DAC to TA ratio. When the DAC to TA ratio is increasing and more and more, which is more vulnerable for the dissolution of this calcium carbonate. So what it happens, you have a calcium carbonate, you are increasing the CO2, the CO2 actually reacts with this and forms the calcium ion, the bicarbonate. This bicarbonate actually increases the total alkalinity. So therefore, more atmosphere CO2 can be absorbed in this level if the pH increases. So this is the work actually the first time we reported that argonate saturation is uh, shallowing. This is the based on the data collected in the geosex time in the 1970s versus uh, was period in 1990s by comparing these two. We found that um, about, um, about 50 to 80 meters of the aragonite saturation depth has been showed uh, between these uh, two decades. But this data has a large errors because the, during the geosex time in 1970s, we don't have the, the certified reference material so that they, have a, they carry the large errors. So we try to apply the corrections by assuming that in these two decades where the deep waters were not changed so much, we try to apply corrections and assuming that we have the systematic 
errors in the in the profile measurements and uh, so such kind of cares were taken where uh, the errors are relatively higher but however we could able to see that there are the changes in the the depth of argonite origin saturation origin so now we have a lot of data is available that was collected through the different um, the programs the thanks to the geographs like the us and german and india and geosex and the geo traces was and go ship and loyage and monsoon mission and uh, even csr mos projects funded projects we collected all the data and collated together we are going to upgrade um, this year by with uh, much more data which is available what it clearly shows that so argonite saturation at the climatologically it is around 200 meters or little less than the 200 meters in the bay of bengal where in the arabian sea is about the 400 meters in the south if you go down so close to 800 to the 1000 meters depth then these are the few transects where the world ocean circulation repeat hydrography they keep measured the the the, the, the same transects during 1995 and 2007 and 2016 in case of the i09 transect on the on the eastern side even the i07 transect has been occupied twice and the center one was occupied thrice and the you have the i03 was occupied twice so they repeated more or less during the similar period and we we'll, we we'll try to estimate based on the the variability during this period so this is the the showing of the argonite saturation depth in meters per year we converted we could see that the the argonite saturation on average actually about the 5 to 10 meters uh, shallowed uh, per year okay at the rate of 5 to 10 meters uh, in the in the indian ocean where the bay of bengal is a little higher we could find up to the 15 meters of uh, argonite saturation horizon shallowed at the rate of uh, 15 meters there is some bias in this data especially for the arabian sea because the arabian sea one this i07 1995 was collected in the in the july august whereas the 2018 was in april whereas in the bay of bengal this is the bay of bengal one i09 there no much issue with reference to the seasonality but i08 and i03 we don't much need to bother even there is a little bit difference in the depth because they are quite deeper so the seasonal impact may not be there at the 800 to 2000 meters uh, water column depth then based on the remaining data is available with us even though it is not time series on the basin average we have taken try to plot that what is the rate of uh, decrease we have between 1970s that the geosex time to the the present 2020 could see that in the bay of bengal about 8.6 meters per year of the argonite saturation seems to be shallowing whereas in the arabian sea is about 5.3 meters per year in the south actually we wanted to do it after adding the more data is available from the different organizations then we try to compute using the the changes in the oxygen during this time so try to see that how much uh, dac is uh, contributed through the organic matter decomposition the variability during this period and the total dac variability at the depth of argonite saturation origin and then we computed the how much of the anthropogen co2 increased at the depth of argonite saturation depth so that uh, what the contribution coming from the decomposition of organic matter and the anthropogenic co2 inputs you could see that on average at the depth of argonite saturation about 1.3 micromole per liter per year of the anthropogenic co2 has been increased which is quite close to that of what you will see in the accumulation of the co2 in the atmosphere they are in quite equilibrium with the atmospheric uh, uh, anthropogenic co2 input uh, increase in there then uh, at the depth of argonite saturation as i said in the in the, in the beginning if the calcium carbonate is dissolves it actually releases the bicarbonate that bicarbonate actually increases the total alkalinity so at this depth we could see that about 0.1 to 1 micromole per liter per year of the total alkalinity is increasing that is giving the another evidence that uh, the dissolution is being taking place in those depths so earlier based on the geosex versus the woes time what when we did it in the 2002 we 
we could find that this rate was 0 0.35 micromole per liter per day. This is the TA increase. But the present one, it shows something like a 0.65. This different may be either recent increase or maybe the earlier one, as I said, that there are errors involved in the geo data. That could be the possible reason for the, the difference what we find between 70s to 90s and versus uh, 90s to present. Then why we have a much shallower aragonite saturation depth in the Bay of Bengal? We try to look at uh, what are the possible reasons for that. One is that uh, this is from the Ghost um, uh, et al. paper. There, uh, the um, Himalayan glaciers, which were actually decreasing very quite rapidly. As a result, the model based data shows that um, the GB system discharges were increasing. If you look at the salinity data, either from the, the satellite uh, data, which is not very longer, or even the, those data, some of the models which were calibrated the satellite based salinities. What it shows that the eastern side of the Bay of Bengal, between 97 to the 2019, the salinities were decreasing. Both models are showing, as well as the, the satellite born uh, salinity was also showing that. So therefore, the, the PCO2 levels, which are actually decreasing, rather than increases, because the fresh water actually absorbs some more CO2. It contains the less DAC. So the, the eastern side, the PC2 levels were decreasing, so therefore they're absorbing the more anthropogenic CO2. And the anthropogenic CO2 estimations, if you take the transit from the south to the north, you will find the more anthropogenic carbon, which has been penetrated up to the 600 to the 800 meters in the Bay of Bengal. Then, model shows that uh, there is a sinking capacity of the CO2, by this all models actually here are 14 indication models, two atmospheric inversion models, and um, SOCAT related empirical models, nine models have been compared here. So this was an opportunity actually by the IPCC to look at that, how models are performing in the Indian Ocean. So what kind of uh, issues they have, and uh, under this exercise actually we conducted this. Where we could see that the sinking rate of the Bay of Bengal actually is increasing at the rate of 0.005 petagram carbon per year per decade in the Bay of Bengal. You see here, this is the anthropogenic CO2 one. You can see that this is the Bay of Bengal, this is the 09 transect. You could see that they accumulation up to 1,000 meters in that. Even you can see here, we have the very high amount of the anthropogenic carbon is being accumulating in the upper layers of the Bay of Bengal. So therefore, the decrease of the, uh, the salinities and increase of the atmosphere CO2 input inside, that could be the one of the reasons for the corrosion of these uh, ASTs. When you come to the western part, you see that you have a lot of aerosols are being produced over the Indian subcontinent and also the, over the, the Asia, where you have the red colored marks, you will see that. Then uh, most of these aerosols have been measured by the many people where they found that they are mainly anthropogenic because 50% of their composition water dissolvable uh, in organic ions were made by the, contributed by the sulfates followed by nitrates. So it clearly shows that they are contributed by the anthropogenic aerosols. And then uh, the dominant contribution uh, mainly you will see in the western Bay of Bengal. You see here, this is the anthropogenic AOD derived from the total AOD. These are the zones where we could see the significant rate of increase, but the eastern part, the significance is much lower. It's a stratospheric not so much significant rate of increase, you will see that. So th therefore, in the western side of the Bay of Bengal, the aerosols are, anthropogenic aerosols are being increased. They were actually decreasing the pH. So the rate of increase here, you see that in the Indian Bay of Bengal, 0 0.076 per decade, which is at present one is actually 0 0.1 close to that of, whereas elsewhere in the globe, it's much, much smaller. So the high rate of anthropogenic aerosol deposition is being increasing in this region. Similarly, if you look at the trends of the anthropogenic aerosols, this is the line which is within the black line. This is where the 
The rate of increase, you can see here there, 0 0.01 to 0 0.02 level of the AOD units are increasing per year. Then we have a time series uh, uh, station at uh, off Vishakapatna. We are being measuring for the last 14 years, where you could see the rate of decrease of the pH is about 0.004 in the offshore region, 0.007 in the coastal zone, uh, which is actually three times higher than the, the pristine zone, like a 0 0.002 actually, what you see in the pristine zone, where we could able to attribute this by measuring the continuously even the atmospheric aerosols, about the 33 percent of this acidification is contributed by the anthropogenic aerosol deposition in this region. So when you compare now, the, now more CO2 is increasing through the atmospheric uh, absorption of the anthropogenic CO2 and also the shift in the inorganic carbon system because of the decrease of the pH, the DAC to TA ratio in the recent years is actually increasing, the red one is, the, is increasing, where the, the blue one, uh, compared to the blue one, which is 1995. When you see in the Arabian Sea, you would see such a difference actually in the oxygen minimum zone. As morning, Dr. Nakvi was telling about the slight intensification of the oxygen minimum zone, that is where the more CO2 may be accumulating or uh, decreasing the pH of that. So that could be the reason uh, you will see the more DAC to TA in the, in the deeper uh, oxygen minimum zone region. Now we try to calculate, this is assuming that the business as usual scenario, there's the same rate it was increased in the past and if it continues in the same level. So we could see that in the past five decades, the organoid saturation depth was shoaled by 200 to 300 meters. And if this rate continues in the business as usual scenario, no organite organisms may be able to survive by 2050 in the Bay of Bengal by end of this century in the Arabian Sea. Here actually this is only the prediction kind of, uh, assumption kind of, assuming the business as usual scenario if, the, if it shallows in the same way. But if you look at the models, model shows that they never come to the surface, uh, even by the 2100. They show that always in the green, in the, in the Indian Ocean, the green is something like a two to three micromole. The organoid saturation not coming to the one, that is where the dissolution actually takes place. The reason was that when we compare this, uh, the 14 Indicash and uh, nine SOCAT and two atmospheric inversion models, what we found that, look, based on the database uh, experiments, and the models, none of these models were could able to reproduce the strong upwelling that is taking place in the Somalia and, um, and um, Oman regions. And also the sink in the Bay of Bengal were uh, very highly overestimated. And even the uh, mode water regions in the down, these regions are also, the sink is quite variable in the each of these models. Then we come up with that, uh, the mixing is quite weaker in the, in the, in the models. And uh, there are no atmospheric inputs actually incorporated in the, any of these models. And the lack of river discharge data, river discharge data in some models, they just taken as a climatology. In some models, there's no even a river discharge in there in the global models, just a given the climatological salinity on which the model is being run. And also the characteristics of the river discharge is not part of the, any of these models. As a result, uh, the predictions what coming from here is maybe we need to, we need to re-look into that by, by addition of these uh, new features, other atmospheric inputs and uh, even other things which are being happening there like from the river discharge and so on, maybe these models can be improved in the future. I'll just summarize that. The organoid saturation depth is shallowing at the rate of five to nine meters per uh, year. And uh, rapid shallowing was observed in the Bay of Bengal associating with higher rate of uh, absorption of the anthropogenic CO2 and also atmospheric uh, deposition of the acidic pollutants. If the business as usual scenario occurs, maybe uh, it's quite vulnerable in the Northern Indian Ocean for the Argonite. And we need to improve the model performance by adding the, the more inputs from the land side as well as from the atmospheric side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sharma, sir. Uh, for uh, you know uh, restricting the presentation in time also yeah. okay.
it was within the time. Thank you very much for that. I think we can uh, have one or two questions. Normally, it is said that uh, the terrestrial climate is decided by the uh, temperature and precipitation, but the ocean climate is decided by the temperature and carbonate chemistry. Yeah. Carbonate chemistry, because they yeah. say that because the oceans are acting as a, some kind of a buffering capacity. So that, that so that carbonate chemistry is a very important part yes. of the climate change system. I think. Yeah, so we are we really doing something seriously in this carbonate, except acidification of corals and all that. Other than that, are we really doing some interesting research in that? You have done that now, so it is interesting. Yeah, because. Because as you know that the, the global warming, we are coming from the, the CO2 system. Okay, increase of the, the CO2 is increasing the atmospheric temperature. And at the same time, the inorganic carbon system in the ocean, okay, it has a buffering capacity, it can able to adjust even the, even the pH of the, of the, of the sea water by, by itself. But now it is going beyond that to adjust by itself. So by addition of the more uh, pollutants, so it's not able to control that the capacity of the buffering capacity that's why now it's going into the negative side yeah. just, one, uh, just one question i like uh, would like to know the coastal ecosystem response in the sense there is more uh, the solution of co2 into the into the coastal oceans and there is more dumping of uh, nutrients or anthropogenic uh, waste and that's mean more of nutrients organic loading into the system so whether uh, this increased CO2 is converted into a primary production and then naturally it has to go to the secondary production. So anything of that kind of a positive impact is there. Yeah. Now several people have done the laboratory experiments by decreasing the pH and therefore the increasing the CO2. And some of the phytoplankton they are taking advantage of that because there is a carbon concentrating mechanism. Because what happens, we have only the 10 micromoles of the C inorganic carbon in the form of the CO2. If we increase this part, so they need not concentrate the CO2 into their cell, so they can easily produce some more production. That's called the carbon concentrated mechanism is becoming easier. So that if we increase the CO2 level, to some extent, the production is increasing, total production is increasing. But if we increase to the so much high level, I think it will deplete. To the, to the initial extent, up to the people have seen, up to the, even the 500 to the 600 micro atmosphere, it is increasing. Okay. Uh, Sharma, uh, uh, my question is, uh, does the paleo records show such uh, <coughs> regular uh, change in uh, aragonitic shell concentration in sedimentary cores? I don't know. I don't know. I didn't see that. And uh, uh, like uh, with the increase, the whatever's uh, material that falling on the seabed, any surface uh, sediment record also shows? Maybe, maybe it may show that. Actually, I should discuss with uh, Rajiv. He's working on the paleo uh, pteropod record. Maybe I should ask him. I don't know. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the excellent talk. As a token of our uh, gratitude, we request you to accept a memento from Dr. Bensal. Our next speaker is Dr. Aninta Majumdar. He is a scientist, principal scientist at our headquarters. He is a National Institute of Oceanography. Dr. Majumdar's research interests lie in the field of biogeochemistry and sedimentary geochemistry. His uh, lecture today is on the topic of biochemistry of shelf sediments off west coast of India, possible influence of climate change. Dr. Machinder has made significant contribution to his field and has received several awards for his work, including the National Geoscience Award in 2014 and National Award for Excellence in Ocean Science in 2022. He is an associate editor of Biogeoscience, so we are honored to have such an accomplished and uh, knowledgeable speaker with us today. Uh, please let us welcome Dr. Aninda Holt. 
Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dinesh ji and uh, uh, my good friend Anas for uh, giving me the opportunity to present this uh, talk. So uh, this is a short presentation, uh, just uh, sharing an idea on which may be developed later on into some kind of a project or like that. So because when Dinesh ji told me that uh, the conference is on uh, climate change and um, coastal uh, things. So I thought that we, we have uh, been working on this uh, uh, shallow shelf sediments in the coastal hypoxic region on the west coast of India. Uh, that uh, mainly on the carbon sulfur on, and iron systematics of uh, carbon sulfur and iron system of uh, the, in the hypoxic zones. Uh, so I thought that uh, let us see uh, what is happening in these regions. So biogeochemistry of the shallow shelf sediments of the west coast of India, a possible influence of climate change. So we will see that how climate change can influence this biogeochemistry as well as how biogeochemistry in return affect the climate change and a so sort of a self-sustaining dynamo. change hmm? right one no? ah, we got wrong <laughs> sides eh, no? okay yeah so if we look at uh, this, uh, if we look at this Boles et al. paper of 2014 in science that shows the uh, distribution of the sulfate reduction. Uh, sulfate reduction is the process where uh, the sulfate ion in the, uh, in the water, in the, in the marine system, is uh, reduced to hydrogen sulfide and produced bicarbonate by either the process called organic organoclastic sulfate reduction or it is by another process called anaerobic oxidation of methane where uh, methane is oxidized to bicarbonate and sulfate is reduced to hydrogen sulfide. In both the cases, we see that there is a production of hydrogen sulfide in it. And we know that hydrogen sulfide is a very deleterious component as far as the benthic ecosystem is concerned. Uh, and you can see that in this uh, map, uh, the inner shelf region, if we look at the weighted average of depth integrated sulfur reduction, you can see that the inner shelf region is very high, is 39.3 compared to the compared to the global total and outer shelf and slope rise. So you can we can see that the the inner shelf region is really significant as far as uh, uh, carbon reorganization of the carbon and sulfur reduction and production of hydrogen sulfide is concerned. Not only this, even the inner shelf region is also very significant as far as the methane oxidation is concerned by anaerobic oxidation of methane. Now this anaerobic oxidation of methane is actually a process where sulfur reducing bacteria and, and methanotrophs act uh, in, uh, <coughs> together to uh, cause this kind of a change. Can you change from there? Just go to the next slide. Ah. Go back. Okay. Okay. So this is the the uh, our west coast uh, area of inner shelf region, where uh, we have been working on the biogeochemistry of uh, the sediments here. So uh, there are a lot of cores who are taken, and you can see that the sedimentation uh, rate also varies significantly in this region. In the next slide, we'll see that. Over a water depth of 13 meters, 17 meter, 30 meter, 20 meter, like that, absolutely shallow inner shelf region. And uh, what we wanted to see is how the, the sediments, top two meter or three meter of the uh, sediments, uh, how the pore water changes, how the methane gas is consumed, and what actually happens in the uh, shallow region. So this is, uh, this is the region where which, uh, we know that these are the region which is uh, by seasonal, seasonal hypoxia is 
very important. Uh, Dr. Nagvi has contributed immensely on this. Uh, seasonal hypoxia and uh, even hydrogen sulfide has been reported from this region on several occasions uh, when the uh, uh, water column oxygen concentration almost drops to zero. But we will see what happens in the sedimentary realm there. Okay, so if we see uh, this region, uh, the sedimentation rate approximately varies from uh, say uh, 0.5 to 1.5 uh, uh, centimeter per, uh, per year which is quite a high sedimentation rate. And the organic carbon content, you can see this uh, pointer does not work, laser pointer does not work, it will not work. No? So you can see that the organic carbon content uh, also varies uh, significantly from almost 2% to sometimes 3%, very large variation, but generally around 2% organic carbon. And the important thing is that in the shallow shelf region like this, this organic carbon is very labile very active organic carbon, very easily amenable to the sulfate reducing and other uh, microbes which can uh, act on those uh, organic matter. Yeah. Now look at this uh, thing. You can see that, that we, as I said, that this is a transient hypoxia region and you can see that the oxygen concentration here drops significantly uh, here at this water depth, the oxygen concentration drops significantly. Now we know that a lot of different biogeochemical processes are happening uh, because of the low uh, oxygen concentration. One of the interesting thing is of course the hydrogen sulfide buildup and which is quite high, 0.1 to 0.5 micromolar of hydrogen sulfide buildup. You can see approximately around October month this hydrogen sulfide buildup takes place here. But Sometimes we do not see this hydrogen sulfide buildup. Sometimes we see, sometimes we do not see this hydrogen sulfide buildup. And it is not only in this region, but you can see that this hydrogen sulfide buildup in the water column is also observed of Peru shelf. You can see here that the large buildup of hydrogen sulfide in the, in the water column here. Yeah, in the oxygen concentration drops. Uh, absolutely to almost to zero and hydrogen sulfide concentration in micromolar is very high. Four to five micromolar in the water column hydrogen sulfide is very, very high hydrogen sulfide concentration. Now, we can always think that this hydrogen sulfide is generated entirely within the water column due to sulfide reduction. But we are really not sure of that, that we need to understand that what role the shelf sediments are also playing in in increasing and in enhancing the hydrogen sulfide concentration into the shallow water, which has a strong effect on the benthic biology. For example, in the Baltic region, if we see, in the Baltic region also, we see significantly high hydrogen sulfide concentration in uh, the water column seasonally. But there, they also see that, the, that hydrogen sulfide is actually coming out from the sediment. There are gases, these are sediments, these are gas charged sediments and hydrogen sulfide is actually emanating out from the sediment. So that means sediments can also be a very important contributing factor for hydrogen sulfide buildup in the water column. Uh. Okay. Now, what we observed in uh, you know, in one of our work in the, uh, in the, of the coast of Goa and Karwar and Goa coast, uh, when we studied the, studied the uh, shallow seismic uh, stud, uh, of these regions, we found that this sediment is very, very rich in gases. And this is not only here. All over the world, in the shallow shelf region, you will see that there are a lot of gases. And these gases, you can see, you can see these gases are coming all up to the top. In fact, when we take the core, we see that the methane gases, very high concentration methane gases, gas, almost uh, 1.2 to 2 meter below the seabed. So methane gas, the entire gas pockets and gas chimneys that you see on the, in the, the sediment wedge is all methane. So, we can see such a large amount of methane gas is stored inside the shelf. And there are records, there are records, and we have also observed recently that there are plumes of gases coming out in the shallow regions from the sediments. 
And this methane gas, as I showed in my previous slide, will cause sulfur reduction by anaerobic oxidation of methane, producing large amount of hydrogen sulfide very at very shallow depth within the sediment. And that hydrogen sulfide can very easily emanate out or seep out of the, seep out of the sediment, causing a lot of problem. Now, uh, when we studied the, when we studied the uh, carbon isotope ratios of uh, this methane gas, we can see that they're pretty depleted, very depleted isotopic composition, typically indicating they are microbial gas, microbial gas and produced by the uh, by methanogens methanogenic bacteria are producing these gases you can see both the methane isotopes and the car and, ca and carbon dioxide uh, carbon isotopes are very very depleted typically suggesting microbial methane generation and if we look at if we look at this graph it shows that the sulfate concentration in the below the seabed the sulfate concentration drops so rapidly at the 60 centimeter we have no sulfate whereas the methane concentration increases significantly to 600 ppm. And this methane concentration will continue to increase down depth. And the hydrogen sulfide concentration is also very high. So now why this methane concentration increasing? Because you have now reached a level where sulfate concentration is so low for sulfate reducing bacteria to be active. So methanogens are now active. They can use the metabolites for the production of methane. So you can see that this methane here you can see at the 80 centimeter depth below the seabed. So any kind of disturbance on the seabed will cause a large scale release of the methane into, not only methane, large scale release of methane and hydrogen sulfide into the water column. But the point is, is the, can this methane also release into the atmosphere causing global warming? Yes. I, I was looking into a paper of uh, Weber et al. <coughs> 2019 that shows that there is a global discharge from the ship, from the marine global discharge of five to uh, 25 trillion gram, tera gram of methane from the shelf, from the, from the marine sediments into the atmosphere. And of that, bulk of it is actually shelf, shallow shelf region. So much of methane is produced from the marine sediments that it can actually reach the atmosphere. Of course, the one good thing is that uh, because of the uh, SMTZ, that because of this particular process, a lot of methane is already consumed into the sediment and does not allow it to uh, move out. But when the methane flux from the depth is high, that methane will very easily surpass this SMTZ zone and it will enter into the uh, atmosphere and here. So one, uh, this is also another uh, uh, study. Uh, which is ongoing study that also shows that off the coast of Goa, you can look at the hydrogen sulfide concentration in the sediment. It is very, very high. It is in the millimolar level, millimolar level, which is extremely high. It is thousand times higher than what you have in the water column. It is extremely high, millimolar level. So this hydrogen sulfide is very shallow, hardly 50 centimeters. So it can very easily come out from the sediment and po completely pollute the benthic uh, condition and of course have a, drast a drastic effect on the ecosystem. You can also see that the methane concentrations are also very high. Again, we can see it's all biogenic methane, total organic carbon concentrations around two to three and very labile organic matter concentration. Uh, uh, one, one, one of the best way to, s to stop the hydrogen sulfide coming out of the sediment is the natural process of pyritization, where iron and sulfur react to form uh, pyrite, that is iron sulfide. We call it chromium reducible sulfur. That also see the concentration is high in the sediment. And uh, the isotope ratio also shows it is all uh, normal microbially reduced uh, sulfur. Uh, thing and uh, sulfate isotopes. These are pretty routine studies that we do to uh, to understand the carbon, sulfur, and iron burial system here. Okay, this is my final slide. So if I put together this entire thing from the from the ecosystem and the coastal process and uh, and the climate model, 
what we see that I have in the center this methane. The methane can come from the gas seepages in the sediment. Methane can come from the gas seepage in the sediment. Also, organic matter degradation. We have plenty of it. So it is producing methane. This methane can then undergo anaerobic oxidation of methane to produce hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide can go into the, uh, in the water column, get oxidized. Okay? Methane can go into the water column and into the atmosphere over a large scale, at a global scale, can cause global warming. So in circle, what the global warming will do? The global warming will increase in the temperature. So methane solubility will decrease. So methane solubility drops with increasing temperature, we know. Water column oxygen drops with increasing temperature, that also we know. So this is a, we, we were put into a cycle of process where we have this, this whole thing will be completely forming a cyclic process. So this almost like a self-sustaining dynamo. At one point you are increasing the, increasing the global warming temperature by pushing in methane into the atmosphere. That methane will cause global warming and then the entire thing will be formed of a cycle. So this is what shows that in the, the, the shallow coastal region, the inner shelf region at a global scale is playing a very important role in, uh, in uh, global warming as well as the coastal ecosystem as far as the benthic bar are concerned and the sustenance in a hyd hydrogen sulfide environment. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Anilta. Now we can accept or take questions. Linda, let me first of all say that I'm not questioning your data, but I have access to set two sets of data. Uh, that one was published in that Nayak et al. paper, yes, 2017. Yes, sir. And the other one, I have some unpublished data that was generated in MPI uh, Bremen. Yes. Uh, it's still not published, and they are all from Goa. Yes. And they're about half a dozen stations, okay? Mm. And I haven't seen very high sulfate reduction rates in that region. One, methane concentrations are low, two, and there isn't much of hydrogen sulfide buildup in the sediment, not at least in the upper 20, 30 centimeter. So maybe there is a lot of variability, maybe, but what you are saying probably applies to Namibia, okay? In Namibia, you get this massive, mm. you know, emissions of uh, methane mm. and hydrogen mm. sulfide. Mm. But I personally don't believe that that happens of, uh, uh, along the coast, west coast of India, at least not of Goa at the stations where I had the opportunity to work. So I just want to clarify this. Yeah. Some of it is actually published, uh, that uh, Nike yes, et al. I, I, 2017. I have seen, sir, and, seen. and that's actually based on measurements of sulfate reduction yeah, yeah. using the, the isotopic method. Yeah. So I just want to state so the, that so um, the maybe there is a lot of variability. Yes. The sulfur reduction rate itself along this coast is highly variable. In fact, we are seeing uh, uh, recently we did a core from the Mangalore, of Mangalore, where we, f we thought that the, uh, the upwelling is very intense. There we saw very little sulfur reduction, surprisingly. And even... Uh, uh, less, much less hydrogen sulfide buildup, much less uh, sulfur reduction. In fact, we could not detect methane in the, uh, in the, in the sediment. What we realized uh, later on is that uh, this, uh, this uh, the, in, the, in the seismic profile you saw the gas chimneys and the gas pockets. Those things are present all along the coast. And a variation in the intensity of those gas pockets actually uh, uh, influencing the anaerobic oxidation of methane. And because in the Mangalore region, you have the same amount of organic carbon content, yet we see very poor sulfur reduction compared to of Goa. In fact, there is no buildup of methane even in of Mangalore, where we expected very strong, because there is such a strong um, upwelling in the Mangalore region, but we did not see anything. Sulfur reduction rate, we make measurements by, by the integrated uh, integrated uh, sulfur reduction rate at, at that is in uh, moles per meter square per year, not on the uh, biological measurement. The chemical measurement using sulfate, uh, the sulfate reduction of 
Yeah, we, we do the, from the pore water uh, profile, we make the integrated sulfur reduction rate. Yeah, no, we, we do the sulfur reduction, that is the, uh, that is the depth integrated sulfur reduction rate. Yeah, but you can integrate, but the individual data point is to be generated. How, yes. how do the, yes, you, yes, yes. you produce that point? Yes. How? No, depth integrated sulfur reduction rate is the aerial no, integration no, no. rate for that. That is okay, rate. but individual data point, you take a sample. And no, not you that. need to no, determine we, the... No, we do not do that. Okay. We do not do that. Okay, I want to make a comment on the organic carbon content. Yeah. Typically, we you get at the most 3%. Three, three mm, two, two, That's two. actually not very high if you compare this region with uh, Peru, Chile, and uh, mm. you know the Humboldt current and yeah. the Benguela current systems. You can get you know, 30 40% there. Mm. So if you get a lot of methane production, a lot of hydrogen sulfide in the sediment, that's not very surprising because there's enormous organic loading in those systems. Yes. And I don't think that's the case in our waters. The productivity is not very high. No. Will you not agree? No. So therefore, they, they, what is the source of that organic carbon which uh, is decomposed? My feeling is that there isn't a great deal of uh, carbon loading in the region. And whatever sulfide is produced, is what you say is it uh, goes with uh, yeah. uh, iron, so it gets uh, removed as pyrite. Yes. So that is perhaps happening, but my feeling is that if you compare this system with the Benguela current system mm. or the, mm. uh, the Humboldt current system, mm. the rates here are definitely much, 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 much lower. Much higher, much higher. Yeah. <coughs> we have one more question. Aninda. I just want to add, whatever uh, methane you are measuring or sulfide you are measuring, you are thinking only in unidirection. I mean, that is my guess. Because any product that, the, that you measure as an end point is a result of two-way reactions, hmm. methane oxidation and methane production, yes. sulfate reduction and sulfide oxidation. Yes. And adding to this complication, there's also a lot of organic matter in the scenario that you've worked. There is sulfidogenesis from organic matter de degradation. Yeah, we, we measure Ammonia that. genesis from organic matter degradation. Yeah, yeah. Methane generation from methane uh, from organic matter degradation. So we are thinking only of three directions. There could be more directions. Mm. And added to the end product production, uh, production measurement, there is also a rapid turnover, mm. which you should remember. A yes. product is not measured doesn't mean it is not there. For example, hydrogen, it is never there. But that doesn't mean it's not produced because yeah. there are hydrogen monoids, which is just rapidly taking up more than we can, at the rate yeah. more than we can measure. So just think about Actually it. Actually, that I hydrogen mean, is something. taken up for the methane production below the sulfur reduction zone. Then uh, methanogens become yes. very active with hydrogen. Notwithstanding <laughs> that also, you should make a measurement of those and eliminate it, that mm. no oxidation is taking place. Then you will get a more realistic picture yeah, yeah. of what you are measuring as end product. Mm. It's like a bank balance. You know, what's there in the bank is a result of what you have drawn and what is put in there. Yeah. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aninda, for, a, uh, for an excellent talk. Please, uh, I request you please accept a talk, our token of gratitude from Dr. VVS Sharma. Thank you. Uh, now we have our last, and uh, we have our young speaker, Dr. Jairam from uh, NRC, ISRO, Kolkata. Uh, he have uh, you know several years of experience in the field of oceanography and remote sensing, uh, and his research has focused on the study of oceanographic phenomena such as ocean upwelling and their response to climate variability and change. And he has numerous publications in high impact factor journals. So today, Dr. Jairam will be sharing his observations on the impact of climate change on ocean upwelling. His, uh, I welcome Dr. Jairam. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anas. And uh, thank you, Dr. Dinesh, sir, for uh, giving me this opportunity. And here I'm talking about the impacts of climate, changing climate or rather climate change 
on the ocean upwelling, uh, basically using satellite observations uh, from the satellite era. Uh, there are many studies. I think uh, Dr. Prasanna Kumar has actually, you know, lessened my job because he has explained all the physics and what is happening in in the upwelling decades in respect to climate change. So this is uh, on uh, extension of it, or rather. Uh, another view of it from the satellite point of view. So this is the outline of my talk, uh, where what all the signatures of climate uh, uh, change, which we have been listening from the morning, and uh, what are its influences over the Indian Ocean, and uh, the impact of climate change on the ocean upwelling in the eastern boundary upwelling systems, as well as the Arabian Sea, and uh, coming down to the southeastern Arabian Sea, and uh, what we are doing at uh, uh, NRSC or ISRO using the satellites uh, to develop the operational product for upwelling indices uh, using the winds and what we can take away from this. Uh, so uh, yeah, this is uh, in just what we are seeing in the signatures of climate change, uh, that rising sea level and we can see uh, decadal wise uh, what is the raise in sea level as per the UN resource, uh, UN reports uh, that uh, past one decade we have 4.5 millimeter per year uh, increase in the sea level and then it is uh, the cartoon itself is self evident that the sea level is increasing at a rapid pace and uh, this is about the rate of change of uh, SST per decade and uh, all the major upwelling zones are uh, uh, marked here uh, the, from the Arabian Sea and then Atlantic and Pacific uh, both hemispheres and uh, yeah other than that there are changes in the wind pattern because of the changes in the uh, SST and the pressure systems and then yeah uh, like there is a from morning we are listening that uh, intensity of cyclones are increasing and uh, you can see a curious case of Arabian Sea here uh, we have compared both uh, Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal, the number of cyclones with respect to the frequency as well as intensity and off late there is an increase in the Arabian Sea cyclones uh, and then uh, we are also facing the increasing number of uh, uh, events like ENSO and IOD and ocean acidification and uh, uh, what not. There is another uh, aspect like what Dr. Roxy has told, vulnerable coastal communities and uh, based out of Hugliashri uh, and Calcutta past one decade have been field, frequently measuring the uh, field samples and all the uh, tidal ra ranges. So Hugli Estuary and Sundar Sundarban Delta uh, is a live example of uh, survival of existence with respect to the climate and many more are there. Yeah, what is uh, the influence over the Indian Ocean? Uh, one of my friends uh, from NIT Raurkela, they have uh, you know, broken their winds into decadal scale and then uh, they found that uh, decadal variability of wind in intensity is there uh, with respect to uh, each decade and, and there the historic observation and the warming of the sea surface temperature especially in the Western Arabian Sea. Uh, from morning we are listening and that is uh, incident, coincidentally uh, major upwelling zone, uh, the Somalia, Oman, uh, both upwelling systems are there and uh, this is the pred uh, prediction for the next uh, up to 2100, uh, uh, to 2100, what is the uh, likely scenario of the increasing temperature in the Indian Ocean region uh, with respect to the prediction and uh, also the Hadley SST. And what there are uh, many uh, influences, uh, rather many impacts with these uh, kind of systems which can uh, impact on the Arabian Sea uh, with respect to the upwelling and the relative resultant productivity and the uh, changes in the precipitation pattern. Yeah, the, actually the impact of upwelling, uh, sorry, climate change on upwelling was first postulated by Andrew Bakun and uh, way back in 1990. Uh, where he has uh, postulated that the enhanced land ocean differential heating uh, could uh, lead to uh, global greenhouse warming and then the strengthening of the uh, alongshore winds and which will eventually result in the increase in the up coastal upwelling. And uh, what all the, uh, you know, the analysis and the models of late, they are uh, not, act, uh, you know, giving a conclu uh, sorry, concluding uh, evidence that whether this postulate holds good for the global regions, we don't know. There are certain regions which are following it and certain regions which do not follow it. And uh, the major, this thing is the present operational global coupled models uh, 
lack the spatiotemporal resolutions uh, to adequately represent the upwelling uh, uh, as well as the you know repercussions of upwelling. So these two cart cartoons just uh, uh, you know in, in show the impact of that. Yeah, this is uh, again uh, from the Bakun paper which I have taken from 2017. He has compared the seasonal upwelling. Actually, this has an eye opener for me. Uh, the Arabian Sea uh, is actually the major contributor of upwelling on a seasonal scale compared to the other major upwelling regions. Though they are permanent upwelling re regions uh, in the both Atlantic and Pacific, uh, but on a seasonal scale, Arabian Sea gives uh, you know more. Uh, uh, so equipment transport is more in the Arabian Sea, and uh, where in within Arabian Sea, Somalia gives the maximum amount of uh, offshore transport, uh, followed by the Kanyakumari, that Cape Comorin, and then Oman and Malabar coast. So uh, this, but uh, there are many studies and then observation, uh, operational observation programs for the Humboldt and Kalfosi in Canary, Bengula appealing systems. Uh, but a similar program for Arabian Sea, though, I mean, uh, barring for the Indian coast, we don't have. Uh, like uh, Somalia and uh, Oman, we are relying mostly on the satellites and the models. Uh, but the field data, or rather what is exactly happening, uh, we are uh, not having that much ev evidence, uh, in-situ based of evidences. So based, maybe because of the social economic conditions of those uh, countries, uh, so, but then uh, it requires a uh, uh, detailed study also. So there are many similarity and similarities and dissimilarities, uh, like the upwelling is the, of the nutrient-rich water column uh, waters, which are supporting the high production, and then the fisheries and other things, and the regional circulation modulated by upwelling cycle, and uh, that is actually again uh, uh, impacting the recruitment of the productivity, and then the physics, which is driving those upwelling systems. And the physics actually is common in some areas, and uh, there are other, uh, you know, non or different uh, physical drivers that are there with respect to remote forcing and the uh, geographical differences. And uh, so these actually will lead in, or rather, help us in uh, understanding the uh, modulation of these upwelling systems with respect to the changing climate. Yeah, this is uh, from Scatset. Uh, all this on a single given day, uh, what is the uh, upwelling uh, transport, uh, the Ekman transport, and the wind direction in the four major up eastern boundary upwelling systems? Uh, this is just to show the uh, numbers there. What is the amount of Ekman transport which is happening on a given day? And why do we need a long-term analysis uh, for studying these upwelling systems? Because uh, from morning we are seeing more or less uh, many of the re uh, regions for or rather uh, what I should say uh, driving factors or controlling factors lead to upwelling and in Arabian Sea more than 60 percent of the heat budget is controlled by upwelling so it is that itself is ma makes the topic a very relevant topic and uh, many it has a lo lot of uh, influence I mean coastal upwellings or uh, coupled systems with respect to winds and SSD and clouds and uh, any of the vari variations in any of these parameters would impact the upwelling and uh, the subsequent uh, bio, bio, uh, so product, uh, productivity also. So for that, a long-term analysis is required. And the, uh, this is up coming to the upwelling uh, in the Arabian Sea using SCATSAT again. Uh, so we have focused on three regions. One is the southwest coast of India, Oman coast, and uh, the Somalia coast. Uh, on the top in the summer monsoon and that is on the winter monsoon and again here it is uh, so upwelling or rather windstress curl in the summer monsoon here you can see the uh, intense curl region and then whereas the other winter monsoon it is the other way around. Uh, so how do we, how do we uh, compute the strength of upwelling that is through indices uh, basically because it is uh, you know, on, on a the direct basis, it is difficult to come, uh, you know, in, uh, measure the intensity of upwelling. So, where we are trying to use the satellite-based indices, one is through SST, another is for wind-based, that is Ekman transport. And then here, SST-based index is computed using the difference between the coastal and open ocean, or rather for five degrees apart. 
uh, here we have just experimented for 3 degrees as well as 5 degrees and we found that 3 degrees has having some influence in the Lakadi waters where we have a trace or rather uh, uh, evidences of upwelled waters. So we have taken the uh, 5 degree apart and which could uh, give the better result. And here uh, we have just used the com computation of the wind, uh, upwelling index using winds, that is Ekman transport. What we have introduced here is just, instead of using just meridional transport, we have used the coast angle, that is, we actually the theory is wind blowing parallel to the coast equator world. Uh, so here, we, uh, meridional transport may not be exactly parallel to the coast, so we have used the coast angle, and that we have used it to compute the wind stress uh, blowing parallel to the coast. Uh, and. Uh, then also the Afghan pumping velocity, where uh, it could, uh, there, uh, the, I'll just come back to it, why we have used that also. Then come, these are the different upwelling signatures in the Arabian Sea, that is Ekman transport, and then sea level anomaly, SST anomaly, and then uh, chlorophyll. For the three regions which we have selected, first one is for Southeastern Arabian Sea, second in, is for Oman, and the last panel is for Somalia coast. And uh, these are averaged over the uh, last three decades uh, using uh, for only for monsoon seasons. And uh, these are the variability temporal scale uh, after removing all the known trends. Uh, so you can see that uh, there is a direct, uh, you know, sea level is directly increasing in the Oman coast actually from here 2002 to there. Uh, it's a continuous rise in the sea level uh, and uh, similarly a decrease in the chlorophyll though with uh, minor changes and uh, whereas your SST, sorry, wind and then SS, SST based are not uh, showing any significant trend, uh, but there, there are interannual variabilities. Uh, similarly, the coast for Somalia, uh, where you can see SST uh, uh, a relatively increasing trend and then chlorophyll is falling down. And, uh, but uh, uh, wind-based and then OMA, sorry, that's SLA is not that much varying, though uh, there are in some interannual variabilities are there. So that is one of the re uh, uh, results. And then this is upwelling for Southeast Arabian Sea. We have used from uh, May to September how uh, the uh, wind stress curl, SST, and the sea level are varying uh, with respect to the season. Again, this is... Uh, uh, annual, uh, sorry, average of many years data. And uh, coming to the uh, variability interannually, this is a daily data plotted uh, for the uh, upwelling intensity in the Southeast Arabian Sea using the uh, difference between coastal and open ocean SST. And uh, you can see uh, a slight uh, from this first decade to last decade, uh, there is a, uh, you know, interannual variability, per, 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 pertinent interannual variability is there. And then uh, actually the in strength of upwelling or reduction in the strength of upwelling is coincident with the IOD or NSOE years. So this is one of the uh, results which we could uh, publish. And uh, similar is the case for uh, Ekman transport here. And uh, so like what I was telling from the Bakun hypothesis, the southwest coast of India may not be uh, evident result which, uh, which shows that there is an increase in the upwelling. Uh, it is, uh, the trend is not non-significant. And this is again the sea level anomaly. Uh, so here also you can see 2015 uh, is a strong ENSO year, so the strength of upwelling has considerably reduced. And these are all the trends of uh, the temporal variability of uh, upwelling along the southwest coast of India uh, during, so I was just telling that there is no self-evident trend in whether it is increasing or decreasing. Maybe actually if you see the climate, the length of data, what you are taking uh, actually holds the key for uh, uh, arriving at a concluding uh, result. The slopes are very, uh, that numbers are pub uh, published. Yeah, actually this is uh, again what I was telling why we are taking the Ekman pumping because uh, like morning Prasanna Kumar sir has told that uh, you cannot uh, simply rely on Ekman transport, you need Ekman pumping either, I mean Ekman pumping also. So we try to look at what is the contribution of Ekman pumping as well as Ekman transport, how it is varying and uh, you, uh, you can see there are uh, you know zones of uh, 
here you can see the dominant regions where Ekman pumping is more and then uh, this is the Ekman transport. So Ekman pumping in the pre-coupling seasons is actually confined very near to the coast. Uh, so that is ha hardly one degree apart from the coast. So in order to understand what is its contribution towards the uh, chlorophyll, uh, what we have taken is the, uh, these are all the pixel by pixel, 25 kilometer pixels we have taken uh, for each pixel and then we have computed the vertical velocity integrating from the coast uh, to the open ocean and then that's how we arrived at the pumping velocity. And you can see there are distinct differences between uh, along this coast uh, where uh, in certain places uh, the Ekman transport dominates and at certain places the pumping velocity dominates and intermediate regions uh, both have equal contribution. So when you are actually computing till now that only Ekman transport then we are actually ignoring the uh, contribution of Ekman pumping here. Uh, this is what we try to address. And this is a very recent uh, this uh, publication what we have done. So these are the results which I was trying to summarize. And uh, this is what we are trying to do uh, in uh, using this uh, scatterometer data. Uh, so on a daily product uh, for the, uh, this is for Ekman pumping velocity and this is the along shore uh, Ekman uh, transport uh, to be just, uh, it's an attempt uh, we are trying to do. It is not yet operationalized, uh, but we have experimented with SCATSAT 1 and we would like to uh, use with OCM, uh, sorry, OceanSAT 3 scatterometer OSCAT uh, once it is data is operationalized. And so this is the summary and uh, way forward like why we require, uh, like there are many impacts and then uh, we have present day models that is uh, they have, uh, they are not able to actually represent the scales of variability with respect to upwelling. Uh, as both as with the drivers as well as the response uh, with respect to that. And uh, yeah, there are many observational programs for the major upwelling zones uh, in other regions and a similar effort is required for the Arabian Sea. Uh, so this is well, in summary. And uh, this is a just a case study of it. Uh, what we just uh, do, do uh, have occurrence in 2015, uh, this utility of satellites on a single uh, you know, event, uh, how we have used that, that is the ABHRR data uh, for three consecutive uh, days and uh, this is OCM3, OCM2 chlorophyll and uh, there was a hab occurrence, actually Dinesh sir has, has sent me some photographs and showed there is an intense bloom happened in 2015 July, so why don't you look at the satellites and why it is so. And the result we found is that there is an intense upwelling here, it's almost like more than uh, 15,000 or even more than that mass got transported, uh, water mass, is ma ma Ekman mass transport was there. So because of that, it has triggered uh, immense amount of uh, nutrients towards the surface and which has resulted, you know, so they, this entire Kerala coast is, uh, this sensor got saturated, that much chlorophyll is observed and uh, this SST cooled considerably. So this is just a case study. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jaram, for an excellent talk. Now it's open for discussion. Yes, SLA is not an index, sir. Uh, uh, SST as well as uh, wind-based Ekman transport are the indices. Then why SLA is wrong? SLA will actually... No, uh, what I wanted to ask you is that, take it as indicators, can you predict a pooling intensity? Sir, uh, in our, with respect to SLA, we have tried to fix a threshold of, after which level uh, it no, can you are taking as ind indices, yes, sir. but I am telling it as an indicator. Yes, sir. Can we do something to predict the Apoile? We can, uh, it, it is actually a precursor. So because when uh, you are getting the trend on whatever it is occurred, it yes, is sir. possible. I mean, yes, sir. It is, it is possible. Why I asked that, this was my dream in 1970. Okay. It is possible. It is possible only. Nine, not only 1970, 1973. Okay. But I couldn't do anything on that. Though I uh, worked on the sea level, but uh, I don't know how it came to my mind at that time. Now, since you showed that, I, I got excited. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I have a very simple question. Yes, sir. How did you know that was a harmful algal bloom? Actually, that is what the Dinesh sir has told me. It is, it is uh, harmful. It is a hearsay. Or some newspaper reports. I, I admit it's a, it is based on newspaper reports. 
What is species? Species, uh, I am not aware, sir. So, thank you, Dr. Jainam, for an excellent talk. Now, I please accept our talk now. Gratitude. Uh, I'll talk now gratitude from Dr. Sonia Sugumaran, a scientist in charge, R.C. Mumbai. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sonia. Thank you, Dr. Jara. So now we are coming to the end of an on-day scientific deliberation. So we listened to uh, nine lectures, and each speaker was uh, uh, was talking about uh, uh, different aspects of uh, raising impacts of climate change on on coastal ecosystem. So. Uh, you know, the facts th that we saw are uh, shocking and we have to focus on adaptation and mitigation. Some of the important interesting quotes uh, I take from the speeches that, uh, as Manik Fan uh, said, education should not be about literacy but on understanding nature and uh, living with it. And uh, similarly, Dr. Shubha said, we need an integrated and multidisciplinary approach to uh, tackle the problem. So, taking from uh, taking lessons from all these talks, uh, let us work together, uh, utilizing the advanced technologies to study and combat the climate change. So, coming to the end now, uh, yeah, it's not it's my duty to uh, express thanks to all. So. Uh, this workshop was actually planned on one month back when uh, it was initiated by our director, Dr. Sunil sir. So he called me and uh, so, and uh, have given how you know all the support for organizing this workshop. Uh, so thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your support and motivation, which uh, helped us to organize this workshop. I believe successfully. And when he called, uh, you know. It's one month, I was clueless. So I contacted uh, uh, our seniors and, uh, uh, and our speakers, all the speakers, uh, uh, Nakvi sir, uh, Shubha ma'am, uh, Prasanna Uma sir, VBSs, uh, Roxy, Aninta, uh, Idris Babu, Girish, and uh, Jairam, Green Sanjur, all agreed on a call that yes, we will join with you to conduct this workshop successfully. Uh, and they all, uh, two of them could not join with because of health issues, but all other senior colleagues and uh, speakers joined with me today and gave excellent talks, which uh, actually, you know, it is uh, it is uh, value or the of this conference. So the message is very strong. The science science of the workshop is very strong. So I thank all all the speakers for uh, uh, for this uh, for attending this workshop and also for giving very informative lectures and uh, also there are and again there are many other delegates who attended dr bensal i called him he he came all the way to attend this workshop thank you sir and uh, our colleagues from kochi university uh, our colleagues from uh, cmlre cmfra uh, all you know all our colleagues join with us for the uh, in spite it is a holiday for them many of them but they joined with this workshop and uh, actively participated in the deliberations thank you very much and uh, our senior members of NEO retired staff many of our uh, administrative staffs joined with us and uh, they came from uh, Goa, Vaishak, Mumbai to join with this workshop. Thank you all uh, for uh, joining with us. And uh, you saw the, you know, the preparations uh, within the one month. Now, uh, many of uh, you appreciated us and it is not, it, was, it would have been not possible uh, without a teamwork. So I appreciate the team of scientists and uh, my students and research scholars of uh, RCK who did most of the uh, works for this for the successful you know completion of this workshop thank you thank you all uh, for your support and this teamwork should be continued and um, 
then i should say special thanks to uh, vvss and sonia who was always with me when organizing the workshop when there is some confusion i called them and then they gave the suggestions advice we had several meetings thank you thank you for uh, your support and our administrative staff uh, uh, from goa and uh, kochin uh, require special thanks because they work for uh, getting advance and all these administrative things for organizing uh, this workshop thanks to them and uh, yes uh, with the support of this guys it guys and uh, uh, those uh, our hotel and uh, all the people who who stayed with us joined with us for the successful uh, organization of this workshop thank you all now uh, we will be moving to the second venue of uh, this program at uh, nao rc kochin where uh, we will have the felicitation function Uh, felicitation for to our outgoing scientist in charge and uh, tomorrow is his birthday and we are celebrating his birthday at office today so we have made arrangements for the travel those who are staying in this hotel uh, we will send vehicles at on 5:30 on hour uh, so we'll get time to fresh up and those who are staying in the marine inn and uh, our guest houses we have arranged vehicle we can move after the tea break so tea is arranged and uh, those who are staying in the marine uh, i should say uh, we will we will take you now and after 5 5:45 around 6 o'clock we will send vehicle again to pick you from there so thank you very much thank you